already live. Now I guess we are live because I received the notification as well. Okay, good. We can officially start this fourth day of conference. And so, welcome to everyone to this fourth day. We start with the first talk of the day of Mary Sakelariadu from King's College of London. And so, Mary, you can start. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. So the title of my talk is Hunting for the Stochastic Gravitational Wave Background, Implications for Astrophysics, High Energy Physics, and Theories of Gravity. So I'm afraid my talk is more based on classical uh, gravity than quantum gravity this time. So what I will do at first is I will give you a definition of the stochastic background and I will just tell you how we are searching for that. And then I will uh, examine models where the stochastic background is sourced from uh, a compact binary coalescence. Uh, then I will take some models from beyond the standard model particle physics, uh, cosmic strings and first order phase transitions. And I will tell you what we learned from the stochastic background, which has not been discovered yet. And then I will move uh, to some theories uh, which uh, give us a, a parity violation to learn something again about the early universe. And finally, I will discuss about some tests of GIs and theories uh, proposals for quantum gravity. Uh, so let me go to the... So here I show you the credit pool region contours for all 39 candidates that have been uh, uh, detected during the first observing run of the, uh, the, the first part of the third uh, observing run of the LIGO Virgo collaboration, which are 39 candidates. Uh, the all three run has finished on the 27th of March of 2020. And now all the publications about these events are just coming out. Now, I would like to, to uh, just make a, a comment here about the GW19 of 425, which is the least massive or 3A system from the masses that were inferred, which are two and 1.4 solar masses, it is most probably that is a binary neutron star. However, constraints in the tidal parameters do not rule out the possibility of a neutron star black hole system or a binary a black hole system. Now, apart from these very loud and individual kind of events that we have uh, found, uh, which are coming from really close by distances, we expect that in the same way that there is the electromagnetic background, you know, the relic of the Big Bang, we're going to have a stochastic uh, background of gravitational waves, which is made out of the superpositions of independent, weak, and uh, sources which are unresolved with the current uh, interferometers which we have. The sources could be of an astrophysical origin, like binary, supernova, neutron stars, or cosmological origin, like inflation, cosmic things, cosmological phase transitions. Now, depending on the strain and the frequency, there are different kinds of uh, uh, experiments that we're using. And today I'm going to focus on uh, the ground-based uh, interferometers. Now, uh, we expect that the stochastic background is going to be detected uh, as we uh, reach the design sensitivity of the advanced light or advanced vehicle and CAGRA who uh, has joined. Uh, how are we going to find that we have a stochastic background? How are we going to detect it? Now, if we have a single gravitational wave detector, it's going to appear as a noise. So here I give you in Fourier space the signal S, which is in, uh, for, from a detector I as a function of the frequency. So you're going to have the strain H and the noise. For a stochastic gravitational wave signal, the noise is much bigger than the strain. So there's no hope with a single detector to be able to identify it. So in order to find the stochastic background, we use the correlation between two detector output, outputs, which are defined by I and J, my two detectors. And I work, as I said, in Fourier space. So if we assume in the same way that we do for the CMB, that the, the stochastic background is isotropic, Gaussian, stationary, and unpolarized, then we build this C hat, which is an estimator of the energy density of gravitational waves. Now here in this expression here, I think you can see my cursor, this capital T is the duration over which the Fourier transform is taken. The uh, gamma ij, it is the normalized of the lab reduction function. This is something that uh, takes into account the geometry of my interferometers. Okay, here my interferometers are, are denoted by i and j. And S0 
It is a spectral shape for the stochastic gravitational wave, which is flat in energy density. So what we do, this C uh, uh, quantity, we estimate for many short time segments of 192 uh, seconds, and then these segments are optimally combined in a post-processing step. Now, as we usually uh, do in, for cosmological quantities, we are going to express the energy density of gravitational waves in terms of a dimensional quantity, omega GW, which is the energy density of gravitational waves, or all, in a logarithmic interval of frequency normalized by the critical energy density. And it's a very good assumption, I will come back to that later, to write the frequency dependence of the omega GW as a power law with a value alpha, which depends on what is the source of gravitational waves. If now we assume that the gravitational wave signal and the intrinsic noise are uncorrelated, and that the noise in its frequency B is also independent, then the C hat gives you the omega GW, is a good estimate of the omega GW, plus a contribution which comes from the correlated noise. Usually, we assume that there is no correlated noise, and then this C hat is a very good uh, estimator of omega GW. But what if this is not the case? What if there is a correlated noise? How are we sure that the, uh, what we find is real a signal and is not a contamination? When does this happen? An example when this happened are the Schumann resonances, which are globally extremely low frequency peaks in the electromagnetic field of the Earth. These resonances are just eigenmodes of the conducting spherical cavity, which is formed by the surface of the Earth and the ionosphere. And therefore, in the presence of this contamination, the CW is going to be the omega of gravitational waves, okay, plus a magnetic contribu uh, contribution. How can we make sure that we can make a distinction between the two? Recently, we came up with a, a proposal which has been used uh, in the all three analysis and plan to be used in the future. So we use magnetometers on the side to measure the cross spectral density from the detector psi and j then the magnetic fields are going to induce a correlated noise in the detector through this transfer function. And then we do a parameter estimation using a correlated noise model, which I give you here, and the power law for the stochastic gravitation wave background, where the coupling parameters kappa and beta depends on the shape and the, shape and the amplitude of uh, 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 at each of the three sides, the two sides of the light and the one of the then we simulate correlated data, we project them into uh, the uh, uh, three sides using the transfer functions T that I said uh, before. And then we're going to do a Bayesian analysis in order to select which is the correct model. So this method has been used in the O3 analysis and the result that we have found is that the sensitivity we have so far is quite above the level of the correlated magnetic noise. However, as we reach better and better sensitivity going to the design sensitivity, this method would be very crucial in order to be sure that once we have found something is a real detection and not a contamination. Now, let me move on. I said that the stochastic background can give us information about uh, astrophysics, the, uh, the astrophysics of compact objects. So how do you do that? What is the energy density of gravitational waves? Uh, from a source at the frequency, I'm sorry now, the frequency is denoted by mu, uh, and the source depends on this parameter theta. For instance, if, I, if I'm talking for compact binaries, this parameter is the mass and the speed. The crucial quantity is the, is the merger rate. In other words, how many mergers you have, okay? Here I capture in this function all the cosmology that I want. So, Everything then will depend on what is the distribution of masses and the speeds. So the astrophysics will come. So we took about 10,000 uh, 10, different models and we calculate based on what is the distribution of masses and speed, what will be the omega GW. And what we found is that the total energy density can vary by almost two orders of magnitude, which means the day I have a detection, I know that is a real one. I know that I comes from compact binaries. I will come back to this question much later. Then I can deduce what is the correct astrophysical model for the compact object. So what are the data that we have now? So if I take compact binaries, if you write the, you know, the quadruple formula, once you integrate overall frequencies, then you find that the frequency dependence of omega goes like two thirds. So here in this plot, I saw the 90% credible bands that we have for omega GW as a function of the frequency. 
from binary neutron stars in this pinkish or reddish color and uh, a binary black hole in this green. Remember what I said at the beginning, that we do not have a, a real a kind of unambiguous detection of neutron star black hole. That is why I just give as an upper limit. And this shaded regions here depends on the statistical uncertainties for the measure of the binary neutron star. In the case of the binary black holes, comes also the uncertainty I just spoke in the previous slide about the mass and the spin distribution. Now, this is an interesting plot because here you can see what we call the sensitivity curves, okay? Depending the O2, the O3, the, the, O3, the design sensitivity of our, of our detector. And then we're going to have the compared combined binary black hole and binary neutron star energy spectra, okay? And what it happens is that if you have such a, 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 a power law uh, uh, a curve to be tangent in one of these curves, then that means that you have a detection at the two sigma level. There is no detection so far. We are in O3, here is where we are. That means that at the best frequency uh, at which my instrument works, which is 25 Hertz, I have a constraint on omega GW to be smaller than 3.4 times 10 to the minus nine. Now, I said before that I can give you an example of cosmological sources, and the such that take cosmic strings, the universe expands, the temperature drops, it under goes a series of phase transitions followed by spontaneous asymmetry breaking. Some kind of defects can be formed, depends on the homotopy group of the false vacuum. The simplest case is the abelian Higgs model, okay? And generically, we have shown that cosmic strings are going to be formed in the context of grand unified fields. Now, a loop of cosmic string, as you can see here, it oscillates, as it moves, it can chop off loops. It can uh, intersect with another string and, and, and uh, you know, exchange partners. In this process, you form these discontinuities, which we call king. There are points on the string where uh, uh, instantaneously it moves at the speed of light, which is called cusp, and also the collision of king and king. These are the points from which you have a lot of release of gravitational waves. Remember what I said before, for the, the isotropic background of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, gravitational waves from black holes, what is the important ingredient is the mass and the spin distribution. What is about cosmic strings? The important ingredient is the number density of loops, how many loops I have of a given size. This is from a simulation we did quite so many years ago. And then how many kinks and how many cusps I have. This is going to be the input from the computer simulations. So when I have that, then my free parameter is just the genu, which is the tension of the strings. This is the scale at which new physics come into the game. A genu of 10 to the minus 6 corresponds to strings formed at the gut scale, just to give you an idea. And again, as, as I saw before, uh, for, for, for different masses and spins, playing with different distribution of strings, different number of cusps, different number of kings, then the omega GW, as you can see, changes a lot. This comes from the last paper of the LIGO physical collaboration, which uh, uh, it is in the archive. And then I go to see my data. And for the majority of the models that we have, actually there are two models in, 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 in the market, if you wish, two computer simulations. The first one, 2014, ours, which was much before 2010. And then, sorry, to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, here, the, here that should be 2000. The, 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 there is a mistake in the, in the, in the, in the reference, but doesn't really matter because I knew that ours came much before that, but doesn't really matter. And then very recently, we came up with a new agnostic model, more theoretical model that interpolates between the computer simulation kind of results to see how, how crucial is the modeling of these objects in order to find the constraints. And we found that for all these cases, the strongest limit comes from the stochastic analysis and actually we go to 10 to the minus 15. Uh, this is of the order of about one day of TV. So really we can put constraints on physics which are much beyond the ones we can uh, reach at an accelerator. Now, another example is first order phase transition. So once the universe expands and the temperature drops below a critical value, the universe transitions from a metastable, which I call it false vacuum, FV phase, to a stable, a true vacuum, through the sequence of bubble nucleation, growth, and merging. During this process, we are going to have a stochastic gravitational wave background, which is going to be generated. 
the sources of gravitational waves are either sound waves or bubble collisions or magnetohydrodynamic turbulence. And the stochastic background that you get, it is characterized by a broken power law with a peak frequency, which is determined by the temperature of the phase transition. So if that temperature is between 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 9 GB, which is not accessible at LHG, then my stochastic background is within the LIGO and Virgo band. So it's very important. So here, for instance, depending on the particle physics model that gives this first order phase transition, in other words, depending on the parameter alpha, which is the strength of the phase transition, of the parameter beta, which is the inverse duration of the phase transition, and on the temperature, you can find that the, uh, uh, the omega that you get can be within the uh, uh, LIGO or three band. Okay? So we did a study for sound waves and a bubble collision, not magnetohydrodynamic turbulence, because there's not consensus uh, uh, about that model from the corresponding from the work of corresponding uh, groups. So we searched in the O3 data. Uh, first, we took a broken power law model, okay, and then we took a kind of, of uh, a phenomenological model. We found that within the O3 data, we can put constraints on the omega. Uh, of, the, of the contributions to the uh, 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 stochastic background, either from CBCs or from strong first order phase transition, and that translates to put constraints on the three parameters of the model. So now you can take your favorite model that can lead to phase transitions, and you can see from our analysis which are the corresponding constraints of the three parameters of that model. So that has been published uh, recently in PRM. So, but then the interesting question is, okay, you told us, uh, uh, you can ask me, you told us how if I see a, a background, I know that's not contaminated. And then you told us, I, I told you that, that, that it can come from astrophysics or cosmology. Is there a way to make a distinction between the two? Okay, because as you see, the CBC gives a, a two third power law. The, the uh, infl uh, inflation or, or calling strings is almost a flat background. Then uh, first of the phase transition gives a broken power law. Is there a way to make it, to make a distinction between that? That, that? That's a kind of question that one can, can arrive. And actually, uh, we did propose uh, a, a, a way to do that. So we built the log likelihood for a single detector, uh, detector pair very easily. Then you can take the sum of all the three pairs and have a multi uh, baseline uh, 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 probability. Now, this C hat is what I said before, the estimator for omega GW. And now this theta of gravitational waves are all the parameters for your model, okay? And sigma is uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the dispersion. So, depending, I, I wanted to do a model selection. So, I'm going to compare two models using Bayesian factors. And now, for instance, if I want to compare the CBC with the CBC plus cosmic strings, then in one case, I take the theta is just the corresponding omega to third. If I take CBC of cosmic strings is two third plus the omega of cosmic strings, which is a flat spectrum and so on. So we took all these cases. And what is the detectors we use? We use O4 sensitivity for the Hanford, Livingston, and Virgo for one year of runtime. And then we just took three generation uh, 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 detectors two cosmic explorer and one Einstein telescope for maximum one year of runtime. And what we found is that unfortunately today, the, 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 the uh, uh, second generation interferometers we have, they will be unable to separate astrophysical from cosmological sources. If we go to the third generation, then this would be uh, doable, provided we can subtract the loud astrophysical background, which is by no means a very simple thing. If you ask me what happens for LISA, that's yet another issue. This technique cannot be immediately applied. And then there is a lot of contamination from white works in the galactic plane. Now, uh, uh, now I would like to move how we can get some information about the early universe quantum gravity models and so on. So as actually, actually that was mentioned in the previous, uh, in some previous talks, I remember the first talk by Nick as well, that, that we have a parity violation. The observed matter and antimatter asymmetry in the radiation era requires some source of parity violation, and then we go, this is one of the Sakharov criteria. So you need at the universe some mechanism to create parity violation. And this mechanism then is going to lead to the production of asymmetric amounts of right and left-handed circularly polarized isotropic gravitational waves. 
But the astrophysical sources cannot produce circular, circular polarization. I, I mean, that, that's, that's the common idea. Therefore, if you detect parity violation, you can distinguish between cosmological and astrophysical sources. And in addition, if you analyze these gravitational waves, which are polarized, you can get some constraints on parity violation fields. There is some work in the literature, first about St. Simon's gravitational term, about action inflation, and then uh, most recently we did some study with the O3 data about turbulence in the primordial plus. So let 10 minutes. Uh, 10 minutes, yes. So how, first of all, how you do that? You have to build the two point uh, 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 correlator for the right and left uh, 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 modes. And here this is done in terms of the Stokes parameters I and V, the V captures the, the polarization of the You built the estimator as we did before, but now the omega GW is going to have a contribution which comes indeed from the fact that you have a polarization degree, this pi. If there's no polarization, this is zero, and then depending left on the right, this will take the values plus or minus one. This gamma is this overlap reduction function that I said at the beginning, which encaptures the geometry between the detectors D1 and D2. As a matter of fact, it's very crucial where, what is the orientation of my detector. That's why this is a study that we cannot do without knowing where our detectors are. So let me just very briefly give you the analysis, I mean, highlight the results that has been done for the case of the uh, St. Simons uh, 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 study. So this parity violation will give rise to amplitude bitter fringes in the gravitational waves. Okay, that means that one, cir one circularly parallelized mode would be amplified, but the other one is going to be suppressed. And the example that was taken was the uh, St. Simon's gravity. This is motivated from many different uh, theories, from chiral anomaly, the standard model, from gravitational anomaly cancellation in heterotic superstring theory, and also from loop quantum gravity, or I believe also in some kind of effective theories of deflation. Now, here you have, here you have the Chen Simons uh, uh, gravity model, and you have this uh, uh, scalar field which appears. Now, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this theory contains third derivatives in the field equation, and therefore it may be paused. And therefore, in order to avoid this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this issue, and so that the approximate theory is well paused, we're going to study the, effect, the effective in the, in the effective theory of and work within the uh, small, uh, 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 the weak St. Simon's approximation. That means this limit here, okay? So uh, uh, here you have uh, the uh, equation of motion, the evolution of the uh, scalar field theta, and T zero is the uh, corresponding, uh, corresponds to the current time. So in the first, in the upper uh, uh, top, you see the bounds on the evolution of the scalar field from the stochastic background of stellar mass black hole binaries, okay? Which it is given as a function of the average chip mass. Now, these constraints here are given uh, for three cases. The green one corresponds to four interferometers of the second generation, Hanford, Livingston, uh, uh, Vigo, and Kagra. The purple one is three Voyager type, and the uh, blueish one, the blue dotted one, are, are two cosmic explorer time of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, interferometers. Now it's interesting to see that the ones from the cosmic explorer here, they are always satisfy the weak St. Simon's approximation and can be comparable or even stronger than the one from the binary parts. And now in the bottom, you have uh, the same bounds for uh, 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 this case. Now, uh, uh, what we try to do is we try as well to use the O3 data, and we try to see with the O3 data if we can see parity violation. So we search uh, uh, for parity violation with a uniform uh, uh, power in, uh, in uh, this uh, uh, polarization degree uh, pi, and with an omega GW of that form. And we found no evidence of parity violation. We played upper limits on omega GW, but we were not able to estimate neither alpha nor pi. Then we said, okay, let us take a kind of more uh, of less uh, blind kind of approach, take a model dependent set. So there is a very recent paper by this group where they do hydrodynamic assimilation. So they say there can be helical turbulence in the early universe, and this can source uh, parity violation. You are going to have a kind of broken power law, okay? In this case, the polarization degree pi that I said before, it's not constant, but depends 
on what is the frequency. And then we found that uh, there is a threshold, okay, above which we can find what is the value of pi. And this, uh, and this uh, uh, threshold depends on what is the value of uh, um, uh, beta. So finally, the conclusion of this analysis was even though we have not found parity violation, we saw that there are two relevant upper limits of the stochastic background. One that can confirm that there is a polarization in the signal and another one, which has to be bigger, that is needed in order to estimate what is the degree of the polarization of confidence. So even though we may be able to detect the turbulence, we might not be able to deduce the polarization which is needed in order to go and put constraints in the model that uh, gives it by the violation. Now, this is an approach that is planned to be used in the following of four and so on uh, uh, LIGO grid uh, runs. Now, what about uh, a, a test of GR or, 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 or uh, you know, uh, theories of beyond GR? Up to now, I, po I, I discuss only the tensor polarization, but alternative theories of gravity can have also vector and uh, as well as scalar modes. Now, if you want to use the best, in other words, the, the events that have been found so far that have been published, okay, not stochastic, the, 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 the individual uh, best events, then the current uh, generation of uh, interferometers we have in terms of how many we have and their orientation, they cannot allow us to determine the polarization content of uh, uh, gravitational wave signals. However, a few years back, we proposed a Bayesian method to detect and characterize the polarization of the stochastic background. Now, this was like, like uh, four years back, but this is a method that has been used always from now on. And it has been used in the O3 data now that have been uh, very recently out, you can see. And what we have found is that there is no evidence of non-GR polarization. The non-detection of scalar and vector polarized gravitational waves is consistent with predictions of GR. Now, the next, next thing. In GR, gravitational waves, far from their source, propagate along null geodesics with energy and momentum, which are related with the standard dispersion relation. E square is equal to P square C square. But if you have extension of GR, they may violate that. For instance, you can have that gravitons is going to have a mass. So what we have done in, uh, from the O2, and we keep doing uh, uh, as time goes on, is uh, uh, in, in all the like bigger runs, is to take this kind of more phenomenological approach and put this extra term. Okay, so, a non, so, so, you know, for different theories of gravity, massive gravity, double special relativity, for other lifts, this, this alpha is going to take different values. So, a non-zero A, a non-zero such phenomenological quantity is going to manifest in the data as a frequency dependence dephasing of your gravitational wave signal, okay? And this is going to build up as the gravitational wave propagates towards the Earth and becomes bigger and bigger. Now, here are the most recent 90% credible upper bounds on the absolute value of A. Okay, this, this, this phenomenological uh, uh, modification of the dispersion relation and the corresponding upper limit uh, on the uh, graviton mass, it is given here, which is about uh, two times a bit less, 1.8 times more stringent than the more recent solar system bound. Uh, now, uh, last thing that I would like to say, uh, as you know, dimensional flow, uh, the scale dependence of uh, dimensionality of space time is a feature which is said by many theories of quantum gravity. So what we did uh, in these two papers, one of them is uh, extremely long. Uh, so, so the physics letter B is the, is the quickest one if one wants to read. I'm just smiling because the other is really extremely uh, long. So anyway, what we have studied is the consequences of quantum gravity dimensional flow uh, for the luminosity distance scaling of gravitational wave. And we did that for uh, the GW17 or H17 and for uh, simulated, uh, simulated uh, data in the LISA band. So uh, you have the strain, which is measured by your gravitational wave interferometer, and then you have the luminosity distance, uh, which is measured from the optical counterpart of the standard siren. Usually the relation is just stops here. This is, it, uh, uh, you know, this is that with the, the uh, luminosity distance to being the same for gravitational waves and for the photons if you have just GR. But now we are going to have this other contribution which comes. And now if your, your, your theory has only one fundamental scale, which is the Planck scale, 
then this equation is exact. And gamma is the gamma UB, which is the scale at which quantum gravity corrections are important. If, however, this L star is a mesoscopic scale, then this equation is valid only near the infrared regime, and that this gamma is a mesoscopic scale, is the scale during which contributions to GR are small but not negligible. Then we took the GW170017, assimilated data for LISA, and we found that the only theories that can be constrained in this way are the ones which satisfy this constraint here. But then we go back to the literature. And in the literature, you can find what is the values of gamma UV and gamma mesoscopic from group field theory, from spin forms, blue quantum gravity, causal dynamic regulations, Kappa Minkowski, stellar gravity, string theory, the law energy regime, forever ellipsis gravity, blah, blah, blah. And then by doing all that, we saw that only GFT spin forms and loop quantum gravity could generate a signal detectable with standard styles. Now, I don't want to be misinterpreting and say that. I'm not saying that these are the theories that they are correct. By no means, I don't know. I'm saying these are the theories that could be tested with standard science. And in order to make the test with the standard science, there is another step I have to do before that. I have to look for realistic quantum states of geometry, which give rise to that signal. This is yet another non-trivial uh, uh, step. And with that, I would like to, to, to finish. These are my conclusions. A detection of the stochastic background from an unresolved compact binary coalescence is expected to be made by advanced LIGO and VIRCO, the design sensitivities, even before that. I show you a method that we put forward and is used in order uh, to be able to detect the stochastic background in the presence of correlated magnetic noise. I told you that uh, with the current uh, the, uh, uh, um, tools we have, the current interferometers we have, it seems to be uh, uh, not doable to, have a to be able to have a simultaneous uh, estimation of astrophysical and cosmological background. Can, can I say it's astro you know, that, that, that seems to be not easy and it could be done with 3G if we know how we can subtract all the large events that we will have by then. And then I highlight uh, how, as a matter of fact, uh, the stochastic background can give information about CBCs, can give information about models beyond the standard model. I did not talk at, at all about directional senses and, and isotropies, which, could, which can give us a kind of uh, information about large scale structure. And then I talked a bit about the uh, information for early universe cosmology and gravity theories. Isotropic and directional senses are indeed an ongoing effort of the like of Virgo Kagra collaboration. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you for your talk. We have time for maybe one or two past questions. The first is from Alexander Wickman. Hi, Alex. Oh, hi, Mary. Great to see you and it's Great a very nice you. talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> Fantastic talk, really, I learned, I learned a lot. Uh, I look, I have one, one, yeah, I have one question. So you mentioned uh, production of gravitational waves due to cosmic strings and first order phase transitions, but what is about the main walls and second order phase transition? Uh, well, uh, uh, you know, for, for the main walls, there are some studies, but, uh, but you know, I have not, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, I was asked participating in a collaboration about domain walls, but I have not, I have not worked on that. You know, for domain walls, I, 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 I'm, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit skeptical always uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, domain walls, if they are uh, formed in the, from a local gauge theory, then they are not good in cosmology, as you know. So they have to be formed uh, from a global theory because then you have walls and walls. And uh, personally, I'm not very fond of, of uh, global, uh, you know, I, I, I believe that, you know, a, a, a gauge theory is the more appropriate one. So, have, now, of course, you can always make more, more complicated your, your, your problem. So you put, you know, you put like the necklaces. So you can put, you know, like strings with monopoles or, or the main walls with monopoles and then, and then the whole thing becomes more complicated, could work. So I think that there are models which uh, can evade these cosmological issues, uh, but uh, I have not been worked myself, but I know that there are some, 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 uh, some, uh, some cases yeah. about that. Uh, yeah. Now, a, a second order phase transitions will not give you, as far as I know, gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
we'll because you see we, we have just just put the model online yeah. where we have domain walls but these domains walls just uh, they dissolve in the evolution of the universe in an inverse phase transition but the original second order phase transition would give you a gravitational wave there's a simulation done by some uh, by a group of japanese guys uh, and, uh, so, 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 Alex, you put that paper now. Can I set on the send me the link? I could have a look. Uh, I will do it. So, so your domain wall are from a local theory, or a global one. Global from a global. Global. One. So, 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 let me ask: What is your your feeling for the global for the global uh, theory? Uh, it, it's okay. Look, as far as it just that two symmetries, it's not that big deal, okay. right? Yeah. yeah. Not something fundamental. Not something very deep, I would say. Okay, I, I will have a look because I, because. I was not, I must admit, I was not very much aware, but recently they brought my attention to quite some works of people in Italy about, about domain walls. So that's something that I was planning, you know, to get to, to have a look. I will send you a link. Thank but you. Thanks, thanks a lot for the talk and great to see you. Great to see you. Great to see you, Alex. <laughs> okay, uh, it, it's not a problem to Nick, we can postpone the question to- No, no, I, I would like to ask a quick question because I have teaching, so I may not stay in there. It's very quick. Can uh, okay, I ask it okay. Now? Thanks. Okay, yes. Uh, very nice talk, Mary. Uh, what about the Gauss Bonnet, uh, higher curvature terms with the gravitational waves? And what are the sensitivities for your action? Because this pseudo scalar, this is Simon's gravity, the theta is an action. What does this compare to other interferometers? Is LIGO going to surpass the limits for the couplings or not? Uh, you know, uh, when you say for other, as you saw in, as you saw in, the, in, the, in this, for the third time, or what I saw, you, you remember, the, 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 the cosmic explorer was, was much better. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, for me, I, ha I have an issue. For the Aeon, I was asking. The Aeon will I not... Know, uh... But, you know, I I, here I have a fundamental question myself. Uh, 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 the parity violation, from, I think, depends a lot of, of from, where is the location of the interferometers. Right. So given that I don't know where the cosmic explorer is going to be, because the same people ask me, you know, about, uh, about the, you know, the, the Einstein telescope. They say it's a big question where the Einstein telescope will be. Before I know where is the location, what's the point? Because the parity will depend, you know. Yeah, yeah. And we saw that, that it will depend. Yeah. For the eye, you know, to say, I admit, I, I don't know much about Yeah, that. because they don't show that, they don't compare, so that I agree. No, so I, I, don't, I don't know. Honestly. And the Gauss Bonnet, quick answer? So the... that, that could be another thing. That could be another That thing. you could test. That's yeah, good. that you could test. That you could test. I mean, uh, that you could test. Or any other higher curvature, whatever. Any other higher curvature. Case. As a matter, yeah, any other higher curvature, you could, for, for this case, you could, uh, you could as well test. So, so okay. you know, uh, uh, it has been a very detailed study from these people, uh, Ken Young et al. for the Chen Simons. And uh, and uh, right. Uh, okay. now, uh, can I it? Thank you very much, and thanks a lot for this very nice talk. Thank you. Thank Sorry you. for uh, taking time, <laughs> oh, Luca. No Thank problem. you. Don't worry. So we can pass to the next the next talk. Francesco, can you share your screen? Sure. Thank you once more, Mari, for uh, the talk. Okay. Can you see the screen? Uh, yeah, not full screen. My... Not full screen. Moment. It's loading. Yes. Now it's okay. 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 Good. Okay. Second speaker is uh, Francesco Di Filippo from Kyoto University. And so you can start, Francesco. Okay. Thank you, Luca. And thank you to all the organizers for allowing me, for allowing me to give a talk in this conference. And uh, I will tell you about uh, uh, some work I've done in collaboration with uh, Raul Carbaglio Lurbio, Stefano Liberati, Costantino Facilio, and uh, Matt Fischer. So let me start with uh, some very, very fast uh, introduction. Um, so, um, we've, um, so as you know very well, we also had done a very nice talk uh, just before this one. Uh, we live in an era where uh, observation coming from uh, LIGO, Virga, and Kagra collaboration and Event Horizon Telescope collaboration allow us to test uh, the exteriors of black hole space time as never before. But on the other hand, uh, it's uh, technically impossible to directly probe the interior. And uh, the problem with the interior is that uh, we, do, we, oh, we do not even have a, a theoretical framework to exactly describe it because we know thanks to singularity theorem starting from uh, Ferro's famous 1965 theorem, 
we know that uh, within general relativity, uh, a singularity will be unavoidably produced. So the theory will break down and uh, we need something, uh, something more. And uh, it is reasonable and it is reasonable to assume that uh, once a full theory of quantum gravity is uh, taken into account in a consistent framework, the singularity will be regularized. However, uh, an important question, if you want to do some phenomenology also, is to, uh, to ask, uh, uh, is this uh, regularization going to produce effect outside the trapping horizon? Because if not, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be impossible to have uh, experimental detections. Um, and uh, in order to, to answer this question, we need uh, to consider a consistent framework to do that. And uh, I am going to talk about some attempts along this, uh, this direction and uh, our attempts uh, can be schematically divided into three main points. Uh, the first one is uh, I'm going to talk about a geometrical classification. So I'm going to classify non-singular space-time that can mimic the calls. Then I'm going to study the viability of uh, this space-time. And finally, I'm going to check the phenomenology if any associated to such space-times. Uh, and uh, today, most uh, of, the talk, of the time will be, I will focus on the point one and two, but I will tell something about uh, point three. So let's start uh, with the uh, geometric classification. And uh, um, let me start uh, by setting the stage and the uh, notation by giving you some uh, uh, some um, some basic uh, notion about what we do. So the goal, as I said, as I mentioned before, is to classify all the possible non-singular space-time, but with a trapping horizon. So we assume that gravitational collapse uh, for, will continue while the theory of general relativity expects to work well, so until you form a trapping horizon. And then maybe something else will appear and uh, we will regularize the singularity. And uh, uh, for simplicity, we consider a four-dimensional spherically symmetric space-time. I will stress later on where the spherically symmetric assumption is important because for most of the analysis, we do not need it, but there will be a couple of places in which this simplify. And so it will be clear uh, where uh, do we need to, uh, to work if you want to extend the analysis to a non-spherically symmetric space-time. Um, now, uh, Let's define what is a, a trap surface, so what is a trapping horizon. So a trap surface, so if you take a given uh, space like two surface space two, as you know, just by dimensionality of the space time and the signature of the metric, you can define two independent null vectors, L and K. Uh, L will denote the outgoing null vector and K the ingoing null vector. And uh, in Minkowski, you have something like this, as you know, so this is the space, the space, the space like a, uh, this space like uh, two surface, one, one direction is uh, suppressed. And uh, the outgoing uh, goes uh, in direction of uh, growing radius, the ingoing goes in direction of, uh, of uh, uh, decreasing radius. And uh, the, the, if you have a trapped region, uh, both the going and the ingoing will go in, direction, in the direction of uh, ingoing radius. And uh, this is formalized by introducing the expansion parameters theta defined in this way. So our surface is trapped if and only if, by definition, uh, both theta L and theta K are negative at each point. And uh, the, uh, the, um, in the middle, you have the, the, the trapping horizon where uh, theta L is exactly equal to zero. Uh, now, uh, what are the assumptions that we are going to put to, to give for the arrow analysis? So first of all, as I said before, I will assume that you form the trap surface. Then I need to form or assume that I implicitly already done it, that still your Riemannian geometry will provide an adequate description of the space-time. Uh, I will assume space-time is global hyperbolic and then geodesic completeness, and there are no curvature singularities. So let me tell you a few words about this, each of these assumptions before, uh, before going on. So, um, um, now, the, 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 the most critical one is uh, definitely the first one, because as we know, I mean, we know, I, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that uh, uh, in certain region, uh, space time I lose its smoothness. So maybe if you have a theory of quantum gravity, you have to give up the kinematics of general relativity as well. So you cannot uh, have a description in terms of smooth manifold. However, it's still, uh, it's still useful to assume it for, uh, for many reasons. First of all, 
uh, you need a, a framework to describe. Uh, uh, so it's uh, so to describe. So this is uh, also a working assumption. But uh, if um, but it's also uh, quite general anyway, because uh, if uh, this loss of smoothness arises only in a compact region, maybe it may be possible to devise an effective classical metric that matches the, the physical one we both are defined. Also, uh, this there are many, many models in the literature in which this assumption is indeed satisfied, both from uh, coming from modified theory of gravities, in which usually they are always described in terms of uh, smooth manifold, and uh, also some work in uh, quantum gravity inspired models like asymptotic shapes, quantum loop gravity, they do satisfy. Uh, this assumption, but keep in mind that this is the most critical one. Once that we accept this uh, um, this fact that we can use Pythagorean geometry, then the other assumptions are very are very um, are very uh, very very minimal, I, I believe. So uh, we need to assume that the space time is globally hyperbolic because we want to have a well-defined Cauchy problem. And global hyperbolicity is the, a very minimal requirement. You usually need much more. For instance, you can check this paper. We have done some analysis along this direction, but we want to be very, very general. So we want the minimal assumption possible. And then I said in the, in the, at the beginning that I want to study uh, um, geodesically complete space times. I want to study non singular space times. So I need to, assu to Assume the absence of a singularity in two different non equivalent ways, both that the space time is geodesically complete and that there are no curvature singularities. Now, um, for, the, for the analysis, I, we will follow uh, the uh, logic behind the uh, Eros uh, singularity or incompleteness theorem. And uh, to explain why, I will uh, give you a very, very quick and schematic uh, uh, idea behind the proof. Just uh, an idea is not going to give the proof. But uh, so the, what are the assumptions of the Perot's theorem? So the first one is the one that you already give, so that you need pseudo Riemannian geometry. Second one, again, as we also assume, that the space time is globally hyperbolic. Then Perot's theorem also assume the null convergent condition, which uh, is equivalent to Einstein equations and uh, um, null energy condition. We are not going to assume this. Uh, we are not going to assume this because, of course, this the, the, the theorem proves that these are incompatible with com geodesic completeness. In fact, they prove that the space time is geodesically incomplete. But uh, this is going to be very useful for our analysis because if you check the proof, so you can schematically divide the proof into two parts. The first part of the proof, you use the ratio duty equation to show that. Uh, uh, if you have a trapped region, so at the beginning you have been going uh, in null direction for, for the outgoing and then going null, uh, null vector, uh, so they, they are trapped both the going and the outgoing. Then uh, you will follow, you will, uh, you will, um, uh, you will generate a focusing point for a finite value of the affine parameter if the geodesic can be extended so far. A focusing point is uh, in spherical symmetry. This is just for intuition, but of course you can that you can do everything uh, without spherical symmetry at this stage. It's just a point where all the geodesic uh, converge, and uh, it's defined by the expansion theta going to minus infinity. Um, now this part of the proof will not hold in our case, but the second part will. The second part is purely geometric, and uh, it's telling us that if you form a focusing point, actually it is. Actually, it's impossible. The formation of focusing point is incompatible with uh, our assumption of the space time, the topology of the space time. Or, uh, so, um, this implies that uh, in order to avoid the formation of the focusing point, given the assumption of the theorem, at least one geodesic must be incomplete and it cannot be extended over uh, this value of the fine parameter. This part of the theorem. Uh, uh, does apply also to our case because it's very geometrical and there is no assumption of the dynamics. So this means that uh, uh, using this lesson, um, we, uh, in order to classify all the, the space times that are geodesically complete and do not have any singularity, we can, uh, uh, so we can solve a much simpler problem to classify all the possible way in which the, the focusing point can be avoided. So if you have uh, 
convergency for all uh, the orthogonal geodesic, uh, you need uh, to classify all the way in which you can avoid uh, the formation of this point. And uh, you can see that also intuitively there are not uh, many possibilities. So uh, the first uh, the first possibility is something like this: that you have something like a, you have a defocusing point at a finite value of the affine parameter. So it's a point in which uh, the uh, the expansion uh, becomes positive, the expansion relative to the orthogonal direction. The second possibility is that uh, uh, you have a, the, a, still a defocusing point, but at infinite affine dif distance. So lambda defocusing is plus infinity. And finally, you can have a focusing point, but at infinite affine distance. So you cannot apply the Perot's theorem. However, within spherical symmetry, you can show that this will lead to curvature singularity. So we need to uh, exclude this possibility. And uh, then uh, once that you have this, you, you can ask other, uh, other, uh, other um, characteristic of uh, what's going on to describe the, the space time. So uh, at the defocusing point, what is the radius of the two surface or the spherical symmetry, what's the area? And you can either have finite or zero area. And again, you can show that zero will uh, lead to uh, curvature singularity. And let me stress that these are the only two points where, uh, where spherical symmetry is necessary. So uh, proving this statement in a less symmetric space time will uh, be enough to generalize the whole analysis. And it does not seem impossible to prove it. So maybe it's possible to generalize everything. Mm, but uh, so far, let's stick with spherical symmetry. So finally, the last uh, ingredient is to ask, uh, so we have we say that uh, we focus now on the outgoing in our geodesic. What is the ingoing in our geodesic doing? So what is the expansion relative to the K direction doing? Is it uh, going to be negative or is it going to become positive? So all in all, you have uh, a three parameter class. And uh, if you exclude the, the, the combination of the parameters that leads to curvature singularity, you only have uh, four classes of geometries that now I'm going to, um, I'm going to describe. So very quickly describe. So the first class is what you can call uh, Ademanis Central Horizon Geometry, in which you have a defocusing point at a finite uh, value of the different parameter. And uh, the area radius is going to be positive and the inguinal uh, direction is still trapped. So what this means, if you can, you can check this Perus diagram. So this Perus diagram shows a, a trapped region generated via gravitational collapse. And uh, um, this trapped region, uh, so um, uh, this, uh, these lines are lines of constant R. As you can see, these are uh, space-like inside the trapped region. And uh, if you follow uh, uh, an outgoing null direction that is denoted by this dotted line, you arrive at a point in which this is no longer trapped, whereas the ingoing null direction this point is still trapped. And this is what is behind this, uh, this, uh, this grid is uh, lambda zero or not theta k smaller than zero here. So this is what this means. And um, so physically, this simply means that, that, that it, uh, when, when uh, the, the trapping horizon is formed by gravitational collapse, it then has to disappear because it is going to merge with, the, with an inner horizon. And um, now at this stage, we, don't, we are not going to tell anything about uh, what the physical mechanism that is leading to this, uh, um, to this, uh, to this disappearance. So uh, at this stage, uh, we do not know what this is. And uh, also this geometrical analysis cannot tell what is going to happen once that this, uh, um, that once uh, that uh, the trapping region disappear. But at this stage, we don't, we don't care. We will tell you a bit more later. Now, uh, the second class instead is uh, uh, something that we can call one way even warmer in which uh, also the ingoing null direction gets untrapped. And uh, we call it one way even warmer because uh, uh, you can show that this is possible only if uh, the uh, space time is uh, has, uh, a trot of minimum radius, so which resembles a trot of a warmer. And uh, even because this is beyond the trapping horizon and uh, it can be traversed only in one direction. And um, finally, the other two classes simply uh, corresponds to the first two, just by pushing at infinite affine distance the, the, the focusing point. 
so this is so let me to summarize. Uh, this is the situation we are so far. So we we asked a question that uh, it seems to be very very general very general. So what is the most generic space time that uh, can that does not have any sing any singularity, uh, but that does have a trap in the horizon? And uh, we managed to to divide the, the possibility in only four classes. Now each of these four classes will have some. Um, so now a geometry uh, within uh, one class, two geometry within the same class may have different uh, properties, but they will share some uh, characteristics that are going to be important for the for the next of this uh, of this analysis, and um, uh, we will see that uh, we can uh, restrict the possibility even more because up to this point. Uh, what I've done is pure geometry. There is probably no physics in what I've done so far. It's just a mathematical classification. But now I want to study the variability of this uh, of these objects, and to to do that, uh, we need to add some uh, some physically motivated ingredients. And uh, what are these physically motivated ingredients? So first of all, we know that uh, uh, black holes are not uh, isolated objects. They, they are not isolated objects, so they will be each, any type of perturbation. Uh, therefore, in order these, for these classes to describe a viable solution of the singularity problem, um, we, will, uh, um, uh, we will need to prove that these objects are stable under perturbation. Uh, secondly, we know that uh, black holes are generated via gravitational collapse. And uh, so we need to, to show that this is possible to do for these classes. And then we want to uh, some agreement with semi-classical physics when we expect semi-classical physics to work. So um, we can now start with the, uh, uh, with the, the first item of this list so with perturbation and uh, uh, with the uh, interplay with the evanescent horizon class. So as I say, the evanescent horizon class is, uh, um, uh, the, is uh, the peculiarity is the presence of uh, an inner and an outer horizon. And uh, um, here I have a, a Ferrous diagram of a static configuration, which is uh, not exactly what uh, I was showing before, because uh, what I was showing before cannot be static because it's formed with a gravitational collapse and ev evaporates. But uh, this is just to simplify the uh, the, um, the discussion. But uh, it's uh, it's not uh, particularly relevant. Also, if you go in the papers, it's uh, the, we do the, the dynamical case, it's not the static case. Uh, the point is uh, that the key ingredient is that this object is an inner horizon. And an inner horizon is, uh, is known that to, to be unstable under perturbation in uh, general relativity. And uh, to, to check if uh, this is going to be the case also here, uh, beyond general relativity, uh, we are going to consider, first of all, a very idealized scenario that is actually, uh, that in the, in the context of general relativity was discussed uh, by Barabes, Sirza, and Poisson in the 1990. Uh, so basically take this geometry and add uh, some uh, perturbation in the form of uh, null dust. So this is a very simple perturbation. You have two null shell of dust that uh, uh, merge at one point and uh, divide the space time into, into four regions, A, B, C, and D. And uh, move this, uh, this point of merging close to the, to the inner horizon. Now this, uh, this uh, situation is very realized, but um, but it's also uh, quite a very realistic perturbation because we are only interested close to the inner horizon where due to the blue shift, you can expect to have something uh, similar to this. And uh, what you can show, and it was shown in the context of general relativity here, but you can show in general because it's completely geometric, uh, is that uh, no matter how small, the perturbation is so no matter how small is the energy of this you know, associated to this uh, null shell, this is going to give a, to have a huge back reaction of the geometry, and uh, if you check the mass parameter, it's going to to grow exponentially close to the inner horizon. So this is showing uh, within general relativity. This usually implies that uh, inner horizon 
uh, became singular and you started and uh, you, you form a singularity where the inner horizon was. Um, we now do not have the full dynamics of the theory, so we cannot prove it. But what we, what we can prove is that a small perturbation is a huge fraction of the geometry. So these geometry are, uh, are um, not stable under small perturbation. Uh, before going forward, let me uh, just uh, just stress that uh, in uh, was it was recently uh, um, was recently repeated the analysis in a less idealized scenario uh, here, and um, the analysis is very interesting because the the scenario is less idealized. And in, if you check this paper, it's uh, they were arguing that. Uh, uh, in this scenario, there is no mass inflation instability, so this object may be stable. However, while the analysis is very interesting, uh, I, I, this, uh, the conclusion were uh, flawed by a technical mistake. So we have also shown that uh, uh, even this less idealized scenario, you have you obtain the same result. You have some uh, details might be dif different. You have some richer, uh, rich, richer structure, but uh, the overall picture is, uh, is unchanged. Uh, so uh, this does not depend on the idealization of the of the analysis. Now let's go to the to the second class that I have uh, introduced. This uh, one way the Warman class, and uh, eight uh, minutes. Sorry, eight minutes. Ah, thank you, thank you. Yes, um, and uh, this. So you may have noticed before that the Perus diagram that I gave before was not uh, a, a Perus diagram that arises in gravitational collapse, but is a is a, um, um, eternal is the Perus diagram of eternal black hole. And the reason is that uh, if you have a global minimum for the radius, uh, then uh, you will need uh, uh, <coughs> if you have a global minimum then uh, uh, you need a topology change in order to, to obtain this object dynamically via gravitational collapse. And topology change is not uh, allowed by our assumption of global hyperbolicity, simply because each shaper surface is, uh, is homomorphic with each other. So you cannot change the topology. Um, so the problem with this class of topology, even though they may, be, they may, they may arise in uh, many, in many uh, models as a viable solution, they cannot be formed dynamically. Uh, let me mention that this is uh, this only holds when the the radius is a, is a global minimum. You may have a situation in which the radius is only as only a local minimum, and uh, this case is uh, technically outside our classification because you can show that. Uh, the geometry cannot be, you cannot define a smooth geometry everywhere. And uh, you need to define some regions in which the geometry uh, is not uh, smooth or uh, not defined. Uh, and this region also has to extend outside the trapped region. Uh, also, this kind of object uh, uh, has locally the same properties of a one way than wormhole, but seen from outside, it's very different. It looks much more uh, bounce from a black hole to a white hole. Uh, I will not say much more about this. Just I wanted to mention that uh, the, there are some re there needs to be some regions in which the geometry is not defined. But this is very similar, if not uh, the same, of what uh, uh, is suggested by by Rovelli. So I think uh, just by the abstract and the title that is going to talk about this. So don't miss his talk uh, tomorrow. Uh, and. Um, uh, this is all I wanted to say about uh, this possibility. And uh, finally, the other two classes that uh, were introduced were uh, given by uh, uh, just pushing at infinite affine distance, the, the focusing point. And uh, you can, uh, if you think about it, you will see that uh, this will not uh, alleviate the, the problem that we discussed before. Plus, you may have problem with uh, with docking radiation if you expect semi-classical gravity to, to hold because these objects cannot cannot evaporate via docking radiation. So um, you've seen that uh, most of the cl these classes have some uh, self-consistency issue. So what uh, does this allow us to tell about the phenomenology? Uh, and uh, uh, 
I can uh, put again uh, the same uh, the same table as before here, where there was the uh, the summary of the the, the possible classes. Uh, but I added uh, a last uh, line where uh, it's uh, it's it's written which are the the possible issue with this uh, solution, the singularity resolution space time. And uh, as you can see, there is uh, there is really no safe option. You can see that uh, uh, three of the classes have some serious safe consistency issue that uh, you need to deal with uh, if you want to this to be viable solution. And uh, it's interesting that these classes, in principle, can uh, completely hide all the all the um, New physics, the regularity, the singularity, and up from outside, they could exactly match the space time of a classical black hole. Finally, the last class, uh, it, you can uh, think about it uh, as a short lived and a long lived one. So, if the trapping horizon lived for a very long time, uh, you have problem with, uh, with the stability. Uh, whereas, if the trapping horizon lived for a very short time, then maybe you have some interplay with observation. So the, the interesting result is that there is a trade-off of uh, internal theoretical consistency, consistency of the model and uh, experimental signature that uh, maybe, maybe we can probe. Um, and uh, actually, uh, at the, maybe at the beginning, this uh, might sound puzzling because uh, the fact that you, how is it possible to reconcile the fact that uh, uh, you want a trapping horizon that uh, uh, that disappear in very short time scale with the fact uh, that we observe the cause to be stable for a very long time. So is it a dot with this observation? And uh, the answer is uh, simply no, simply because the fact that the trapping horizon remain uh, so disappear does not mean that uh, the matter inside it has to disperse. And for instance, one possibility is that it might set uh, it might settle in the shape of an ultra compact object, and this means that uh, uh, this may give you some inf some further motivation to search for observable difference between ultra compact object and classical black holes. Uh, I will not tell anything more about phenomenology. If you're interested, you can to uh, to see what uh, we've done in this area. You can check our paper. Otherwise, you can check this uh, Cardoso Pani review, which is a very comprehensive review on the on the topic. And uh, I will just go to the to the conclusion of the talk. And uh, um, as I as let, let me stress again, we have provided a, a framework to study the the problem of whether or not it's possible uh, for uh, singularity regularization to. Uh, to leave the outside of black holes completely unchanged. And uh, the, the first interesting result is that uh, the class of allowed geometries is uh, remarkably limited. And, but the, but more interest, even more interesting really, is the fact that uh, there is no safe option and that uh, uh, if you do not want any safe consistency, theoretical safe consistency issue, then you need to allow for observational signatures. And, uh, and vice versa. So, uh, of course, the geometrical analysis cannot predict the sizes of these uh, signatures. So maybe these are very small, very suppressed, and maybe it will be very difficult to detect them. But in principle, they should be there, at least within uh, the, our assumption. So in fact, the main message, I think you can interpret in two ways. So if you're open to the possibility of such uh, deviations, then uh, you can take this uh, analysis as a further motivation to keep studying them. Otherwise, if you uh, really want to avoid this possibility, still uh, this implies that there are some, uh, some serious self consistency issues that need to be solved. And then, uh, then maybe this means that uh, even if uh, uh, singularity regularization will uh, leave uh, the outside uh, of, this, of uh, Black hole space time completely unchanged, then still maybe we can draw some uh, conclusion of what's, uh, what's happening inside. And uh, okay, I stop here. If uh, you were interested in the talk, I'll leave here the references uh, where uh, this work has been uh, analyzed. Uh, if uh, more generally you're interested in black hole physics, 
you can uh, check out this uh, this online conference the code inside out and uh, yeah thank you for your attention okay thank you francesco for your talk is there any question we have time for a couple of questions so please nick yes a very very nice talk can you apply the same thing for uh, to consider um, to, to, to constrain Hawking radiation? You know, in other words, I understand you do it classically, but can you do the same thing for uh, understanding what's happening at the quantum black hole case? Uh, so, what do you mean by that? So, um, uh, for instance, if the black hole starts evaporating, will, yes. can you say something whether it will stop from evaporating completely? Or, you know, I'm thinking in terms of quantum gravity. In other words, can you apply this to quantum gravity? Yeah. So this, so, uh, okay, as you say, this analysis uh, is not this is much this is classical, like uh, it's... Uh, no, no, that's, that's what I'm asking the question, indeed. Yeah, that's the fact that it's uh, geometrical implies that uh, from the first part, we don't, uh, we, we cannot say anything about uh, the, the time scale or, uh, or something like that. But uh, uh, you can check what happened in different classes for, uh, for sure. Um, so uh, this, but this will be model dependent. So for instance, uh, in uh, I think uh, here, this paper here, we show that if you, if you believe in this singular, uh, non singular black hole model uh, up to the end, then uh, okay, radiation uh, will, be, that is, will be exactly the same as uh, the classical case for a very long time. And then if you have a Planck remnant, then, uh, then uh, when you reach Planck mass, the, the temperature will go to zero and uh, the radiation will, uh, will stop and the object, you will have a, it will take infinite time and then you will take a Planck remnant. But this is just one model. So the problem is that it has to be model dependent. Right. To do what, right. What right. But in other words, you could have modifications depending on the model of the Planck spectrum, exactly. on the Hawking exactly. spectrum. And, and exactly. So in this, in this case, also, this this type of modification is also it's also quite general. Also, always apply if you have inner and lateral horizon and no singularity. But you may have many things that we're going to spoil it. So it's uh, it's not it's not obvious. But the, the point is that so yeah, it, it tends to go to a zero temperature, so to a remnant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can I speak? Sorry, we have another question from Alessia. I am muted. Oh. Uh, but... Hi, Francesco. Uh, nice to meet um, So I have uh, uh, one comment and uh, one question. Uh, the mm -hmm. comment uh, that I'm sure you might agree with this um, is that uh, there are ways to um, violate your uh, assumption, so evade this, uh, the conclusion, and uh, it is uh, the case where you have a space time that is geodesically complete, but where uh, the uh, invariance, uh, the curvature invariance uh, uh, diverge, and it is the case of uh, space time with integrable singularities. In that case, yes, so. you might even have uh, like uh, one single uh, um, horizon, and uh, so mm -hmm. no problems with uh, mass inflation uh, and uh, all of this. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, and uh, so this was just the uh, comment. Yeah, and, I completely uh, agree with this. In fact, uh, in fact, uh, the, the assumption, like. The, there were four assumptions. The first one was no curvature singularities. You may mm -hmm. want to drop it, of course. And if you drop it, you have extra classes. And uh, yeah, sure. It's, okay. Uh, this is a possibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, so sure if you can postpone the question uh, instead to the discussion session. So otherwise, we are okay. off schedule. Yeah, sure. I will be. I will be. Okay. We can start from you. We can start from you. Okay. okay. Okay, okay, good. So, and so sharing? Yeah. perfect. And so we can pass to the last talk of this session. Let's say, Anna, can uh, you show? Can you show your screen? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Let me. Can you see it full screen? Uh, yes, yes, good. So the next talk will be Ann Alonso Serrano from Potsdam and uh, you can start. Okay, first of all, thanks a lot for the invitation to participate in this uh, 
great uh, workshop. And um, I'm going to talk about um, some quantum phenomenological gravitational dynamics that we have derived from some generalization of the dynamics of space-time. Um, this is a work made in collaboration with my PhD student from Charles University of Prague, Maris Gliskam. And let me start by some motivation for this talk. Mm, I think that the main motivation is to understand the interface between gravitational dynamics and thermodynamics. As uh, we all know, this was uh, first uh, appear, appear for the first time in the context of black holes. And after that, it was um, uh, there were several attempts to extend it to more general um, context. And one significant progress was the derivation of uh, Jacobson in the 1995 of the Einstein equations from the thermodynamics of Rindler horizons. And since then, there were several uh, other derivation being uh, more rigorous or um, going a little bit further, for example, to try to derive or other uh, modified theories of gravity or take some insight into the appearance of uh, quantum fields and so on and so forth. And in this work, we had the idea to go one step further and try to see um, the possibility of having some modifications from, from quantum gravity and even uh, in that case obtain some uh, dynamics, some gravitational dynamics in the low order, low energy regime, of course. So uh, other motivation we had in mind was to try to understand the role of entropies that appear in the, this thermodynamics derivation and the possible connection among them. As you, uh, I will mention there are some uh, entanglement entropy and closest entropy, and it's not uh, clear. Uh, what uh, connection they could have, or if they could be equivalent in some regime, etc. So then um, we thought about uh, how to introduce a quantum modification of entropy into this picture and see what kind of uh, dynamics we can obtain, looking for a general phenomenology of, of quantum gravity in this um, low energy regime. And <clears throat> As uh, an example, this could be applied in quantum cosmology or other particular models and see um, how uh, this could uh, give some insight into the resolution of the singularity. So let me briefly show the outline of the talk. Uh, first, I will show uh, very briefly some basic concept of the derivation of Einstein equation from thermodynamics, only um, very basic things that may, we are going to use in our derivation. Then I will introduce the modified entropy we are going to work with. And then I will derive the quantum phenomenological equations of motion. And finally, uh, interpret uh, those results and the work in progress that we are still doing and some sketch of the possible application to a, a particular model in, in cosmology. And, I will finalize with some discussion. Okay, so first of all, um, the key result of thermodynamics of space-time is to, uh, to show that the gravitational dynamics is encoded in the equilibrium condition for maximal entropy that, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, is this simple expression where we have both uh, kind of contribution, the quantum correlations across horizon and the matter energy crossing the horizon. And it's not uh, completely clear that it can, these two can be combined in the same way. So on one side, we have the entanglement entropy that accounts for the vacuum fluctuations of, um, and is due to the existence of uh, any kind of horizon and is uh, given by a proportionality with the area of the horizon. And this proportionality, uh, of course, implies some uh, ultraviolet cutoff and is not fully determined, but uh, I will keep it um, undetermined here. But the point is that if you want to recover the Einstein uh, equations of motion in this uh, thermodynamics of space-time, you need to uh, interpret this entanglement entropy as a Bekenstein entropy. And in that way, you fix the value of this eta. 
So this is one of the uh, assumptions that are considered in this um, thermodynamics derivation. And it's also related with some interpret possible uh, idea to interpret the Bekenstein entropy as an entanglement entropy. So that's the, the motivation of that uh, equivalence also. So now on the other side um, of the of the balance equation of the equilibrium equation that we consider, we have the entropy of matter. So one way to combine it with the other one is to consider uh, as an um, calculate this entropy of matter as an entanglement entropy. This is possible in some cases, for example, in the uh, this uh, thing, the geodesical local causal diamond that I will explain in the next slide where it can be explicitly evaluated because you can define your uh, density matrix as uh, an exponential of the modular Hamiltonian and at some temperature. And then uh, when you have the case of uh, conformal fields that modular Hamiltonian can be expressed equivalent of a local matter uh, Hamiltonian, and then you can define an entropy associated to, to it. Uh, so uh, in that case, it's easy to, de to, to derive. Uh, when you have a non-conformal field, but you have a quantum field theory that has some uh, UV fixed point, uh, you also have some extra contribution of a space-time scalar that can be included. Um, the other en entropy that has been considered in the literature to consider this entropy of matter is the Clausius entropy. And we have shown, although I'm not going to talk in detail of this in this talk, that uh, this closest entropy and this entanglement entropy for matter are equal and leading order for conformal fields without involving any gravitational dynamic. And in the case of non-conformal fields, we uh, can make an equivalence, but through the gravitational dynamics. Uh, so there is some kind of equivalence uh, on this, uh, between these two kinds of entropy. Although, as I said, we have uh, explicitly shown this in a semi-classical setup, so very specific, very particular. So it's not clear that this equivalence uh, is something uh, more fundamental or global, or even when consider the quantum case that I'm going to consider is like, um, it's going to be uh, the same equivalence is still valid, so it's going to survive. Or So this is a, an open question that I will comment a little bit later. So then the main result of this, as I mentioned, is that you can derive the Einstein equations from this thermodynamics. And one thing that I wanted to point out also that we uh, have uh, explicitly mentioned in one of our uh, papers is that this, uh, what you recover is not um, exactly GR, but it's in fact unimodular gravity. In unimodular gravity, you um, have not the full diffeomorphic invariance of GR, but is restricted to the uh, diffeomorphisms that keep fixed in um, um, it's, uh, sorry, <laughs> I was distracted because the ring is uh, on the door. So, okay, so I was saying that you have uh, not the fixed the full diffeomorphism, you have not the same diffeomorphism invariance, but those ones that leave uh, invariant the determinant of the method. Uh, this unimodular uh, gravity um, also um, has the same result, classical dynamics of GR, but it can be different at the quantum level. Um, other interesting things that I will mention about this is that um, what you obtain are the traceless equation of motion, and you need to assume separately the uh, local um, conservation of the energy momentum tensor to get the Einstein equations. And that's a, a particularity that you have in this derivation and as that is particular to the uh, unimodular uh, gravity. Also, you have the different behavior of the cosmological constant that is a constant of integration. And um, uh, only the conformal fields are the ones that are coupled, coupled to the um, uh, dynamics, the gravitational dynamics, what also makes sense because of the uh, uh, conformal invariance of the of the theory. So as I said, this um, uh, unimodular gravity is equivalent classically to 
general relativity. So there is no, uh, there was nothing to say in the classical derivation of uh, this uh, dynamics, but it is not the same in the in the quantum realm. So it, the the introduction of quantum gravity effects could so if uh, this derivation is pointing out more to the unimodular gravity or to the general relativity. Okay, so uh, also let me explain another basic object that I already mentioned briefly, and I will use in my derivation that are the geodesical local causal diamonds that is a natural setting to work in this thermodynamics of space-time, although the beginning was uh, with uh, Rindred budgets. Um, so in order to construct this uh, geodesical local causal diamond, you can choose in any arbitrary point P of space-time, a unit time vector N, and define Riemann normal coordinates. Then you can uh, uh, write a matrix expansion around point P, and from this P, you can send out uh, uh, geodesics of parameter length L that uh, they will form a three-dimensional geodesic ball that I will denote sigma null. And uh, the border of this uh, ball um, will be a two-sphere of area given by this expression, it will be uh, the useful one for our derivation. This is the boundary that I will call B. And uh, from, the, uh, from then, the space-time region that is causally determined by this ball is what is called the causal, the geodesic local causal diamond, where I see here there is the uh, future apex and the past apex that uh, will be also uh, used in the derivation. So uh, these objects are um, endowed with a unique conformal killing vector that uh, generates the um, uh, spherically symmetric conformal isometry that preserves the diamond. And the um, uh, border of this diamond, the frontier, is it will be a conformal killing horizon. That will be the horizon that we will use in our derivation. OK, so now um, the other ingredient that I will use is the modified entanglement entropy. So um, I will use uh, the leading order quantum gravity modifications to Bekenstein entropy that I write in this way. This first term is the standard Bekenstein entropy. And the second term is a logarithmic contribution in the area with uh, some constant A nu that is the dimension of the area and some dimensionless constant C that is model dependent. So the, uh, this um, kind of modification of Bekenstein entropy, it has been predicted by different theories of quantum gravity and the difference between the different theories or model are the value of this uh, uh, constant C, the value and the sum of this constant C. This uh, behavior or this modification of the entropy, it has arisen also in some calculations of entanglement entropy that has the interest that is developed for local causal uh, horizons. And also let me point out briefly, also because it was discussed in the session yesterday, that um, some phenomenological models like the generalized uncertainty principle that um, is uh, written here, the main expression that established a modification of the canonical commutation relations in base of this parameter alpha null that gives uh, the strength of that modification. So in these models, uh, also some modification of the Bekenstein entropy of this uh, type appear. And I also want to introduce it because in the context of these phenomenological models, it has been postulated that that could be some modification of the unroot temperature. Uh, there are like different um, derivations of that. And as far as I know, none of them is completely rigorous or it has uh, been fully established, but, the, but all of them are working, are, having this behavior, going with this, this is also a dimensionless uh, cons, uh, parameter, but then going with the cube of the acceleration. So I want to introduce it here, not because uh, it's going to be fundamental for our derivation or we depend on this form for it, but we wanted to, to see if the appearance of this kind of 
modification in urban temperature will break our construction. So we wanted to include it to, to see uh, what, what will happen. And what we have seen is that uh, in any case, any, this modification is not going to enter in our dynamics. In, it's a kinematic effect. So, but uh, we want to take it into account just, uh, just to be sure. So, okay, now I will derive the phenomenological equations of motion. I will, uh, I'm going to use uh, two derivations. The one is the based on the modified entanglement entropy by Jacobson uh, in the 216, I think. And the other is some um, derivation from Clausius entropy that we have developed based, based in a definition of uh, Pacetti and, and Bissell. And I will derive uh, by both construction, on one side to check the consistency of the derivation and on the other side, to check uh, the equivalence of the entropies at this level. And then I will briefly sketch the cosmological uh, model. So in the first derivation, the starting point will be the maximal vacuum entanglement hypothesis that uh, Jacobson postulated in that paper that is written there in the 216, uh, that said that when the geometry and quantum fields are simultaneously varied from maximal symmetry, the entanglement entropy in a small geodesic ball is maximal at fixed volume. So we will consider for our derivation a geodesic local causal diamond that is the same that uh, Jacobson also used in that derivation, uh, carry out in a maximally symmetric space time. And then we will vary simultaneously the, uh, the geometry and the quantum fields. So let me first work in this first term. And uh, this is the entanglement entropy of the horizon where we have introduced now a logarithmic correction. So this will be the standard uh, expression uh, uh, in the original derivation. And this term is the one that we have included in this uh, case. So we perform a variation, keeping uh, the variation at fixed volume of the geodesic ball, and then we get uh, an expression for the variation of the entanglement entropy, where again, the first term includes a variation of the area that was in the original derivation. And these extra terms are the ones that we are including now and then are complicating a little bit the, the situation. So now on the other side, we have the entropy of matter sector. And as I said, we have a conformal killing vector that um, will give us also a conformal killing horizon that will uh, have a temperature given by the inroad temperature. And then in order to have the quantum fields in a thermal state, we need to uh, assume that its ground state uh, is locally described by a Minkowski vacuum. This implies uh, assume the Einstein equivalence principle that I will mention a little bit uh, here, although I think that not, not very much in general because of lack of time. So then we perform the variation of these quantum fields and we will be careful on including the possible variation of Unruh temperature just to be sure that it's not uh, entering into the, our derivation that is given by this term. Where this is um, normalization of the uh, killing vector. And this is the standard term where this variation of X is the contribution I mentioned before of the, of the non-conformal fields and it's an space-time scalar. And as I will show also, it's like the root temperature is not appearing in the, in the final equation. Of, so it's showing that only the conformal sector is coupled to the uh, gravitation, to, the, to gravity. So now we consider the balance equation as previously, and we try to derive what kind of uh, equation we find. So there are some, is uh, not uh, no, I'm not going to show any detail of the calculation because I think it's too much and not worth it. But uh, let me point out several things. One is like in order to recover the original Einstein equation when we have the c equals zero is when we have no corrections, we need to fix the eta in the same sense that uh, in the other case to the Bekenstein entropy. I put here in brackets that this uh, in the classical setting implies assuming the strong equ the equivalence principle, 
But if you want to skip it, you only can consider only that your um, gravitational. Ten minutes. Sorry? 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's going, that G is going to be constant. And um, yeah, uh, another subtle thing that I will show uh, with respect to next slide is like due to the assumption of the Einstein equivalence principle, this, this equation are going to hold in every space time pot. And also because of uh, like the construction of the geodesic uh, local causal diamonds in point P holds also for any arbitrary unit time like vector. I see that because in the next equation, we, we obtain uh, the quality that depends on the point and in the, in the vectors, we can get rid of, of them because of previous assumptions and uh, the equation will hold through the space time. So um, also I have, in, as you see, there are a term that is given by the corrections that is not appearing in the original derivation and S is the traceless part of the Ricci tensor. And there are an extra scalar uh, function F that appears here and that we can set the value by differentiating with respect to the N, the, um, the no, uh, normal vectors and we get a system of condition that allow us to uh, determine this term of the corrections plus an arbitrary uh, scalar function. That to determine this scalar function, what we do is take in the trace and then finally get the expressions um, of the um, equations of motion that we have in this case, effective equations of motion. So let me, before discussing later in detail, let me point out that when you uh, take the limit C going to zero, that is recovering the classical limit, we recover the Einstein equations. Uh, we recover, in fact, the traceless equations of motion and imposing this uh, local conservation of the energy momentum tensor is when you obtain the uh, Einstein equations of motion and the appearance of the cosmological constant. So now let me go uh, quickly to the other derivation that I will only uh, mention briefly that are the derivation from Clausius entropy. Uh, there is uh, the Clausius entropy was defined by Bassetti and Visser uh, for an arbitrary space like cross section S uh, of an arbitrary null surface in a curved space time. So it was not only derived for geodesical local causal diamonds, but almost for any uh, null bifurcate uh, surface. So we have modified a little bit this um, expression of the um, Clausius entropy in order to include possible uh, modification of uncrewed temperature that was not very uh, trivial, but um, you finally can construct a, a new definition. So these are uh, a new normals, uh, future pointing, and this is the cross section at time t of the, of the horizon. So we focus in the derivation uh, for a geometrical local causal diamond. And then we calculate the entropy of the matter sector with as the difference in between the entropy in the apex of the local causal diamonds and in the uh, two sphere that is the um, uh, uh, cross section um, of the, the, the geodesic ball. And you, we see that is uh, um, given in terms of the traceless part of the energy momentum tensor. And on the other side, we calculate in a similar way than previous case, the entanglement entropy between this part of the uh, geodesical local causal diamond. And we perform the variation of the area, also subtracting the equilibrium state contribution. And um, we uh, perform the balance equation. And here is where we have to take into account an equivalence of entropies, an equivalence of the Clausius entropy and entanglement entropy and see if this is viable or not. So performing a completely equivalent derivation on the previous case that I'm not going to enter into a detail, we find finally uh, expression for the uh, equations of motion that if we compare with the other case is completely equivalent, but this numerical factor of the contribution that C that here is C over 18 pi. And in the previous case is C over 30 pi. But besides that are completely equivalent. So we can write it in a um, uh, unified way 
as a constant d that will be different in each of the de, uh, of the derivations. So first of all, let me uh, point out that this equivalence of the derivation uh, is so is showing that entropies are not completely equivalent, of course, also because we have the quantum level, but there is some degree of equivalence or something pointing out so to some equivalence because of the small numerical uh, factor of the of the difference. The other comment is that we have uh, mm, obtained a traceless equation of motion pointing out uh, again to the uh, unimodular gravity instead of GR. And now in the quantum real world, there, is, there are some differences between both theories. Also, let me uh, remark also that here we can, in this general equations that are completely general and model independent, and we have, uh, we were not able to find a general solution to the uh, local conservation of the energy momentum tensor. And it's something that uh, we are still uh, trying or looking for some uh, resolutions, but in a simple model that we have taken, uh, we were able to, to find it. I will comment in the cosmological, cost, uh, uh, cosmological case of it. So also, as you see in the expression, they are non-linear in second derivatives, but there are no contribution to, of higher derivatives. And uh, what I mentioned there is like, uh, we are also trying to, um, uh, to do some consistency checks of these equations because there are some open questions uh, like, is the femorphism invariance? And our um, first ideas is that it will have the same uh, problems that uh, unimodular gravity, and it will have uh, the same uh, different morphism invariance uh, that it has this theory, but it's something that we are still um, working on. And in that sense, we will also be interested in finding the action that uh, from which these equations can, can be derived. That is something that uh, is some also work in progress. And in the same sense, uh, to check uh, the assumption of the equivalence principles, if they are uh, keep kept in this uh, quantum case or not, and our preliminary uh, checks indicate that yes, but it's something that is uh, still uh, an open question. So uh, as we still have so many things uh, open question, first thing that we wanted to do was to check a simple case that we have more control over it. So we am going to show some sketch of a cosmological model. We consider a Freeman Lemaitre Robinson Walker uh, universe flat, flat and uh, given by this metric with A is the scale factor. And also for simplicity, we have considered a universe filled with dust. So uh, we has uh, been able to derive some ratio duty equation that is modified, that is given by this expression here. And as I mentioned in this uh, particular case, um, we uh, can uh, find uh, the energy, local energy conservation, and we can derive the Friedman equation. And the Friedman equation will be given by this expression. And as uh, just to remember this D, Remember that is the um, it comes from the corrects the the numerical factor that is in front of the logarithmic correction to the entropy. So what the first thing that we have seen is that when this d is positive, we have the same Freeman equation that uh, appears in loop quantum cosmology and that gives rise to the bounds replacing the big bang singularity. So in, when this is positive, we can see that we can avoid the singularity. When this is negative, it seems like, no, it is not that case, but it's something that we are not 100% um, uh, sure. And also another thing, so another consistency check of this Friedman equation that we have done is that there are some uh, modification of the friedman robertson walker uh, models uh, in the context of some uh, uh, generalized uncertainty principle modifications, and they uh, they they find them um, some very similar um, corrections, and also this um, uh, correction can be um, assumed as a um, uh, negative entropic force in the horizon. 
So this is our uh, preliminary result. So let me final, uh, finish this talk by a brief discussion. One is that uh, our idea was that going one step further in thermodynamics of space time and see if these other kind of derivations are valid on a general, more general uh, context. And as in this case, the introduction of quantum gravity effects and taking uh, on one side the equivalence of entropies and the persistence of, of not of the unimodular gravity instead of GR. And also our main idea was to try to find some general quantum phenomenological dynamics via the introduction of uh, quantum gravity effects on, on as logarithmic corrections uh, to the entropy. And with that, uh, check um, that phenomenon that, dyna that dynamics in uh, particular models and this is still some uh, work in progress so that we expect to have some new results to to show very very soon so thank you very much for your attention so thank you very much for your talk and uh... We have time for one or two fast questions and then we can go to the discussion session. Please. Do you have any question? Okay. I, maybe I can uh, ask something. Um, I just curiosity. Yesterday, Fabio Scardigli uh, talked about um, a modification of uh, Bekenstein bound from Gu. And from such modification to black hole entropy, I was also asking if you have some modification to holographic bound or, or Bekenstein bound or so. Yeah, I think that's a very good question because also uh, yesterday I was um, taking notes because no, we, it's something that we have not checked, but uh, I found it uh, interesting. So it's something I, I will keep in mind to, to investigate. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, if not, we can uh, thank Anna again, and uh, we can start with discussion session. And uh, the first in uh, is uh, Alessia Platania, which had a question from before. Yeah, so I still had this uh, question to Francesco. Uh, so at some point in uh, your slides, you mentioned the, the, the paper by uh, Bonanno et al. Et al. Mm -hmm. Um, saying that uh, they had the technical uh, uh, flow in their um, uh, analysis. Um, now, uh, as far as I know, that was just uh, a type when the, they um, corrected that in the updated version, uh, and they still find uh, that there, uh, there is no mass inflation. Can you comment on that? Uh, yeah. So, no, it was, it, it was not. So, okay. Um, I am quite... Okay, I am quite puzzled by the second version, but uh, about the first version, we, we, we sent them the draft before uh, submitting our paper, and uh, they acknowledged it was a technical uh, error, it was not a typo. And, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, now in the second version, uh, the, the mathematics is, uh, is in agreement between uh, our paper and their paper. So there is complete agreement about the, the mathematics. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, it would be nice. I, I would like to, to talk with them. I send them an email. Uh, so, um, because so the, the, the mathematical result is different, but the, the question changed. But uh, I mean, I don't want to talk about it too much because they are not here. But uh, uh, you still have uh, uh, the, same, the, same, the same instability. And uh, the difference is that uh, you may have in some cases, uh, rather than an exponential behavior, you may have uh, asymptotically a polynomial behavior, but uh, this asymptotically polynomial behavior uh, should, not be, should not be trusted because, uh, so this is a linear computation. And uh, you wish, show, uh, maybe I have some plots in the recap slides that I can share. Uh, 
uh, I don't find. Okay. So in some cases, like also regular back calls uh, coming from um, asymptotic safety, mm -hmm. uh, you can have, uh, so, um, so this is uh, the, the growth of the, the mass function that I, I, I put in the, in the slides, which is an exponential growth. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what you get in JAR. Now, in some cases, uh, it's true that uh, you can get uh, the delay time behavior can be polynomial. However, you can show, and this is also the case of uh, the, the black hole coming from asymptotic safety. However, you can show that uh, generically, you, you also have uh, an exponential phase always, this is generic, and uh, this exponential phase uh, will, uh, will stop uh, uh, once the, the mass inflation is already a very, uh, so the, 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 the perturbation is already a huge effect on the, of the, the, the background. So you cannot trust this analysis anymore because this is a linear analysis. And then you need the full dynamic value equation. And of course, this would be a super interesting project, take uh, some UV completion of GR and uh, go beyond the linear level. So of course, if you're interested, we can take uh, asymptotic safety. It would be very nice to try. I think it's super, it's super difficult by a technical point of view, but it would be nice. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, you can see that uh, the, the, the initial phase, and you can also calculate when this exponential phase will, uh, will end up. And you can calculate uh, what, how much the Misner sharp mass changed. And you can show that uh, the ratio between the, the Misner sharp mass uh, when uh, you start the polynomial behavior with respect to the initial one, goes is uh, something like uh, the black hole mass divided by uh, Planck mass if you have some quantum gravity renormalization scale. So yeah, you can uh, you can uh, you can have these differences, but um, I don't think this is physical. This is my point. But it comes. It is analytical in the sense that uh, comes from. Uh, some, uh, I guess, uh, asymptotic expansion, right? Yeah, and also you should not trust uh, the asymptotic, ex the asymptotic expansion too much because, uh, so when we say that uh, the, the polynomial scale of the perturbation follow the price law, so what we mean is that uh, the perturbation are at least the price law, but you see the calls, they, there is a lot of stuff. It's not just the polynomial price law scale. And also, if you put a cosmological constant, if you want to be very precise, then the, the, the very late time behavior, it's again exponential. But still, you should not trust. You should not trust these this very, very late time differences because these are unphysical. You should, uh, you should check if you, have a, a long, if you have a very long phase, like you have generically, of exponential growth, then uh, you should say, okay, then I need to go beyond the, this approximation and do the full dynamical computation. And yeah. Yes, that, that of, of course, I mean, is, is uh, stability analysis. I mean, they, they hold all the within uh, um, uh, using essentially the dynamics uh, of general relativity that the, I mean, yes. is uh, kind of, uh, uh, of course, uh, what one can uh, do right now, but uh, uh, it is certainly not the end of the story. But within uh, the dynamics uh, um, of GR, I mean, I, I still see that. Uh, so maybe this, we, we can continue um, like uh, um, privately. But I mean, I, I see, for instance, that the numerical uh, result uh, matches the analytical uh, uh, approximation. Yes, yes. So, in a sense, uh, so within uh, that model, uh, this is what you yeah. get, right? Yeah, but you, you, okay. But uh, first of all, this is still uh, an instability. It's uh, instead of going exponentially, it goes like uh, v to the thirteen, something like this. But it's still uh, uh, an instability. Uh, and second of all, if when you apply a model, you need to know when the model is going to break down. And the model is going to break down when this uh, m plus is much bigger than the initial value than the, the, the initial value of m plus. I mean, of course, you may. I mean, there are there are some ways to, to define more properly, but uh, you should know when is the model breaking out. And uh, what I mean is that uh, it's going to be much before here. I mean, this is uh, some parameter. The mass of the black hole in this model, I think, uh, this numerical evolution, I think, is uh, ten Planck mass just to integrate it. And you can see that uh, you start with something uh, which is ten Planck mass, and you get a polynomial behavior when. Uh, 
the, the black hole is 10 to the 22 Planck mass. And uh, because you have some enhancement, it was like uh, mass. I mean, so it's, it's really huge. When, uh, so you can really not trust in the, in the, the linear approximation if you put uh, an astrophysical black hole. I mean, the perturbation is already much bigger than one. You know, the, okay, the so, so what you're you are saying is that essentially these uh, blocks, like uh, both numerical and analytical, come from a linear approximation of the, um, uh, so expanding in uh, perturbations linearly. Yeah, no, so basically what you don't do when you do this, so you, you, you take a background, a background metric, and you put on top of it a perturbation, but you don't know the full uh, consistent computation, you see? So, uh, in fact, what I said during the talk is that the, all, all you can conclude is that a very, very small perturbation has a huge effect of the geometry. And then this implies that this geometry uh, seems to be unstable. Then, of course, okay. I, I, don't, I, I don't know an example in which this happened, but in principle, mm, okay. it's possible that if you do the full dynamical, it will be stable. But it should, be, yeah, it should be so it is still possible if you want to, if you imagine that you do, you can solve uh, like the um, full uh, equations, even if uh, these perturbations are uh, small and uh, tends to be unstable for a small perturbation, there could still be some uh, mechanism that uh, blocks. Yeah, the, uh, so I mean, my, 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 my opinion is this is unlikely, but uh, technically, yes, it's possible. So it would be very nice to do this computation, but I think it's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite challenging from the technical point of view. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you want to, you, you essentially disagree with the interpretation, not with the... Yes, so, the, okay, yeah, but, but maybe maybe this is something that yes, I yes. Talk, uh, yeah, yes, yeah. Just but, to yeah. You, I just give you my interpretation, then if they were here, they would give their interpretation, and it would be nice, but uh, yeah, this is my interpretation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I remind that everyone can uh, like to insert in discussion. Do you have other questions, comments to those? for the speakers. Okay. There is a Luciano, you can. Okay. So uh, I have a question for uh, Anna. Uh, so I was thinking, well, according to your model, okay, actually I have two questions. Uh, so first of all, according to your model, for instance, uh, do you think uh, you said okay you're still at the beginning and there is much more work to be done of course but in principle with the modifications that you have achieved and according to your model probably is it possible to solve uh, the problem that typically grs with one with perturbative quantization or oh, and uh, okay probably we can start with this and then if I... um I think that uh, the point is that our model is uh, phenomenological in the sense that it's not, uh, we are not taking any fundamental theory. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that that problem, it's uh, something that, for example, it can be uh, trying to understood in, in a theory of unimodular gravity. That uh, I think that there are like some, guys, although I'm, I'm not sure over the status, but our, theory is completely effective in that sense. So I think that we cannot look for, for some uh, fundamental completion in that sense. Okay, thank you. And just uh, another curiosity, actually. Um, so, uh, I mean, the starting point is, of course, the back and stand bound. And okay, you started from the modification of the back and stand bound. But uh, according to some uh, other thermodynamical statistics, uh, somehow you can also encounter a modification of the Beckett sum bound that makes it extensive. So, in a sense, that, it, that the area goes like a, a to three third to three half. So, uh, if, for instance, we try to start from such kind of analysis, do you think we can get corrections to the Einstein to the Einstein field equation, or in principle, we can get also something completely different? And so, I mean, not worth of being analyzed. Or I don't know. Sorry, I didn't get your point. So instead of uh, starting by a, a correction of uh, Bekenstein entropy, starting from a correction of the Bekenstein bound. 
Uh, no, no, a, a, a Bergen Centrovir, which is uh, extensive. Uh, sorry, I said Bergen Centrovir, probably, but I, I meant Bergen Centrovir. <laughs> sorry. Okay, okay. That's okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. So something that goes like A to some power, for instance, there are some models which also predicts uh, the Bekenstein entropy to go like A to three uh, out, as I said, so in a sense it recovers the extensivity of the entropy. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, yeah, it, it could uh, work. Our point of taking this cor logarithmic correction was that uh, were the most general ones that we found. Yeah. Because most of the derivation find this that there is some kind of logarithmic correction yeah, yeah. first leading order, but uh, you can check either what is going on with the other terms that we are uh, not considering, so extend the to other orders, or as you said, to consider other correction and see what happens. It would be very interesting to see what's the difference in the dynamics. Yes. Yeah. I think that the only problem would be computational, but not. Yeah, no, no. I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah, know. Sure. sure you can. OK. Yeah, in fact, it would be interesting to compare the. Yeah, yeah, no, no, definitely. Give you some hints of what's uh, going on uh, behind and what's the underlying theory there. So, yeah. Yeah, no, no, definitely. In fact, also, our idea was to look for some constraints on that modifications also. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, in that case, of course, it's quite natural because the, you get this correction from different points and all of them converge to a logarithmic correction, mm -hmm. just like the one that you started with. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hey, there is a common question from Gabriele Jonti. Yes, I have a question for Anna as well. Um, I would like to understand something. Um, these issues about the fact that uh, gravity should emerge like uh, from a, a sort of uh, thermodynamic analysis uh, does still still prove the fact that probably uh, gravity is a, a thermodynamic theory and there should be some more fundamental theory. Yeah, this that's your, sorry. This is your um, underlying idea, so to say. Uh, in fact, um, that's a very good point because uh, there are like all the uh, seminal works from this thermodynamics pointing out that the Einstein equations are recovered as an equation of state. Yes. So they are not the fundamental theory that needs to be quantized, that is the thermodynamics. So that's an option, of course. And then you can uh, consider that uh, entropy corrections as some kind of statistical fluctuations that will give mm -hmm. similar corrections and then you are considering and quantizing that thermodynamic theory. But there are also some interpretation that I think are, were not considered at the beginning, that is that uh, this relation is not implying that the fundamental theory is the thermodynamic one, because you can have some derivation of the entropy, like in the case of world entropy from mm -hmm. your Lagrangian and your action construction. And then what you are pointing out is that of course, there is a strong connection between the thermodynamics and the gravity, but it's not that the thermodynamic is the basic one. And the point is that at this stage, I don't see any fundamental reason to think that any of the other is uh, more correct. So mm -hmm. I think it's a matter of interpretation. For the but uh, from what also, you, from your work, it, it looks, but I'm not, I don't understand how you interpret it, that uh, the fundamental theory should be or could be a quantum theory of gravity because you you yeah i mean uh of of course that was uh, one of the original points of view because of the origin of the correction that we introduced to entropy but you also can include the same kind of corrections by not considering the quantum theory of gravity but okay. simply statistical fluctuations and okay. you put exactly the same so uh, in our work, we are not pointing out to any option uh, for the moment. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Point of views? Okay, Luca. I actually have a short question for Francesco and Alessia. 
So during uh, Francesco's talk, there was a question, actually a comment from Alessia to Francesco about, uh, uh, yeah, Francesco showed a class of uh, space times which do not include space times with uh, curvature, with uh, integrable curvature singularities, as Alessia uh, uh, repeated. So just, I mean, if one of you can comment, like are curvature, integrable curvature singularities always uh, physicable, physically reasonable, or I mean, I mean, how can we think of them from a physical point of view? Um, I don't know, Francesco, yeah, let's say for Francesco. Yeah, um, I, I, I just go ahead. Okay, okay, no, that just, yeah, I mean, I don't have a, a strong opinion in merits, I have to say. So for sure, they're not as bad as genetic incompleteness, but uh, um, yeah. I will then, I mean, it would be still bad. I mean, it's still, um, um, it's also not clear to me if, uh, if this, um, uh, I, I also the stability of this, uh, this, uh, this curvature singularities, even if you assume that uh, you say, okay, I'm fine with curvature singularities, which I'm not sure if, uh, if you should be, but uh, then uh, uh, again, what happened, uh, uh, when you consider other type of perturbation, when you consider other type of, uh, uh, you know, I mean, in vacuum is one thing when you consider matter flowing it can be different, but it is the back action again, like for the inner horizon. Um, so, I mean, I think you should think case by case, but I, I don't have a strong opinion on this, I need to say. Um, but maybe Alessia, I think she's more- Yeah, I mean, um, so I think uh, there are uh, they are at least uh, uh, interesting to study because there isn't uh, a lot of uh, literature in, uh, in that direction. And uh, potentially, uh, I mean, not potentially, but they evade uh, the, the conclusions uh, of uh, Francesco about uh, mass inflation. So they could still be viable. And uh, what you gain is that uh, you have um, um, essentially a space time where, uh, yes, you have uh, the invariance uh, that diverge like the depression scalar but you can uh, integrate the Jurassic question um, beyond the um, singularity. And uh, this means that it is not physically um, as bad as uh, uh, singular uh, uh, space times. Yeah, sure. Well, in fact, I, I, also, yeah, I also mentioned that, I mean, this is not at all different uh, with, I mean, it's exactly the same as uh, having some region where the geometry is not defined. Physically, it's completely the same. Like you have some, I, I don't see any difference. So as I mentioned, this is still a possibility. So yeah, I, I don't see many much difference between these two these two cases, like the, uh, an extendable curvature singularity or a region where you cannot define the metric and then have some, some other type of uh, evolution and then you can define another region, you know, like the, the, the Rovelli model. That's fine. Um, so which models are you referring to exactly? Because there are several. So the, la the last one, the one he's going to talk about tomorrow, I think, which is some sort of uh, uh, local minimum and uh, for the radius and uh, the yes. bounds. And yes, then yes, in, the, in this case, the problem is that this, this, this modification also are, are, are outside the trapping region, but it's the, ob the object is Planck and size, so it will be also be fine. So it's, uh, but anyway, he's giving a talk tomorrow, so I, I don't want to say. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, the, the only thing is that in that case, uh, um, um, you are uh, essentially attaching the, the two regions uh, uh, by hand, if you want. You are, you are constructing that models uh, um, ad hoc, yeah, you, if you want. Yeah, you, you don't have the space time in that region. So mm -hmm. it's fine. I mean, you can, yeah, you can do, you can, in a way, you can do everything you want, like you also for. Uh, if you do this kind of stuff, but uh, if you have a, the full theory of quantum gravity justify this procedure, then uh, then it's fine, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. I mean, yes, if you if you can find uh, like uh, uh, something like a metric that describes uh, that, maybe uh, it works uh, well. It's just that uh, I'm not aware of any. Um... No, no, I think I think you cannot. I mean, you can find the metric. It cannot be differentiable, but uh, but uh, I mean. Yes. Uh, but it can be continuous. You can be you can find a continuous matrix. Yes, the, while the models with integrable singularities, so you you can also have uh, um, derivatives uh, of the matrix that are continuous. 
this is, I think, the difference. I mean, for uh, uh, you? interpretable singularities, essentially, you, um, if you think in terms of um, um, a standard uh, um, sort like uh, metric with a generic uh, lapse, lapse function, um, and uh, I mean, you identify the um, say uh, R dependent pass over R with a Newtonian potential. So the condition would be that. Uh, uh, that function, uh, its first derivative over R and its second derivative are uh, regular in, uh, in zero. So. Okay. But then, but is this, where is it coming from? Like, uh, so the. the... Um, so I can send you um, a paper. Uh, there mm -hmm. is uh, apparently theorem that uh, says that, and uh, so the um, uh, essentially the the proof uh, um, essentially considers the um, um, various components of the uh, geodesic uh, uh, equation, um, and uh, uh, you can see that they are uh, um, related. At least the, the radial ones are related to to these uh, uh, functions. So. The um, equivalent of the Newtonian potential, uh, it's the first the derivative over R and the second derivative. But I can send mm -hmm. you a paper, is uh, an old one. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Other comments or questions? Um, maybe I can ask uh, something to Anna uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Hi, Anna. Hi, how are you? Fine, how are you? Fine. Nice to see you. Good. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, so first, I, uh, so I, uh, I have to say I missed uh, like five minutes or so of your talk because I, I was preparing breakfast. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so I wanted to ask uh, first uh, where the logarithmic uh, corrections were um, um, coming from. So are these uh, like one loop corrections? The logarithmic corrections um, for the Bakkenstein entropy or entanglement? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, uh, it depends on the theory. Yeah, in the case of the entanglement entropy, yes, it comes from one loop corrections and higher orders also later. Mm -hmm. And I think um, now let's try to remember. Also, I think that in some cases, some try to count on over microstates in some theories like loop quantum gravity. I think it's one of the tries. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the resource is also a prediction of uh, string theory, but there I have no idea how it's derived. I don't remember at all if I understood in some moment. <laughs> And also in ADS-CFT in, in a correction to Ryuta Nagi formula. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but in general, I mean... What, sorry? Um, so in general, maybe then... Uh, uh, so if they are um, one-loop um, um, corrections, um, th there would be, of course, uh, more to, to consider. So and the, even the final form of the uh, correction would be very different from uh, uh, logarithmic. Um, so maybe um, can you uh, comment on the, the regime uh, of applicability of the one-loop approximation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, I think that the, um, the main point is that um, on one side, these corrections are only valid in a regime that is still far from Planck regime because we are considering the existence of space-time. That's on one side. And second, it's like we are taking the leading order correction. The other thing would be to take higher order corrections. Although our idea is that they are not changing so much because they are not dominant. And in the specific case of the uh, entropy that you find, um, I'm not a uh, very expert also because it's, it was predicted in different theories. So not sure uh, 
if the differences are going to be very uh, great, uh, big, but in the case of the one loop correction that have been developing, I, I don't remember the name, but if you're interested, I can send you the paper. Uh, after he considering one loop corrections, but that he, uh, the author check it with higher order corrections and uh, it's, it still was logarithmic. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm not sure of the limitations of the study and also, yeah, not, not completely sure about that. But that is also depending on the, in that case, it's also depending on the, on the geometry of the horizon that you are considering. So it's not going to be the same corrections for, uh, you know, Svarsi or for Green mm. um, Yes, my, my point was mostly is that uh, uh, I, I would expect this uh, correction to, um, to be um, plug mass uh, suppressed. Um, and uh, maybe for uh, uh, Planck and uh, black holes, so the, uh, the, the one loop approximation uh, uh, is not enough because then uh, all of the corrections uh, would count quite a lot. Yeah, yeah of course, yeah. as I said, we have to be uh, still far from Planck length because of the consideration mm -hmm. of the geometry. So, oh, okay, sorry, I missed uh, that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay. in that case, it's going, it seems that it's going to be, yeah. The logarithmic is going to be the dominant. Good. Any common questions from everyone? Okay, I don't see any other comments or questions, so maybe we can do a break and we recollect that. 15.45, just. 25 minutes. Right? Mm -hmm. hmm? 25 minutes. 25 minutes, good. We have the scheduled break today. <laughs> okay, good. See you later. Adesso, sì. Adesso va il coro.
Mi senti adesso, Luca? Sì, ti sì, sentiamo. Ti ah, mi sentite. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao, Fred. Mi vedo provati? No, ok. No. <ride> No. ok ok noi c'è un problema con la camera no? la videocamera non riesco ad attivare vabbè non è un problemissimo no? nel mm, caso no, vabbè. Ma, ma stai alla Charles o stai a casa? Eh, io non lo posso dire ma sono alla Charles ah, cioè, ci, ci sono ma non ci sono <ride> ok eh. <ride> nel caso puoi andare a fare tutto questo è, è registrato ma... ecco qua mi sono fottuto perfetto ma, non è è su YouTube, <ride> sei YouTube. <ride> appunto su YouTube eccoci qua Vabbè, colpa vostra, maledetti. Eh, <ride> che, doma dire... che domande imbarazzanti. Beh, potevi anche dire a casa e poi ci mandavi un messaggio in privato. <ride> eh, eh, non potevo dire proprio. Vabbè, comunque, non... Vabbè, comunque io devo fare il... Oh, coso, il moderatore della di quella di cosa, no? Di la terza sessione, non questa. Questo dovrebbe sì. essere di Fabio. Però. Sì, questo è Fabio, però è un problema se non mi si vede a moderare. Forse un po'. Eh? Posso scendere giù da Luca a quel punto? È un là, problema, se... è un problema. Eh sì, puoi farlo è meglio che mi si veda. Allora scendo giù da Luca, che lui è visibile là, diciamo. Eh? Sì, va bene. Va sì, bene. Sì, sì, sì. Invece Vabbè, questa cosa... Sei compromesso, così già sappiamo. E oramai <ride> mi avete fatto dire. Sentite, eh, no, perché questa qua eh, do una mano a Fabio rispetto alle domande che dovessero eventualmente... Ah, sì, 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 ricordo. Siccome sì, la, la, diciamo, è utilizzato un po'... Come seminario del dipartimento, no? Perché i ragazzi qua hanno l'obbligo sì. di un seminario a settimana, che è, quindi gli, gli dicono di vedere questo. E se vogliono fare domande, le fanno nella, nella chat quell'altra, perché se no dovevano iscriversi. Sì, sì, sì. Ok, vabbè, questa cosa la posso gestire da qua, magari poi eh, per Maldasena scendo giù. Mm, ok. Ok, ok. Allora mi levo di mezzo. Mm. Luca, io scendo un attimo giù, uh, lascio tutto a te. <ride> Luca, uh, ok? Non fa male, Luca. No, no, è Luca serio. Uh, ovviamente non mi riferivo a te. Eh. <ride> no, no, no. Ma ne so io che gestisco la baracca, quindi eh, guarda no. che ti caccio. <ride> eh, ci vediamo tra poco.
Hello, Gerard. Hi. Ah, I don't know. Ah, you need to unmute. Uh, you need to unmute. Ah, yeah, now yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, now yes. Excellent. How are you? Put the sound a bit higher. So this is better. Now I'm going to search my file. Oh, oh thank you. Uh, hi, hi, Professor Tov. Hello. Um, so because I, I re-entered, I was teaching. Ciao, Fabio. Oh, hi. Hello. And uh, now where is my file? The gun. Okay. Um, this. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes perfect. Ah. Um, it's probably with the garbage around it or not? No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Oh, it's fine. It's just only only the the active uh, only the, the the active pictures visible. Yeah, we don't see them. We don't see them. Oh, okay, but uh, it works all right, huh? Yes. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, Oh, yes. And actually, I should have mentioned this is a Slack series. What is exactly the base? Ah, this, it's just, ah no, this is the, um, the, the quantum and the gravity conference. Yeah, yeah. It's quantum it's gravity okay. and all that, but I, I, didn't, okay. I didn't put it it's okay, it's okay. down a university here from where it came. Um, okay. So. Yeah, I think we have still 13 minutes. Maybe I can, uh, but I, if, uh, if you want, I can, uh, because I'm sorry that I cannot stay for the discussion session uh, later on, but okay. uh, uh, of course I'm reading your uh, recent papers, it is about the past, uh, and uh, slow variables, and perhaps I will write to you to understand more because uh, it's, it's very interesting. All, uh, all that uh. today, I've sent a revised version of the uh, paper on the hidden variables, just trying to be more clear. Yeah, I would like really so to, yeah, tomorrow, to it will be on it, the version two, will be visible. Okay, okay, because uh, it's I, I'm really intrigued by this. Um, way going uh, around the Bell, uh, Bell's theorem, if I understood it, because of this uh, bringing yeah. of time reversal somehow. I mean, these are the assumptions that uh, he did, and, uh, which seems very... Yeah, I'm trying to be a bit more explicit on the Bell experiment, because it, it is, it has to be explained. Yes. And, uh, no, but I think I think uh, was clear already the idea because in fact, uh, teaching quantum field theory, I mean, when uh, uh, you discuss locality, you discuss a Pauli Jordan function, I mean, there isn't this uh, time reversal, uh, of course. So that uh, should be sufficient for uh, constraining uh, uh, as a condition, as, uh, as you say in one of these uh, recent papers. So uh, no, no, no. It, it intrigues me because we have uh, done this model with the two. Uh, copies of oscillators, which are one of the time reversal of the other. So it seems to go somehow in that direction. I, I'm very curious. Okay. No, I, I think the issue is very basic that uh, you have to understand how the physical world works. And uh, I'm trying to explain why I'm saying that observers have no free will. You know, it sounds rather esoteric, right? This is not physics when you talk about free will uh, somehow. But I claim it is, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm coming with arguments to explain that um, 
there, there is a catch in my theory, a price to pay, so to speak. And that is that um, before writing down an effective theory that explains your quantum mechanical behavior, you have to choose a basis. Yeah. And now the point is when Bob and Alice change their settings, they are going to change to another basis. And that is why, uh, why you can't have one theory that explains all different settings chosen by Alice and Bob. You, you first must, must have them choose the settings and then you can make the model that, that goes with those settings. But if you choose other settings, you have again, revise the model. And, yeah. um, right. and that means yeah. if you want to avoid that, you say, well, then have the laws of physics make Alice and Bob change the settings. But that was the question of free will. But, but one, one question, I mean, you say at some point that these uh, slow variables, they are associated to um, ontological uh, uh, states. But, uh, yes, ontological in the sense that uh, they are the original variables that an, an observer can see. And, and the observer sees something happening in front of his eyes. And that is claimed to be ontological. That is indeed what is actually happening in this model. It's not a wave function with a certain value and so on, but it is really something happening. So mm -hmm. the deterministic theory tells you that yes, a particle like a photon is hopping around. It sits here, it goes to there, it goes to there. Uh, but the big difficulty is what are the laws? What are the rules that tell the photon to go from here to here? And you can derive those from quantum mechanics, but you first must choose your basis. And uh, that wasn't so clear in the beginning. At least it wasn't emphasized. Yeah, yeah. So, so that it remains this idea of the variables that uh, should commute at any, at any time to define this ontological basis. It, yeah. uh, it's not uh, incompatible with that kind of uh, um, vision that you, you were exposing also in the book. So we are, we are talking, uh, so they are associated to these slow variables. Yes, those are slow variables, but then I add to them fast variables, but actually fast variables are not necessary to understand quantum mechanics, but they are necessary to get something that looks like the world we see today. Yes. So the world we see today, what we don't see today is the very fastest degrees yes. of freedom of nature because they go far too quickly. No, no, but the TEV yeah. scale, they go so fast that you don't see them. This seems and, very, very natural to me. I, I like very much the fact that uh, they are, yeah, these are associated to heavy particles in the standard model and staying in yes. the lower energy state. What I really don't understand when you go to black holes and you talk about uh, the anti-vacuum state, to be honest, I was... Okay. I'll, I'll try to explain that now. It's not easy to understand how, <laughs> how it goes about, but um, I'm claiming that that is what the hydro Hawking state actually is. People don't realize the heart of Hawking state sees, looks at visible particles in our quadrant of the universe, but there are invisible particles at the other end. Now I'm claiming the other invisible particles are not the, what you think particles are, but they're actually holes in a whole sea of particles because time runs backwards. So energy goes to minus the energy. And that way you can, you can understand why the heart of Hawking vacuum is so complicated that there are particles around. That's because in the other half of the universe, the whole universe is filled with particles, but there are a few holes in there. And what you thought were particles are actually just holes at the other side. In solid state physics, it's all fairly natural what's happening. You have full... The image I got is the one you, you mentioned. Okay, if I look from far, uh, matter going to black hole, this is slows down and it, uh, it is a big uh, uh, bunch of matter near to the black hole. So on the other side, the same will happen for an observer inside with respect to walking the radiation going outside, if I understood that. And so this justifies why it is full, the state there is, uh, is this, uh, um, but uh, I, I was a bit lost, <laughs> I have to admit, so I, I have to... Yeah. Maybe the it's delicate because you could also have just said that let's just take the vacuum state and have all the states that you see, all the excited particles that you see there be extra particles as seen by the distant observer. But that doesn't really work. And I think, well, when I had, was in Princeton at some point and when Ed was around that uh, he was making a valid point 
there was a, a difficulty with the factor i in field theory that if uh, that if you look at the commutators in p and x there's an i in that commutator and that i doesn't easily want to change it to minus i but it does if you uh, if you also invert time that means you have a a quantum mechanics when the, the energy spectrum not only has a minimum but also a maximum so that there's a vacuum at the minimum there's an anti-vacuum near the maximum and uh, um, in my way of looking at quantum mechanics this is very natural but for many people it is totally weird and unnatural and uh, oh, no, I, I mean, this for me is uh, very reasonable and for me, it's very unreasonable ever at the <laughs> vision, I mean, for example. It depends on the... Yeah. But you know, I'm try, really trying to get uh, from your papers, I mean, okay, I, I will keep reading uh, a sort of recipe how to, to apply and to work some model, uh, trying to do this separation of uh, fast and uh, slow variables to make a, a small model and see how it works. This I would like very much to, to do. Yeah, okay, we, we will see. Yeah, the nice thing is the fast variables are so fast, they, they repeat themselves so quickly that only that the first energy I excited states is very high. Yeah. So it's it's very much like in the standard model where you have the vacuum and this very heavy particle, this unification particle, you know, the SU5 bosons, yeah. Yeah. to excite the first excited state requires an enormous amount of energy. So in practice, we don't see those a grand unifying, uh, you know, intermediate bosons, they're far too heavy to make in any accelerator. So we just see nothing. That state of the world is just in its ground state. Mm -hmm. But being in the ground state does mean that uh, the, if you then look at ontological observable field values, they oscillate very fast. Mm -hmm. And uh, that means they're not in one single state anymore. And that to me is a source of quantum mechanics that, that you have now rather delicate states uh, where the, uh, this highly excited, this very heavy particle is in a superposition of all its possible states, uh, ontological states. Mm -hmm. And because of that, all other particles will also now, from now on, be in superimposed states. And you can't select a single ontologically observable variable anymore. And so that's why our world is quantum mechanics. That's the way I see it now, roughly, but, but in any case, I not used to that yet. Yeah, if we would know which combinations are more similar to the variables rather than P and Q, we could do better than what we do with quantum mechanics, or is impossible? I mean, any any choice of, of, of observables uh, cannot... But these, these, finite sequences of, these finite sequences of energy levels, the beginning and end, they... I've, they very much remind you of the LZ operator, so the angular momentum operators, where L plus and L minus add a unit to, to LZ. But if L squared is finite, then there's a maximum to LZ as well as a minimum. So LZ goes from minus L to L. So near minus L, you have an ordinary world where, where L plus creates a so-called particle, actually just a unit of angular momentum. And But uh, L plus cannot go farther than than the ceiling where, uh, sure. L, where M equals plus L. And so, but now you say, okay, but I can just rotate the picture around and what was a vacuum now becomes an anti-vacuum and vice versa. Oh. So if you would replace ordinary fields in quantum field theory by angular momentum-like operators, then, then you see these things happening oh. in the face. And I think something like this will have to happen near the Planck scale. That, fields are no longer creating particles at infinitum, but there's a maximum amount of particles that you can create in a very small volume. And the, another thing, um, when you look at this double click experiment, start. this is a very, very, uh, uh, it's okay, we are already- uh, We have, uh, we need to start. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, we are to, uh, I'm sorry, I took it. <laughs> Later, there will, there will be time, so. Okay, so uh, I think uh, uh, we can start now this uh, uh, second session of the day. We have uh, uh, four speakers, uh, Gerhard Hoft, Samir Matur, Nava Gadem, Ahmed Almehiri. Uh, each speaker has 30 minutes plus five uh, minutes for questions. 
I'll give to the speaker a five minutes warning at uh, the minute 25th of his talk. And uh, by the way, this session will be followed by the students of Chalmers University <coughs> on the uh, YouTube channel, which are, um, are very welcome to, to pose questions. And so uh, the first speaker of, this, of the, this session is Professor Gerhard Toft from Utrecht. It is a real ple pleasure to have him uh, with us. Uh, his name is uh, so famous for uh, his work in physics that surely he doesn't need uh, a presentation. So uh, I quickly shut up myself and uh, I uh, give him uh, the stage. So Gerard, please, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Fabio. So the talk I'm going to give now, I have given several times earlier but uh, I always had to end before I really touched the interesting subjects. So what I'll do now is I'll very briefly repeat the arguments I've presented before, and then I wanted to spend more time on the really important issues which usually come at the end. So um, the question is about the quantization of black holes and the arguments I've seen most often is that somehow the quantization of black holes is complex. Uh, it's, it's complexity that governs the situation and uh, that there's very little you can do to understand its fundamental properties. I think that is not true. I think actually the fundamental properties of black holes can be derived. They are about as easy to write down as the fundamental properties of the hydrogen atom. The equations are very similar. It's undergraduate physics, mathematical physics that you need to solve these equations. And the interesting question comes uh, when you want to interpret what is going on, just like it was for the hydrogen atom 100 years ago or something like that. So um, uh, this is the black hole in its conventional coordinates. That's to say, I have R, T, and theta and phi. And uh, you have on top here the uh, um, uh, Schwarzschild equation for the uh, Schwarzschild solution. I'll mainly focus on Schwarzschild and not on the generalizations, which of course you can also handle, but I don't think they give so many new uh, conceptual difficulties as just the first one. So what you see here is time runs vertically, ingoing particles go in, but they only approach the horizon exponentially, but never really go through the horizon, only at time equals plus infinity. The outgoing particles come out from time equals minus infinity. This is the stationary black hole you see here. Some particles may come in, some particles may come out, but they are very light compared to the mass of the black hole itself. So the black hole sits there as a fixed rigorous background. And this seems to be the ideal configuration to study, to see how black holes behave in a short uh, period of time, short compared to its actual lifetime and the time it needs for the black hole to change. I take only light particles going in and going out because they seem to dominate the whole picture. And um, uh, here, this is uh, the usual picture, but these are not the ideal coordinates to look at a black hole. It's better to, um, to make a conformal transformation and to get what we call a Penrose diagram. This diamond is the same region as I had previously here, only outside the horizon. So it's only this domain here. I don't look at what happens inside the horizon and uh, I make sure that the coordinates are such that the local light cone is just uh, oriented like this in 45 degrees. And so this is what we call a conformal transformation. It is useful because now you see more precisely what's happening. The ingoing particles go in, but the horizons have split up in two horizons. There's a future event horizon actually showing what happens at the infinite future in time. At the infinite past in time, you see the past event horizon. Now people argue a black hole usually has a history of being formed by an implosion. The implosion would become in the place of a past event horizon. Formally, that is of course correct, but actually that happened so far in the past that is of no relevance to us to study the states of a stationary black hole. 
It doesn't have to be static. It doesn't have to be uh, unchanging, but it's stationary. That is the changes are very small uh, and they, ha they happen in a short time period. So the time period I'm looking at is much, much shorter than the entire lifetime of the black hole. And then you see that, that the past develops a past event horizon, just like the future develops a future event horizon. But in reality, also a black hole might evaporate and then there is no infinite future there. So we have the same problems of defining horizons in the future as defining horizons in the past. But let's consider this picture. And the starting point is that if I take this picture and I put particles in this, you can take the vacuum here, but you can also have all sorts of particles. Think of an accretion disk or other particles that are surrounding the black hole, very close to the horizon or very far from the horizon. You may or may not create an annihilate particles here. The physics of the situation is relatively simple. This is just field theory in curved space time. And as long as you stay within this quadrant, there's nothing spectacular happening. This uh, is, is just a way of, of um, describing the states. The difficulty will be what happens when particles go through the horizon. And where do these particles from the past horizon, where do they come from? If you want a theory of black holes that resembles theories of other objects, like a bucket of water, an atom, a molecule, you name it, then you say whatever goes in eventually determines what comes out later. So you would expect that the ingoing particles determine what particles come out. But anyone looking at this diagram says, wait a minute, time runs vertically here. The ingoing particles go in in the infinite future, but actually time is infinity here. And time is minus infinity here. So the outgoing particles come out from minus infinity. How could it be that the ingoing particles have any effect on the outgoing particles? They shouldn't because they are the wrong period in time. That's what you think at first sight. But then you can say, but wait a minute, the particles approach the horizon very fast. So very soon the particles will be sitting right here when they go in and they just in some not so far away past the particle, outgoing particles were here at the outgoing horizon. So if you now change the time a little bit, you're going to look at a particle which, which went in long ago, then the particle went in like this here. A particle that comes out fairly late could come out like this. So the theory we really want to understand is how will the late outgoing particles be determined by the early ingoing particles. And now you see that all the physical interesting happen, happens right here at the origin. And this very tiny diamond right here, I hope you can see my cursor by the way, um, the diamond right here is just of Planckian dimensions. So all we need to do is to, to understand the outgoing particles in terms of ingoing particles is understand what happens in this Planckian domain. And you say that's Planck scale physics. We don't know, something might, well, might as well happen. And that's indeed what you do expect. You expect new physics here in this domain. If you let time go by, you see that actually time for a distant observer is a Lorentz transformation for a local observer. So actually you have here a Lorentz invariant curve beyond which this pink region, new physics is supposed to be taking place. Um, and um, the question is, how can we derive what happens in the entire black hole, including this, when uh, you take all forces into account. Now, the forces, all forces do not have the ability to replace ingoing particle by an outgoing particle, except for gravity. Gravity can do this. And I can explain to you how it works. Um, so very briefly, a, a particle with very high momentum, you see the particle which closes in to the past, horizon, to the past event horizon, if you wait long enough, that particle is going to have a tremendous amount of momentum. Momentum will be so big that after a while, uh, you'll see the gravitational effect of that, and that is a shift. So the outgoing particle will be shifted. And you can imagine, if you go back to this picture, if the outgoing particle is shifted, it might well be shifted across this horizon. And then what happens? That's what we have to consider. And um, this is called the Shapiro time shift effect. Shapiro, of course, was thinking of a photon being looked at when it grazes the sun and we look at, at, the, at that particle, it's slightly time changed. So now um, to take these shifts into account, we have to look at the extended diagram. This is the Penrose diagram of an eternal black hole. Again, I'm not going to look at the ingoing, 
imploded particles which made the black hole. Neither am I going to look at the final explosion, uh, but I'm just ignoring those. And then it means that at the horizon, there is no significant amount of gravity changing this, this picture. And there's no, no significant amount of gravity changing the picture here. So now we have the analytic continuation of the Schwarzschild equations here. And that analytic uh, continuation is this diagram, which is much bigger than the original diagram and has an, a new universe here opening, universe number two. And the standard idea many people have is that this is somehow the interior of the black hole. I claim that cannot be the interior because it has an asymptotic region. It must be another part of the ultra black hole. Later, I'll argue that this is actually the other side of the black hole, but I'll have to explain that later. What we now do is we introduce Cauchy surfaces, but because of these shifts effects here near the origin, I cannot stop the Cauchy surface here. Normally speaking, you would expect the Cauchy surface to just pivot around the origin like this. And you only would expect the region one to be relevant for the physics of a black hole. But now because particles can be shifted, can be dragged along the horizon here, now I may have to make my Cauchy surface twice as big. It has to range from minus infinity to plus infinity. And as time goes on, the Cauchy surface moves and you can use ordinary quantum field theory to calculate what happens. Except that very near the origin, something unconventional might happen because of the Shapiro effect. So that we do. And now let's take that gravitational shift and compute it. I didn't mention in the beginning the amount of the shift, but it, roughly speaking is, is if a particle with momentum P comes in, then the particle going out at the position U minus, this is a light cone co local light cone coordinates, that U minus is proportional to the P minus of the ingoing particle. And there is a Green's function F here. And the Green's function F can be computed. Basically it's two dimensional physics. It's the, the shock wave of the ingoing particle that you have to compute, you have to compute the gravitational effect. And, and uh, I explained last time that, that that gives you a nice looking wave equation for this function f. It's actually a two dimensional uh, green function looking like a logarithm, but it's not quite a logarithm because it's in, it depends on angles and not on straight rectangular coordinates. So um, what you have now is that I'm bringing in about, suppose I create an extra ingoing particle with momentum P minus, or rather delta P minus. I add such a particle, then the question is what happens to the outgoing particles if I add an ingoing particle? The ingoing particle added will now shift the outgoing particles according to this, this effect from the, uh, the gravitational field. So if you know delta P, then delta U is just the Green's function acting on delta P. Now I can take this equation, I put it here for a moment, and now I'm going to make an important change. I'm going to change this equation by this equation. Now at first sight, it looks identical. So what was the change? The change was that this delta has been removed. I say, well, you don't, you don't have to consider only the changes of the ingoing particles and the replacements of the outgoing particles. You can consider all ingoing particles in history of the black hole and all outgoing particles um, that came out. And that means that instead of delta P, I talk about P and U themselves. And because the deltas are related by this equation, I now claim, and this is basically the only place where I change the laws of physics here, that it's the particles themselves which are being replaced with this. So now this P represents all ingoing particles and this U represents all outgoing particles. And uh, once you assume this, this automatically follows, but that the arrow goes from here to here is something delicate that, okay, you might not really want to accept that, but that is where all the interesting physics will come from. This means that ingoing particles turn into outgoing particles if you, if you use this formula. So now you see in and out will be related. Um, this will include actually the particles which made, which made the black hole by an implosion effect. Mm -hmm. But those particles happened, went in so long ago that you have to understand uh, that momentum and position particle depend exponentially on time for the outside observer. And um, um, that means that 
the ingoing particles which may collapse have a tremendously large value of P minus. So that completely blurs this equation. But uh, I'll say now I'll only consider a, a few of these particles, not all of them. And not all particles which went in ages ago, but the particles which went in only uh, for uh, a few minutes ago. And uh, the outgoing particles, they come out a few minutes later. Then the exponential factors already become significant and um, you know, get these equations. So um, what I'm going to do is to replace the ingoing particles or outgoing particles saying that they are identical. These equations tell you if your ingoing particles are going in momentum P minus, then the outgoing particles go in momentum Q minus, but it's basically the same particle. And that I'll explain now in the following exp explanation. Now, um, what this does is it gives a one-to-one -one mapping of the ingoing particles onto the outgoing particles, which was exactly what I was searching for. Now, the new element in, in my arguments has always been that you can actually solve these equations and the solution of the equation is actually quite easy. You have to replace the momentum of an ingoing particle by the momentum distributions generated by all ingoing particles. And you have to look at the average position of all outgoing particles. So P of theta and phi are the momentum of the ingoing particles. U of theta and phi are the positions of the outgoing particles. And if I now expand this whole thing in spherical harmonics, then you see that in spherical harmonics, you have uh, this, this green function is diagonalized. So we find that at every L and M for the spherical harmonics, the ULM is just a function of the PLM and you can invert the function around. And um, the interesting thing about the U's and P's is that they obey quantum relations. If you have a single particle, you understand exactly that the position of the particle is, is determined by the momentum of the particle by doing the Fourier transform. So quantum mechanics is introduced by Fourier transforming or by introducing this commutator between U and P. But of course, U plus has, an has a commutator with P minus and U minus has a commutator with P plus. Whereas the relation caused by gravity relates U minus to P minus and U plus to P plus. You see all together, this gives you an algebra that if you know one of these four operators, you can compute all the others by these equations. The U's and the P's are just directly proportional to each other in, in, the, in the plus and in the minus direction, but, um, but, but the commutator relates to U plus and the P minus. So if you have one of them, you know all the others. And you find, of course, this is the basis of the Fourier transformation. The momentum of the ingoing particle after Fourier transformation gives you the momentum of the outgoing particles. Um, now, the interesting calculations come when you say, wait a minute, um, this actually is the expression which, which concerns local properties of the particles. That is the properties close to where the two horizons cross like this. But far away, you want to use the coordinates for the distant observer instead. So you want to go from, um, uh, from U and P to the coordinates R and T, like here. So um, um, the, uh, uh, and, and the coordinates R and T are for a distant observer, but the local observer has U and P, which are not the same coordinates. Actually, they are the so-called Tortoise coordinates, or you can also call them um, uh, Sequeira's coordinates. And um, um, in, in terms of these coordinates, you realize that there's an exponential relationship. So the light cone coordinates for the distant observer are exponential functions of the coordinates very close by. That's where the wider we came in horizon, an exponential ca cannot change sign so easily. And whereas uh, for the local observers, you can go from minus to plus. So, um, so going to this exponentiated coordinates means that if, if R and T, uh, so for instance, rho, these are the, the in and the outgoing coordinates of the particles in this quadrant, far away from the origin, where you see that if you have a, a time translation for a distant observer, it means that the U will exponentially uh, decrease with time and the P will exponentially increase in time. So the time for a distant observer depends 
generates exponentially the behavior of um, uh, of the of the unit p close to the origin, and what you have to do now is make coordinate transformation, replace these r's by uh, well exponentiate them, and the the u and the p coordinates I am using to describe the, how the particles cross the horizon are exponential functions of the distance of the coordinates for the distant observer. So you have to replace close to the horizon. You have to replace. Uh, the u by an e to the power rho in and the u i out by e to the power rho out. But when you do that, you have to realize that exponentials can only have one sign, whereas the u and the p here can have both signs, which just means they can hop from one region to the other region very easily. So the u and the p can switch sign easily, but for the outside observer, they cannot switch sign. So in both cases, I have to add a sign sigma in front. So sigma is plus or minus. And um, uh, uh, when I introduce those signs, I have a complete description, a one-to-one -one description of a particle in this big Penrose diagram and a particle that is uh, active locally near the horizon. It is very important because now I want to see what these equations become if I make this substitution. And um, one interesting question is how, what happens when you have a translation in time for the distant observer? Well, then these rows will just get an addition in time or a subtraction in time, but the u's will be exponentially depend on, on this distant time of, uh, coordinate. And that's the u's and the p's both depend exponentially on time. So now what happens when you Fourier transform? The u's and the p's have this Fourier kernel. The Fourier transform is entirely non-local. But now the question is, what happens if you do this, but I make this substitution, that I replace u by something exponential as a function of the nuclear coordinates rho, and I do this for both the u's and the, and, and the p's. And I have to remember this sine sigma. Um, and um, then what you find is that you get in, in an exponentiated expression. So if I plug this in, the P and the U are both exponential. So I get a double exponential in these expressions. That's a new integration kernel. So the Fourier transform, which is very easy in all of my coordinates, becomes something a little bit more complex. And actually it becomes something that is exponentially very convergent at this side. And then it is very happy, heavily oscillating at this side. So this is the, the, the sine and the cosine of an exponential function. So the, oscillation goes very, very fast. This looks like a very non-local expression when you look at this here, but you can also say, wait a minute, after a very short amount of time, the oscillations become so rapidly that uh, in, in practice, you can just cut them off. That is the same statement as saying, if you make a Fourier transformation, you can go very far with your U and P, but you can make, put a boundary at the ends when you Fourier transform, nothing much will happen physically because my test functions will not oscillate so fast. So when you multiply this with a test function uh, or a density function, then you'll see that the, those oscillations are not very severe. And it, this thing behaves very much like a kernel with a finite support. So strictly speaking, the support of course not finite, but in all practical purposes, it's, it's a thing with a finite support. And it's very nice to do this because now I can take an ingoing plane wave, take a plane wave for the outside observer. That means the, the, the wave goes like e to the i kappa times tau, where kappa is the energy. And tau plus or minus rho means you describe a stationary wave of ingoing particles and a stationary wave of outgoing particles. And now you want to apply this mathematics that I've just briefly described to this situation. And what you get out is a beautiful equation that if you have an ingoing wave, but now the ingoing wave is a function, an amplitude times an oscillating time independent steady stream of ingoing particles, then this psi in is related to psi out. What you have to do is take this rapidly oscillating kernel and integrate that over the smoothly oscillating energy eigenstate. And you find that these integrals converge. And the integrals you have to calculate are just mathematical exercises of this kind. This is even simpler than the hydrogen atom. These are the Euler gamma functions you get out. Since you have i's all over the place, you get the gamma function of one half plus or minus i times kappa, where kappa is the energy of this wave. And so what you get is 
that the outgoing wave functions are two by two matrices on the ingoing wave functions. Why two by two matrices? Well, region one and region two have to be taken separately. The sine sigma switch sign when you go from region one to region two. So you have particles in region one, particles in region two, and they form a two-dimensional vector. And the relation that you get here now becomes a two by two matrix acting on this. This is the effect of this Green's function. It's in the exponential because of the ways this wave function acts and you get a logarithm of Newton's constant in here. So this is somewhat nonlinear in gravity, but actually it's a very simple calculation. The calculation works because this, this Shapiro shift was a linear function of the, of the source and that makes life very easy. Uh, you can actually check this is a unitary matrix which are these two conditions, and they follow from well-known well properties of the Euler gamma function. For the complex gamma function, it is this, and this guarantees that, it, that this equation is now unitary. And- um, and the find is, Five minutes. Very good. Uh, what you find is that the um, outgoing particles, uh, outgoing wave function are now transformations of the ingoing wave function, and this transformation is a unitary transformation. The norm of the wave functions remain the same. So I can consider one ingoing particle and I say I transform it into an outgoing particle, the norm will be the same. And um, um, now I'm going to add a new, a new twist. I have to interpret what this other region of, of the Penrose diagram is. And I have only one solution. It is the other side of the same black hole. Few people are following me here. Most people think that the black hole is a wormhole from one universe to another universe. Well, I leave them into believing this, but uh, I don't, I'm not such a science fiction fanatic to think that you can use wormholes to travel from one universe to another universe. No, you can use a wormhole to see that there's a new connection between one spot on the, on the, on the horizon and its antipodal spot. And that's all that region two is. Then the whole picture works. Now the thing is, is unitary. If I would not say that, then I would have a problem with this, um, uh, with these off the diagonal components. If I leave them out, then unitarity will be spoiled. And so I can't tear these, these two regions apart. I have to put them together. So now there's only one asymptotic region for the in and the out particles. The inside of the black hole, and I think one of the few next speakers will, will add that a lot of properties to the inside of the black hole. There is no inside in my picture because when you, when you get to the other region, you just have the other side of the black hole again. Um, the, uh, you can calculate what happens with the mass of the black hole. You have particles outside, they go inside, but um, what I should add is that the, um, that the outgoing particle goes out roughly at the same time as ingoing particles going in. The time lapse shouldn't be allowed to become too great. If the time lapse is too great, then you have, are dealing with a very rapidly oscillating function, which gives zero. So, the ingoing wave function and the outgoing wave function happen at roughly the same amount of time. If you look at different times, uh, you find that the position of the outgoing particle is proportional to the momentum of the ingoing particle. The momentum was increasing exponentially. This position is increasing exponentially. So as soon as I talk about particles which went in long ago, they have been transmuted by this mechanism into particles going out long ago, the particles which went out long ago are no longer of interest. They disappear to the distant universe and that's it. So I only need to be concerned about particles which went in just a, a second ago and particles that go out a second from now and they are related, whereas the particles which went in longer ago, they are related to particles which went out long ago. And that makes the whole picture extremely self-consistent and interesting. And now I want to spend the last few minutes of my talk to this region one and region two, because there's a problem. In region two, time runs backwards. So I'm doing physics here with particles, but here the particles run backwards in time. That means that the energy also switches sign. Now there's a problem because energy for all particles is positive. So how can you make energy switch sign if the energies are positive? And this is a, this is a very serious problem in this picture. The only solution is that what I have to do here is I shouldn't switch the sign of the energy, but I add a maximum amount of energy. So E2 is E max minus E1. So the energy in region two has to be calculated by subtracting 
E1 from a maximum value. That maximum value I call the anti-vacuum state. So the, so the state I'm looking at in region one sits here. This is the ordinary quadrant of the black hole. But this quadrant has, um, is very close to its anti-vacuum state. The anti-vacuum state is the completely filled universe. So region two is completely filled, but only it's completely filled if you enter it to it through this horizon like this. If you go around the black hole, you'll find it to be again totally empty, uh, except for a few particles which end up in the black hole. So, um, so, so to relate this to the outside world, you have to rotate time around and that uh, procedure replaces vacuum by anti-vacuum. That saves the theory, but it sounds very crazy in the conventional picture we have of, of, of quantum mechanics, because in, according to quantum mechanics, there is no maximum amount of energy that you can use. Well, that's because we are so far from the Planck scale. We haven't yet perce uh, ever uh, perceived that, that there is a maximum to the energy, but yes, there is a maximum to the total energy in any given volume. That's probably Planckian physics that's going to to um, tell me that. Uh, it is allowed just because the only way in which I include the gravitational effect of in and particles is by, by counting this shift. And this shift now looks so different from the other shifts just because, um, well, because of this different way of, 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 of referring to the energies here as, as to here. But, um, but so this is in a very elementary ingredient in this argument. So what I had to explain to you in just half an hour is a philosophy that requires a lot of thinking and a lot of careful analysis. So to see that all these rather heretic views fit together in a beautiful uh, scheme for black holes, that requires more time than half an hour to explain. So um, I'm going to end here now. I hope there's some time for discussions, but this is basically the main message that you wanted to get around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gerard, for this very inspiring talk. And uh, we have uh, uh, we have time for uh, for uh, some questions. The first uh, in line is uh, uh, Nikos Mavromatos. Uh, so please, uh, 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 sorry, I have to unmute you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hoof, for these very inspiring, as always, uh, ideas and talk. I would like to ask you about your um, uh, darkened region in your last transparency. It seems to me is a CPT uh, version. So in other words, your construction is probably a CPT invariant version of the, of the black hole. Yes. Am I right in the sense that the filled up stage could be viewed as an antiparticle if, if you, wouldn't add the, you wouldn't have added the maximum energy? Is, is that a valid? Uh... Correct. Uh, CPT is a very important uh, symmetry in this picture, but I, I should not only rely on CPT, I should also um, replace the vacuum state by the anti-vacuum state. But uh, CPT obviously is a very important symmetry uh, in, in this whole picture. If, if there were no, no such thing as CPT, I would have a difficulty because I'm actually... You can't see that directly here, but this is actually also a PT transformation right, right. Of, of this world. So uh, P and T are both inverted. That's because X, uh, the X coordinates is, is inverted by going to the antipodes, and the time coordinates, well, you run backwards in time, is also inverted. So it's P and T. And in physics, you know, it's you have to also replace the particles with antiparticles. Okay. Well, uh, I, I think that this becomes fairly obvious when you look at here that. that uh -huh. You're looking at the antiparticles going in the other direction. That's right. And one very quick second question. In that case, the white hole it does exist. Does a white hole exist in your theory, uh, or there is some time reversal, some CP asymmetry which prevent them from uh, from existing? Well, I regard the black the stationary black hole as its own white hole. Right. Because a stationary black hole both absorbs particles and emits Hawking particles. So it right. is metric on a time reversal already. Right. I don't need anything else that behaves like Perfect. white holes. I just need that. So yeah. white and holes, probably black holes, they are the same thing. Black holes could be the same as well, in a sense. I mean, uh, you could also apply these ideas in principle to rotating black holes. I don't right. Know. I don't 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, there is a, another question from uh, Sumit. So I, uh, I uh, please ask. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for an interesting talk, Professor. So my question is regarding the singularity. So, okay, so you have a relation between ingoing and outgoing particles, but uh, those particles can hit the singularity. Uh, how do we expect well, them to? If you remember what I said before, uh, when I said the, oh, this, yes. Here you see the, the Cauchy surface. The Cauchy surface moves from here to here to here. So you see the Cauchy surface pivots around the origin here. The Cauchy surface never really comes close to the singularity because this is the distant future. It is still at the horizon. Uh, and here you are, you know, your observer is very far in the future, but the, the Cauchy surface never comes close to region three. So not only the singularity, most of region three is never touched in this theory. And I believe that's a good thing because you know very well when you have rotating black holes or charged black holes, the situation is even more complicated in this region. You can get around the singularity and there are more horizons. Uh, I don't need that. I only need region one and region two, plus an infinitesimal domain that goes beyond one to a, lit a little bit in region th three, but only infinitesimal amounts, just to be able to, to link this to the um, eternal black hole and to allow these exponential, these, these time shift, these, these Shapiro shifts at the origin. But for ordinary particles, the Shapiro shifts are only very small. So I never need to go very far away in the complex plane, in, in the Penrose plane. Uh, and I never come close to the singularity. So, so for this theory, whatever happens at the singularity is immaterial for the calculations. Okay, okay. So, so there won't be black hole evaporation also? The there will be, oh yes. Because black hole evaporation is the, is, is the heart of Hawking state. So an ordinary, uh, if you could take a complete vacuum here, that would not, that would not be easy to translate because then you find that that vacuum, according to new observers in this region, contains particles. And those particles are divergent because this whole thing is invariant on a time translation. If you don't, if you have particles around in here, then the new observer will see infinity of particles at the horizons. Um, so uh, the Hartle Hawking state is actually a state that, that is described in this gray, in this diagram. Uh, the Hartle Hawking state says that you have an, a state which is invariant on the time translations. So it looks empty from the observer who sits here, but that empty state actually, if you look at the fields, the fields are not behaving like the vacuum fields for the outside observer but um, the fields are behave, uh, behaving like what a field for the outside observer would do if there would be particles around. Those particles are the heart of the Hawking particles. So okay. yes, you will see, if, if you see no particles here, the outside observer will see Hawking particles come out very slowly and very gently, and they'll take lots of time to make the black hole evaporate. Okay, okay. So, uh, so your model should be able to interrupt, but uh, I think uh, we we maybe you you can you can make your further question in the discussion session as well as uh, uh, Francesco Di Filippo. Uh, I I think uh, it's time now to to thank the speaker again for his beautiful talk, and uh, move on uh, to the next uh, to the next uh, uh, speaker, uh, Samir Matur. Um, okay. Should I try to share screen? Uh, I think the and other I'll three needs to be unshared. Okay, I think I already moved my. Ah, yes, good. Okay, let me see if I can share screen. And I moved myself. Okay, so can people see the full screen properly now? Yes, 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 it's clear. Okay. Okay, so you have uh, 30 minutes as usual. So please uh, start your talk, thanks. So thank you very much for invitation to this wonderful conference. I would like to share with you some thoughts about how the black hole information paradox might be relevant to understanding cosmology. 
So I have been uh, thinking about these issues over the past several years, and some of those thoughts are listed in the papers below. So the essential idea is the following. As you know, a black hole has a closed trapped surface. The light cones point inwards inside that surface. So if anything comes in here, it is forced to go only towards r equal to zero. It cannot go out. But then this picture of the black hole uh, leads to the black hole information paradox. Well, in a cosmology, the situation is just the time reverse of this. If you go outside some radius, then the light cones point purely outwards. And so if you're out here, let's say, you can't actually stop going further outwards. In fact, you can make a version of the information paradox for cosmology, which you can see in this paper here. And so given this close relation, just looks like a time reversal between the black hole situation and the, equation, uh, the situation for an expanding cosmology, then you can ask, uh, can resolving the black hole information paradox tell us something useful about cosmology? Okay, so here's an outline of the main idea. The information paradox arises if we have a smooth horizon because you get these entangled pairs created at the horizon that Hawking found. And then the small corrections theorem tells us that if you make any small changes to these uh, created pairs, it's actually not going to get you out of the problem. You need an order one correction. Now, fortunately in string theory, it appears that the horizon is actually completely altered. In fact, the entire microstate of the black hole becomes something more like a planet, a big quantum ball of the size of the horizon radius. And that's what we call the fuzz ball. And the, that radiates from its surface like any other normal body, uh, not by pair creation from the vacuum. And so there is no information paradox. Okay, so if we find such a big change to the vacuum for the uh, black hole, then you could ask, will there be interesting effects at the scale of the cosmological horizon. And in fact, by looking at observations and the theory of cosmology of the early universe, we find indeed there are many unexplained puzzles exactly at the scale of the cosmological horizon. So let's see if we can make a connection between what we learned from black holes in the fuzzball paradigm and what we might want to see in cosmology. So the overall picture, which I would like to present for what might be happening in cosmology is the following. First, we start with black holes. And as we said, the microstates of black holes look like these fuzzballs, which are like horizon-sized quantum objects. You don't actually have a vacuum there. But if you have such configurations uh, in the theory, in string theory, then in fact, they must also exist as virtual fluctuations. For example, if you have an actual electrons and positrons in a theory, uh, then you also have in the vacuum virtual fluctuations, which correspond to electron-positron pairs. So you should have virtual fluctuations corresponding to these fuzzball type configurations. Well, you might say they, that might be fine if you look at configurations with radius of order the Planck length, but very big ones, millions of Planck lengths, well, they will exist as virtual fluctuations, but they'll be highly suppressed. So why think about them? Well, the point is indeed, the fluctuation, any one fluctuation of this kind with a large radius will be highly suppressed, but the number of such fluctuations is governed by the Bekestan entropy, and that's a very large number. And we will note that this largeness of the number of possible fluctuations of large radius offsets the a large action you require to create those fluctuations. So in fact, you can have fluctuations of all sizes and they are all going to be relevant. So we get a picture of the gravitational vacuum of the following kind around every space in this uh, at and every time you have virtual fluctuations of arbitrarily large fuzzball type configurations and these fluctuations we'll call them VECROs, which stands for uh, Virtual Extended Compression Resistant Objects. We'll explain that as we go along, but the virtual part is clear. They are virtual fluctuations. The extended is very important. They are large structures. They are compression resistant. They don't want to squeeze or stretch. That's the property we learned from string theory when we actually make these configurations. And the O just stands for objects. So these are the virtual fluctuations. We call them VECROs, and that's going to be crucial for understanding how the information paradox is resolved. So the picture we get for resolving the information paradox is that in the normal classical description, a dust ball just collapses once it's inside the horizon, the light cones point inwards, so it can't stop collapsing further, it all ends up at the singularity. Well, if you have this theory, uh, which you get from string theory with all these uh, virtual fuzzballs around, indeed, a star may start collapsing, but when it goes inside the horizon, these virtual fluctuations around this uh, center, which are uh, depicted in this gray, well, now they also squeeze because you have made a closed trap surface. 
But these kinds of configurations did not want to be squeezed. If you squeeze them, the energy goes up, their wave functional distorts by order unity, and these virtual fluctuations turn to on-shell actual configurations. And that's how you actually end up getting these fuzzballs. And you, it's important that because these fluctuations were extended in size, when you actually try to make a closed trapped surface, then the, it can actually feel that a closed trapped surface is forming. It squeezes this extended object, then its wave functional changes by order unity, and that's when you actually get on-shell fuzzballs. So the equivalence principle is, was always one of the stumbling blocks in the information paradox. How does the actual space-time know that uh, something is actually a closed trapped surface forming all along? But if the vacuum actually has these extended fluctuations, then they can feel uh, and know when a closed trapped surface is forming. And then this object just radiate from its surface like a normal body, and that resolves the information paradox. But if that picture is right for the solving the information paradox, and we have a lot of evidence from string theory that that is correct, then what happens when we come to cosmology? Well, in cosmology, now the uh, reverse will happen. You have, again, these virtual fluctuations are about every point. But if you go at, look at virtual fluctuations whose radius is larger than the horizon size, well, then these guys cannot stop themselves from stretching. In the black hole case, when something went inside the horizon, it could not stop itself from compressing. Now, these virtual fluctuations cannot stop themselves from stretching. And when you stretch this particular configurations, it's symmetrical to compression. It again costs you energy. And we will see that this extra energy might, require, might yield the energy which you require at the gut scale for inflation. It may yield the dark energy that we see today. It may actually yield the extra energy that you get at the radiation dust transition, which might explain the tension that people are observing in the values of Hubble constant between low and high redshift surveys. So we don't actually know enough about the dynamics of these virtual fuzzball configurations to know for certain that any of these things which I'm going to say actually happen in cosmology. Okay? But what I'm going to tell you is that all these things are happening at the right scale. And whatever we have learned from black holes, certainly that looks very concrete. And it looks plausible that these might be relevant for all the interesting effects that we see in cosmology. OK, so let me begin by giving a rough presentation of the information paradox and its resolution in the fuzzball paradigm. So we all know the information paradox. A star just collapses, makes a classical black hole with all the matter going to the singularity. But then entangled pairs are created near the horizon. You can depict the entanglement, entangled pair in the schematic way as 0 plus, zero plus 1, 1, or you know, spin up, spin down, plus spin down, spin up, any way you want to say that they are entangled. But because this is the vacuum and you keep creating entangled pairs, the entanglement of the radiation with the remaining hole just keeps going up. And it doesn't come down later on like it would for a normal body. And then you have a sharp puzzle near the end point of evaporation. Now, this Hawking argument from 1975 is very robust because no small corrections to these emitted pairs can actually solve the problem. So if you want to quantify that, you can see that if you start with this entangled state model like this and you add a small correction, all you want to know is that epsilon k is small. I've added the orthogonal state as a small correction. It doesn't matter where the, what the epsilons depend on. They could depend on the matter which fell in, on the earlier pairs which were emitted, or any quantum gravity effect from anywhere. It turns out that it doesn't matter. You can add any small correction. The entanglement will actually keep growing. So the entanglement at the n plus 1 step of emission will exceed the entanglement at the n step plus log 2 minus at most 2 epsilon. So in fact, the, if this was the graph of entanglement before you looked at the small corrections, it's basically the same after the small corrections. So in fact, if no small corrections can resolve the problem near the horizon, then in fact, you need a, a big correction. And uh, that's what the fuzzballs end up doing. The only assumption in the small correction theorem was that there should be no non-local effects over distances much larger than the horizon radius. So whatever happens finishes sort of around you know, r equals 10m or 100m or some radius you fix once for all. And then you need an order one correction. And the fuzzballs actually give you that. And I will uh, assume that that's the correct way of resolving the information paradox. But I just want to note here parenthetically that recently there have been attempts at resolving it the other way. If you actually have non-local effects, which are like these wormhole paradigms, where the black hole can connect to very far away Hawking radiation, then you can actually keep the horizon smooth and still get entangled pairs. Uh, I don't actually believe that solution is correct. So I will assume the fuzzball paradigm in what follows. OK, so let's talk a little bit about how we get the fuzzballs in string theory. A very brief review here. So in string theory, you have to make black holes by taking bound states of the objects in the theory, which are strings and brains. At weak coupling, you might think that just has a size of order the Planck length or string length. But then at strong coupling, you might have thought a big horizon would develop around it. But in fact, that doesn't happen. 
when you actually make these bound states and look at their size, their diameter d, uh, here is a black hole made out of the same charge the Stromage and Waffa used to make the black hole and then non-extremal versions that were made later on. The diameter of the bound state is, is a complicated combination of the number of brains in the theory, but also the coupling constant and so on. And once you, once you, whatever the number of brains you take and whatever coupling you take, you find the size of the bound state is always of the order of the radius of the horizon. So in fact, it, this gave a, this was an estimate of the size of the bound state, but suggested that you actually never get black holes in string theory. You always get something more like a planet. But then you could ask, why did the structure not actually collapse to the horizon like all the low hair arguments suggested in all the earlier work which was done in trying to make black hole hair in the past? And the, what the structure here is actually very much dependent on all that you see in string theory. Uh, when you go, suppose you're in three plus one dimensions, you also have six compact dimensions. And normally we think that because the dimensions are small, they are trivially tensored with the non-compact dimensions. But here, in fact, that's not so. Once you come inside this particular radius of the fuzz ball, the compact dimensions are very non-trivially fibered over the non-compact dimensions. If you just want to keep a toy example in your mind, just think of a bubble of nothing, where you have three plus one space, but one extra compact dimension. And the compact circle can then shrink to zero at some point, cutting out a hole from this space. If we dimensionally reduce this down to three plus one dimensions, the size of the circle acts like a scalar in three plus one dimensions. And the changing size of the scalar actually gives you a gradient energy for the scalar. All the stress tensor everywhere in the three plus one dimensional language coming from the scalar is all positive. And you might then think that if the energies are positive, this object should try to shrink. But in fact, instead of shrinking, as you know very well, the bubble of nothing actually expands. Okay, so why did our intuition about gravity not work here? And that's because when the extra dimensions are not trivially fibered, like here they shrink to zero and they make a cigar kind of geometry, when the extra dimensions are not trivially fibered with the non-compact ones, our intuition for how the structure should behave doesn't work. And you can get similar examples from Euclid short across time and so on. And when you actually go and look at the structure of fuzzballs because of these curious properties about how the extra dimensions behave, you find that all the assumptions of the low hair theorems are violated in the structure of fuzzballs, and actually you end up getting all these structures which just stay where they are, the horizon-sized quantum objects, which we are going to call fuzzballs, and they are all the microstates of the black hole. So if you want to keep a toy model for this in mind for what we are going to do, just imagine you have little Euclidean Schwarzschild or bubble of nothing kind of uh, things here, Euclidean Schwarzschild cross time. This is all, all, all this Lorentzian here. So you can imagine little bubbles of nothing uh, over here, and then uh, you can just link them up in some way so that they hold them close together. Structure doesn't want to either compress or expand. These are the compression resistant objects that I was talking about. So just to summarize what we have said so far, in string theory, when you try to make a black hole by joining together lots of springs and brains, you actually end up getting these extended structures whose gravitational description is really in the language of the extra dimensions being non-trivially fibered inside this radius of order to M. And these structures then just resist to both compression length and expansion, but they account for all the microstates of the black hole. So here now let's talk about their virtual fluctuations. So suppose you have a compact dimension like this. Uh, it just looks like a one compact circle and I've taken one non-compact direction. A small fluctuation of the metric will sort of squeeze it like this. And in a dimensional reduced language, you would say the size of the circle gives a scalar field. So now you're seeing a virtual fluctuation of a scalar field. Okay, so we know that these fluctuations are there and they are the ones that actually give you Hawking radiation. But you can also have large fluctuations where this pinches off like a cigar, like we saw in the bubble of nothing or in the Euclidean Schwarzschild, and then we get a new topology and these kinds of fluctuations, which actually give you the kind of structure that we are interested in. So the actual uh, manifold we have in string theory is virtual fluctuations also contain these kinds of topological structures. And as we said, the structures are resistant to compression or stretching, and what we have learned from black holes suggests that the uh, energy to uh, characterize how compression resistant they are, you can characterize them roughly in the following way. If you take one of these vectors, the vector was for these virtual fluctuations, the same is true for the on-shell ones, the rough scales. If the vector radius is Rv, if you squeeze it by a factor of order unity, the amount of energy you have to put into that is of the order of a, the mass of a black hole with radius Rv. That's the only intuition we are actually going to sort of put in as an assumption. It's something we can roughly see from what is happening with the fuzz balls that we can make. And we also expect that on general grounds, but this is all that we know. If we actually squeeze it or stretch it by a factor of order unity, the amount of energy we, we get in that squeezing or stretching is of the order of a mass of the black hole with that radius. So then this is our picture of quantum gravity. As we said at the start, you have all these virtual fluctuations of all sizes 
at different points at all times. So with this picture of the vacuum, it's quite different from the picture that you have in normal quantum gravity, where all fluctuations would just be at the Planck scale, little, little fluctuations. But now we have something more like what you see in a phase transition. For example, in steam, you have little bubbles of all sizes forming in the bath of water. Or if you take the Ising model near criticality, in a bath of all negative spins, uh, you can have little bubbles of positive spins of arbitrary size around arbitrary points. And then you can now let's ask, why are these bubbles so important? We had said that in the beginning, but now let's go and look at it mathematically. Why are the large vector of fluctuations, that is those which a radius much bigger than the Planck length, not suppressed? Well, the fluctuation to any large fuzzball type configuration is indeed highly suppressed. In fact, you can compute the probability of such a fluctuation by e to the minus an action, and let's approximate the action by some energy of the fluctuation times time. For the energy, I'll put the mass of the black hole with some radius r. I'm looking for vectors of radius r. So then the, that mass is given like this in d space dimension, so d plus one space time dimension. For the time, I'll also put the scale r. And then you find the action actually goes like this. So if r is much bigger than lp, the probability of the fluctuation, you can see, is indeed very small. But now let's go back to looking at the Bekenstein entropy, the number of such configurations you can make. That's very large. That's e to the s Bekenstein. And if you compute that in d plus 1 space time dimensions, you find it goes like this. And then you find that these two uh, exponentials, the e to the minus something and the e to the plus something, they can trade off against each other. So finally, we end up making some use of the fact that the Bekenstein entropy is large. And then you find that since p times n can be 1, the suppression is offset by the large degeneracy. And then you can have these fluctuations of all sizes in all places. Okay, so given that the vacuum has their structure, what effect do these vectors, these virtual fluctuations actually have? Now, in a situation where you just have a star and all gravity is very weak, uh, nothing much, nothing much happens. The, if you put a star here, the, the, it has a small pull on it, uh, it pulls on the vector, the vector compresses a bit, but it is compression resistant, so it squeezes a bit and then stabilizes. So this is just uh, the kind of dynamics which is already included in the Einstein action, R root minus G, uh, because, uh, you know, you always have vacuum fluctuations that just give you some kind of effective dynamics at low energies. And so this is all in the Einstein action. But the interesting thing happens if you actually make a closed trap surface, because now the vector which is inside the closed trap surface, because of the light cone structure, it cannot actually stop compressing. It cannot compress a little bit and stabilize. So its wave function keeps distorting and distorting. And then the energy of the star then gets transitioned onto an on-shell fuzzball configuration. So this is where the new physics happens. And this is what tells us that the extended scale of the vector, when you actually end up making a horizon, something non-trivial is going to happen. So can we be more precise on when these non-trivial vector effects happen? So you can have a, some space time here with some curvature radius, which I have called RC. And let's say that the curvature radius persists over a distance L. So like if you have a star, the curvature radius is very large because star has very low curvature. And the star is not very big. The L, for example, the distance over which the star has this curvature is much less than the radius of the curvature. In that case, there are no significant corrections from all these vectors to semi-classical gravity. But if you have this L being comparable to RC or larger, then the new physics of vectors actually start showing up. And the vectors then get squeezed by order unity. And then the extra energy we get is of this order, which is the order we said the mass of a black hole with that radius and so on. So this is the situation in which the vectors actually become important. Now, this kind of change, which is coming from the vectors, it cannot be included by uh, adding a correction to the local Lagrangian, because these effects do not have anything to do with the Planck length. This could be a radius of curvature of one mile. And all we are saying is, if RC is one mile, if the curvature persists, not for 10 meters, but over also one mile, then these effects will show up. So this is the new mode of breakdown of the semi-classical approximation, not the breakdown which happens when the curvature gets to the Planck length. OK, so then where does this situation happen that L is bigger than RC? Well, two situations, one in the black hole, and that's where it resolves the information paradox. But the other is at the scale of the cosmological horizon. So now let's finally get back to cosmology and see what might happen there. So in cosmology, as we had said, the virtual fluctuations, which are larger than the radius of the cosmological horizon, they are forced to stretch. And when they stretch, there will be some extra energy. We've already said what's the order of the energy. If we stretch a vector by frac a factor of order unity, it will actually have an energy of the order of a mass, the black hole of that size. And as we will uh, see very soon, uh, that particular, what that corresponds to is that if you stretch a vector of order the cosmological horizon radius by a factor of order unity, the energy density you get 
you take this energy and divide by the volume of the horizon, and the density will be of the order of the closure density. So you can see that this effect can be very relevant to a lot of things that are happening at the cosmological scale, in, at the horizon scale in cosmology. So what we'll do now is make four observations about how the stretching energy can actually be relevant in cosmology. So the first observation we make is that actually we cannot get this extra energy in the radiation dominated phase. Okay, so why is that? In Minkowski space, of course, we had these vectors of all radii. We said that, that was our picture of the vacuum. But in an expanding cosmology, extended structures cannot have a radius larger than the distance that light has been able to travel since the Big Bang, because you cannot establish a correlation across lengths which are larger than the particle horizon. So let's work with a flat cosmology with a metric like this. And my A of T is going to be a power law. I take the power to be between zero and one. The Hubble constant looks like this. And the cosmological horizon given by H inverse, that's T over alpha. Well, in this kind of a cosmology, you can compute the distance that light has traveled since the Big Bang. And it is given by this expression. So any vectors I make must have a radius less than this uh, amount R max. And so if I write it as a function of the cosmological horizon radius, the radius of the vector divided by the radius of the cosmological horizon is less than or equal to this now. Okay, so let's see what happens in different situations. In the radiation phase, alpha is half. We have t to the half expansion. So if you actually compute this, you find this radius of the vector must be less than or equal to the cosmological horizon. So the situation is more like this. The vectors are not actually getting to become larger than the cosmological horizon. So they're never getting into a situation where they are forced to stretch. So I don't have this stretching energy. That's actually very important because if I had some extra energy in the radiation phase, it would cause a more rapid expansion there, but there are very strong constraints from Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which doesn't permit you know, more than a few percent of energy extra that we haven't actually seen from the particles that we observe. So this is actually a good cross check that at least in the radiation phase, I am not getting this extra energy. Well, let's see then what happens when we start entering the dust phase. In fact, when the radiation turns to dust, at that point, we, can, we have an anomaly. The early universe physics, which uh, comes from the radiation physics and then measurements of the microwave background, they suggest the Hubble constant should have a value of 67, while measurements of the local things that we see around us suggest that the Hubble constant should be 73. And this is called the Hubble constant tension. Uh, we don't know if this is an observational artifact, but for the moment, people have been worrying about it. For a dust cosmology, alpha is two thirds, t to the two thirds expansion. And then if you compute the what is the maximum radius that you can get upon H inverse, then alpha one minus alpha this time is two. So any vectors in the range where Rv upon the horizon radius is between one and two. So bigger than the horizon radius, but less than twice the horizon radius. Well, those vectors can exist and any vector out there, you can see will be forced to stretch. And so again, they're forced to stretch because the light goes point outwards. So if you look at a structure, the outer, outer rim of this vector, it has to go out. Later it can come back in because the cosmological horizon is also increasing. So once the, the cosmological horizon becomes bigger than this object, then the light goes sort of don't point outwards anymore. And then the guy can come in. So you can compute how much it will actually have to stretch. The, what's the minimum stretching if you once have something which is outside the cosmological horizon. If at time t equals t naught, the radius of the horizon was h naught inverse. Then, and you start with a vector at t equals t naught with a radius r naught, which is bigger than the horizon. It has to stretch at least up to this size. Okay, this is just an elementary calculation following the light cone structure, just to see that you must stretch. So this is the picture that we get. I'm putting time on this axis. First, I'm in the radiation phase, then I'm in the dust phase, and T star is the epoch of matter radiation equality in terms of energy densities. So if you plot the scale of the cosmological horizon, it grows like 2T in the radiation phase and as 3 half T in the dust phase. So in the radiation phase, we have seen that the vectors actually cannot become larger than the cosmological horizon. But when we turn to the dust phase, in fact, they can. And so the natural progression of the increase in size just carries these vectors over to become larger than the horizon radius at the time that we transition from radiation to dust. Well, that's interesting because now if these are larger than the cosmological horizon, they will have a stretching energy. And this stretching energy comes therefore at a time which is of the order of the uh, radiation dust uh, equality. It's interesting that some of the uh, solutions to explain the Hubble constant tension are of the following kind. If you have an extra energy density of order 10% of the closure density at T star, then actually it can explain the tension in the Hubble constant. So this can be interesting. So let's go and look at what are the scale of the energies that we get from the stretching. So we had already noted that when you expand or contract, compress the vector by a factor of order unity, the energy you get from that is of the order of the mass of a black hole of that radius. And if we just 
put the radius of the vector of to be of the order of the cosmological horizon radius, then the energy extra would be just the mass of that black hole. And then if you just uh, go ahead and, and, and put that all in, you just, and you just uh, find the energy density corresponding to that, which means you divide by the volume of the cosmological horizon, you find that actually the extra energy density you get is of the order of the closure density. That's not surprising. We know that if you take uh, the energy density of order of the closure density, the total mass inside the cosmological horizon is of the order of a black hole with radius the cosmological horizon. Okay, so just to say the scales of the energy that we have are such that you get something of the order of the closure density, but what fraction of the closure density are you expecting? Well, if this changeover was adiabatic, then the vector distribution will adjust to a minimum of the energy, the vectors will not stretch, and there will actually be no extra energy. If the changeover from radiation to dust was completely sudden, then you will get a stretching by a factor of order unity. In actual fact, the changeover is neither adiabatic nor sudden. It takes place over a few expansion time scales. So you would expect an energy which is a small fraction of the closure density at T star, which is a direction to about 2,500. And in fact, if for some reason we got this number was about 10%, if you got 10% of the closure density, if we already say, so we should we expect a small fraction of the closure density. If you got 10% of the closure density at T star uh, as, the, as the energy coming from the stretching, to actually explain the tension in the Hubble constant values. So this could be interesting. We don't know if any of this happens, but it's interesting that the scales look about right. Well, what about dark energy? So again, we have seen that the scales of uh, uh, energy compression and extension are of the uh, give you energies of the order of rho closure. And then suppose the, uh, we actually have a situation where delta rho is not just order rho closure, but actually equal to rho closure, okay? In that case, you find that the energy of the stretching is exactly as much as you need to maintain the expansion. You don't need the matter anymore. You get a self-consistent situation where the energy coming from the stretching is such that it actually provides the expansion required to maintain the horizon at a scale where it actually gives you that stretching. Well, in that case, you just get an exponential expansion with a stretching of these vectors providing the uh, energy to maintain the uh, expansion. That looks like a phase where we are completely dominated by dark energy. And then you will just get, so if the expansion are settled down into this phase, where uh, you just have the right amount of uh, delta rho, it's actually equal to rho closure. It was an order rho closure, but if it is equal to rho closure, well then you can just maintain the exponential expansion and you will be in a dark energy dominated phase. But a similar thing can actually happen at the epoch of inflation, because we have seen that this stretching of vectors gets triggered whenever the pressure drops suddenly, like when we move from radiation down to dust. Now, in the beginning of the guts epoch, we have all these lots, lots of guts particles and they all contribute to pressure. But as we approach the gut scale, all the heavy guts particles become non-relativistic and they freeze out, leaving only the light standard model particles to provide pressure. So again, because as a pressure drop, you again get this overshooting of the vector size as compared to the horizon radius. And again, if the amount of energy is, uh, not, it was always of order the closure density, but once it, if it happened to settle down at equal to the closure density, you can maintain the exponential expansion just coming from this vector stretching uh, and you can get into a phase where you actually have something like inflation. Okay, so let me just summarize because I'm near the end of my time. So we have argued that the quantum gravity wave functional has this vector component, which represents these virtual black holes. Uh, black holes have these fuzzball kind of structures, and then they have virtual fluctuations. And uh, these fluctuations are not suppressed because they have such a large number of possible virtual fluctuations. So the vacuum doesn't just have little fluctuations at the Planck scale, it has these extended structures which can all be virtual fluctuations of all sizes. We saw something like a, a picture of the gravitational vacuum uh, is very much like the picture of a situation at phase transition where you have uh, uh, fluctuations of arbitrary sizes around arbitrary points. Now, if that's the picture of the gravitational vacuum, then you can solve the information paradox because then these extended fluctuations can see the formation of a closed type surface and react to that to actually make these fuzz balls, which, you have act which we have actually found as the actual eigenstates for black holes made out of strings and brains in string theory. Okay, but then the same thing which leads to that physics gives us this stretching in cosmology. We don't know much about the dynamics of these vectors. As you have seen, I just sort of assumed the scales and talked about the scales. And so we cannot actually prove that anything which I said right now about cosmology is actually going to happen. But I think, so it may seem that if you just make models like you know, scalar field describing quintessence or so, something like that, it's more concrete. At least you can do concrete calculations, but there is an important difference. Uh, in the case of like when people assume scalar fields for inflation or for other things, for dark energy, we're just assuming that we take something which fits what's up there in the sky. 
The important difference here is that we are arguing for the existence of these vectors from first principles. It's a top-down approach because you have started really from the black from black hole physics. So this is my last slide here. I start with the with the with black holes, but I know I have this information paradox, and then I have the small correction theorem, which tells me that I cannot get out of the puzzle unless I have an order one correction at the horizon. And the only assumption that went in was that there should be no non-local effect and distances are much bigger than the horizon scale. I'm going to assume that is true. And if that is true, I really have only one path, a rigorous path I can follow to solve the information paradox. And that leads me down to vectors. All the things that I need to solve the information paradox have come to me automatically from string theory. Firstly, we find the extended structures existing in string theory. We found they are not suppressed because the Bekerstrom entropy comes at just the right scale to uh, outweigh their action for creation. So these fluctuations can be there of arbitrary sizes. Their resistance to compression stretching was something we saw from their structure and general arguments about black hole entropy and energy. So once we know that these are what we actually have in string theory, and then they lead to a consistent solution of the information paradox, we can then turn around and ask, what are they going to do in cosmology? And because the situation looks just like the time reverse, the light curve just point outwards, it looks very natural to expect that these kinds of vectors, by virtue of their stretching, are providing energy sources at different points in our history. It's important that you actually don't provide any extra source in the radiation phase because of causality. We saw that because that's where we have very tight constraints. But in all other phases, we keep seeming to need energy. Like in the inflation phase, we need energy to drive inflation. Today, we seem to need dark energy. We also have tension with the Hubble constant. These are all effects at the cosmological scale. And that's the scale of energy which is being provided by these vectors. So I don't know if these are effects are actually going to come out of vectors in the end, but Given that they are all happening at the right scale and the right epochs, I certainly encourage everybody to explore them and all this might be interesting. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, this very nice talk. And uh, we, we have time for some questions. Uh, please, uh, if you have a... Uh, uh, Gerard, maybe? Gerard? Yes. Can, okay. can you hear me? Yes. Um, I wonder these, these vectors you talk about, do they obey local equations or are they fundamentally non-local? Which of the two? No, they, they are local. All my physics is actually local. So these are just extended structures which have formed, if you want to think of them in uh, normal physics, you could just think of them like benzene rings. So for example, we know have, we have fluctuations of electrons and positrons. So we also have virtual fluctuations of positroniums, which is a bound state. And by extension, atoms and let's say a benzene ring. Now, so if you some ask me about the vacuum of normal quantum field theory, if anybody would, uh, would agree that there should be virtual benzene rings, except they're highly suppressed because they have such a large, you know, they are heavy. So the probability of a benzene ring fluctuation is low. On the other hand, here the Bekerstrom entropy outweighs the fact that the action is low. So that's why they are actually there. So the, a benzene ring is an extended structure, but the physics leading to the fact that a benzene ring is around uh, in this room as a virtual fluctuation, that physics is completely local. So if I like make some local fluctuation somewhere a perturbation, it will not actually travel around the benzene ring faster than the speed of light. Is this what you were asking? Well, uh, I'm, I'm puzzled because it, it seems like you want to have your cake and eat it. Uh, if there are local equations, then again, you have the problem of the horizon opening up. There will be a horizon. It's not so easy to get rid of it. Local equations would be local fields that would have to obey laws of physics and uh, causality and everything, then I don't see how they can remove or soften your, your horizons in any way. Okay, very good. Yeah, let me answer that. I discussed that a little bit in the papers I've written on the vectors, but let me try to give a rough picture now and then we can maybe continue in the discussion. So what happens is that suppose you have a situation like this where there is a star in this region. Then all the vectors around that star as we said, they get compressed because of the attraction of this object sitting in here. So the benzene ring gets compressed because of the heavy mass sitting in the center. So now you have benzene rings which are under tension. Okay. So if you have something which is, let's say, the star is just slightly bigger than the horizon, then the, all the vectors of this size, all the benzene rings of this size, they are in a highly stressed situation rather than the relaxed size of you know six angstroms which they normally have. They've been compressed and they are under strain at five angstroms. And if you actually send a little bit of extra shell in, once that shell goes in, not immediately, but once the shell goes in, then the actual tension of the benzene ring increases. And now it was already under tension at five angstroms. It can't support anymore. It breaks into the several different atoms and the structure of the thing changes by order one. So for everything I'm saying, just keep in mind a virtual fluctuation, which is actually a benzene ring. 
of course, the Bell's ring has a fixed side, but here the vectors come with all, all radii. But just imagine that the, the Bell's ring fluctuation, and then if a shell goes inside the Bell's ring, what will happen to the Bell's ring? How it will respond? So we normally get Hawking uh, radiation because local particles, uh, their vacuum structure changes. When the vacuum wave function changes for these external objects, they can actually destroy themselves. And that's what is actually leading to these effects. So everything is completely causal here. Yeah, I've been searching, searching for sets of laws of physics, even if they are crude, so that you can get a scattering matrix or an evolution operator for a black hole. Do you have anything like that? So yes, in the end, once these fuzz balls form like up here, they are just like a piece of coal. So after that, the picture will look exactly like what you had on your first slide where things come in and they go out because it's just like a surface of a piece of coal. They come in, they sort of get churned around and they go out. That's what we've been finding with the actual fuzz balls. What those fuzz balls we made were the time independent configurations. Now we're trying to understand how do they form? What does causality do and so on? That's why all these vector pictures are here right now. But indeed, in the, in the end, the whole thing will become at this point, like the surface of a piece of coal. It, it will look like that. things come in, things go out. There is no horizon. The whole thing is just like a planet. And so the kind of mathematics you were using about the fact that there are very high blue shifts and red shifts near the surface out here. I think that's very important understanding how this object reacts when something falls in. And we can talk about that as well. But if, at a fundamental level, there is no horizon and it is like a piece of coal. The fact you get all those big blue shifts that you have used so well uh, for many years, they just give, give you some kind of a universality in how this piece of coal behaves. But otherwise, uh, for the information paradox is concerned, it's a piece of coal and so there is no buzz. Okay, perhaps uh, it's time to, to I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, okay, we have, we have a schedule. So um, maybe uh, the there is time in, in any case to, in the discussion for, for further questions and, and discussion. Uh, so the next speaker will be Nava Gaddem, um, uh, who is, uh, uh, I guess, is ready. OK. Uh, fine. Do you, hi. Do you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. F fine. Maybe you should put, uh, OK, full screen. Perfect. OK. So, well, the stage is yours. You can start, yes. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak here. It's also a very convenient and honored audience, um, set of speakers and audience. Thank you very much. Um, I have a sort of an old fashioned title, slightly different to what I've uh, advertised earlier. Um, I want to treat the information paradox as somewhat of a scattering problem. It's something that uh, Gerard Hoft alluded to earlier in his talk. Um, I want to revisit uh, this approach and perhaps a slightly complementary uh, language uh, to what Gerard presented. This is based on a couple of papers that I wrote last year. One of them was with Nico Grunenbaum, who was a master's student with us and has just begun a PhD. And the other is with Nico and Gerard Atok. And I will also mention some new results, some work in progress towards the end of it. So I want to treat the information paradox as a scattering problem and scattering theory is all about interactions. But if you ignore the interactions, Hawking showed us famously that there's, a, there's, an, there's an information loss where matter that is sent in from scry minus, so past infinity, seems to fall into a black hole. And if you look at what comes out, there's a thermal spectrum and that there's information loss. I want to understand, or the, the, the ethos of what I'm going to do today or to speak about today is about what happens when you introduce interaction, interactions in this picture. So if you move away from free field theory, so here's a naive picture that I have in mind. I have the same Minkowski diamond. So I have particles that are going in to scatter and it's expected and to some extent somewhat uh, known that if you have small enough impact parameters that there's a large black hole that forms if you have a collapse of this kind. And when there is such an interaction, when there's nonlinearity in the theory that takes over, you cannot ignore gravitational interactions. You might ask, what are the set of all out states seen as a scattering problem at future infinity? And I want to ask, is there a regime of phase space where amplitudes in this sense can be calculable? Why would you expect that such a regime exists? There's many indications that the information problem can be resolved in effective field theory. Conveniently enough, I hope Ahmed, Ahmed will review some of these in the next talk. But there's also something that's very special about gravity, which is that quantum effects arise from large momentum transfer like you have in quantum field theory. 
but also from emergent scales in the theory, like a short shell radius, for example. And that's the information paradox, if you will. So what I want to do in this talk is to define a certain this regime in effective field theory. I hope to be precise. And I will, I will sketch the calculation of some amplitudes and that these amplitudes are two, two, two scattering amplitudes, for example. So it's the elastic part of this process, if you will. But there's also more that you can do, which is scatter these two particles going in and many other possible out states, two to n amplitudes, for example. And I want to ask or say, make some comments about what it says about the information paradox and possibly about several other questions that are relevant to black holes. So here's a plan for my talk. So I'll first start with what happens when you have large impact parameters. It's very important to keep track of all the scales. So I will be very specific about what I mean by large, small, uh, with scales. When you have large impact parameters, there's a notion of a flat space iconal where you can calculate scattering amplitudes. And that's very well understood and it's known. I will review that. I will address what happens when you less in the impact parameter, if you have smaller impact parameters, I will define what I will call the black hole iconal phase. I want to distinguish it from the flat space iconal phase. It's sort of a straightforward difference, but it's important. And then I will review and I will go over what happens when you, what are the amplitudes that you can compute, what it says about the information paradox, some words about the chaos bound and so on. So for those of you that are impatient, here's some spoilers. So the first two parts of the talk, are essentially dominated by virtual soft gravitons. So these are soft gravitons that are low momentum that are exchanged in the two to two amplitudes. And they're, as I said, they're low, they, they're dominated by low momentum transfer. But the moment you go to two to N scattering amplitudes, momentum transfer effects become important. And as I said, there are many possible out states and we will see, or we, we have evidence that each outcome is heavily suppressed, but you have a large number of such outcomes. And perhaps this has something uh, to say about the information paradox. So let's begin. I'm first going to review interactions that are in the large impact parameter regime. What do I mean by that? Here's a Minkowski di diagram again. Consider two particles that are almost massless, so light-like particles, traveling along the light cone directions. The red one, and they interact somewhere far outside the R equals zero regime. So here at every point, I have a large sphere or half sphere because I've opened up the Minkowski diagram. And if they are far away from the R equals zero regime, the transverse distance between these two particles can be very large. And the energy of this collision can also be very high. In fact, transplankian. And in this case, you cannot ignore back, back, gravitational back reaction if the collision energies are large. And the impact parameter being large means that first it's larger than the Planck length, but there's also a new length scale that comes because of the collision, which is G Newton times the energy of the collision, or the center of mass energy of the collision. So I also want to take the impact parameter to be much larger than any other scale that may emerge from this sort of no, this collision. Classically, what happens is actually very well understood since 50, 60 years already. It's the Eiffelberg axial shock wave. So there's a the the green particle gets kicked, and it's what Hirad called the Shapiro delay. This is now in flat space, it gets kicked and starts moving a little further down. And you can ask how much this kick is. And that kick can be calculated. It actually produces an on-shell solution to Einstein's nonlinear equations of motion. And it's very well studied for a long time. But now you can ask, these are interactions that are gravitational. How do I understand them in field theory? Here's how, and this is the flat space icon of the regime. You look at the background field method. So you have a minimally coupled scalar field to the, the Einstein-Hilbert action. You put up around flat space. And these interactions happen to be generated by the three-point vertex that you get from the graviton coupled to the stress tensor. Now you look at, again, the large S uh, limit compared to the momentum transfer. And you could take the energies of collisions to be large transplankian. And it turns out that these the interactions can be are dominated by Feynman diagrams of this kind. So called the ladder diagrams or the iconal graphs. And all of them are generated by just the three point vertex, which is the graviton coupling to the stress tensor. And interestingly enough, you can compute all of these amplitudes at every loop. You can resum all of them. You get a very nice looking amplitude. All the quantities here that you see are what I mentioned before. S is a, is a Mandelstam variable. G Newton is a coupling constant. T is the other Mandelstam variable, but mu is an infrared regulator for the graviton mass. As I said, the exchange is dominated by very low momentum transfer. So the graviton is almost massless. You need some regulator in flat space. Now, 
clearly this has nothing to do with black holes yet. Um, there's no particle production. So where are the black holes? As I said, they arise when you have smaller impact parameters. So <clears throat> if you start reducing your impact parameter to be of the order of the emergent scale associated with the collisions, the iconal amplitudes have been shown to be to begin to diverge. And that's a lot of old work by Amati, Cefaloni, Veneziano, and a whole lot of others that have contributed to this. And this is seen as the effects, quantum effects arising due to an emergent scale, which is the length scale associated to the collision. And you can ask, how do I incorporate these emergent scales into my calculations? So you can ask, for example, what happens to stringy corrections? So as I said, we're looking at black holes that are much larger than Planck scale. And we look at weak coupling regime in, in string theory. And there are essentially three length scales now. It's the impact parameter B, that the Schwarzschild radius arising from the collision and the string length. Now you can ask, which was the regime that we calculated the flat space iconal amplitude in? That's the regime where the impact parameter is very large compared to both the other scales. And this is the flat space iconal, but this can be corrected perturbatively by RS over B or string length over B. So these diagrams, for example, will start looking like this. So the one on the left is, a, is the H diagram. The one on the right is a quantum correction arising from string length over B. Um, there's another interesting regime, which is when you take the string length to be much larger than the Schwarzschild radius and also much larger than the impact parameter. So in this case, it's very interesting because the st stringy effects dominate black hole production because before you reach the black hole, this, the Schwarzschild radius, you first hit the string scale. So, and stringy effects start to dominate. And if you start asking what happens if I take my string length to approach the Schwarzschild radius, it's known or it's been found by also some of the authors that I listed on the top of this slide, that there's some emergent behavior that's very black hole-like. For example, final momenta are one over RS, for instance. And interestingly enough, as you see on the, on the last equation on the left, if you tune your G string to be small enough, you can go to the regime both ways in a, and you can calculate amplitudes in both regimes where RS is much bigger than the string length or string length is much bigger than the Schwarzschild radius. And uh, you might want to see Maldacena's talk later today where he talks about where he will, I imagine, talk about the black hole string transition, which is given by this uh, change of scales. And there's another regime where the impact parameter is larger than the Planck scale, but it's smaller or off the order of the Schwarzschild radius. And this is the regime where you imagine classical black hole production to happen. And this is what I will focus on today. But as I said, you can include stringy corrections by tuning G string small enough such that you can a look at the transition to going to the string scale. So what do I have in mind? Again, two particles that are colliding at impact parameters that are smaller or of the order of the emergent scale associated to the collision. And I, I imagine that this is a high energy collision. So the center of mass energy squared is like the uh, mass squared of the black hole. And I want to stay away from Planckian physics because I know very little about it. So I want to be above the Planck scale. And the question is, can I calculate anything in this regime? And this is what this is the next part of my talk. Of course, it's a very difficult problem in general because a lot of nonlinearities of the classical collapse take place, but I want to appeal to one fact, which in some sense Hawking already appealed to, which is the following, that if you have a collapsing null matter, for instance, in the initial stages of the collapse, before all the matter has actually collapsed and settled down into a, into a slightly symmetric solution, the apparent horizon already forms and grows rapidly as matter is collapsing. But if you wait long after the collapse, then the apparent horizon essentially agrees with the event horizon. They're almost the same. And if you think of a fast collapse, in, when a black hole is formed, the lifetime of a large black hole is much larger than the time associated to the collapse. So for essentially most of the lifetime of the black hole, you can treat particles that are falling in as propagating on the black hole horizon on an already formed black hole. This is what Hawking had done. I'm going to stick to this for want of a better um, calculable regime. But this can of course be corrected again, perturbatively, or if you have a better calculational tool. So what do I want to do? Some, I want to define the notion of a black hole iconal phase, which is somewhat similar to what we did, what could be done in, in flat space. Where now I look at gravitons that are fluctuations above a short shield metric in this collapse, because now this captures effects associated to impact parameters that are smaller. And again, you have iconal graphs that are generated by the three-point vertex, 
But in this case, the solution is a little bit more complicated. So if you use your familiar donor gauge or the covariant gauge, it couples all the different partial waves. So you want to be clever about how you choose your gauge, but the, there exists a nice choice of, of gauge where all the spherical harmonics can be decoupled. And the gauge looks like the following. You have an even parity graviton that's, uh, that's block diagonal. HAB is now the graviton mode on the 2D space. And K is a scalar mode on the transfer sphere. So HAB is a symmetric tensor. It has three components, K makes it four. And the other odd parity graviton captures the other two physical degrees of freedom after you gauge fix. So these are, these are your six uh, physical off shell degrees of freedom. And it turns out that you could show uh, explicitly that uh, if you if you take transverse momenta along the sphere to be small enough, then the odd parity graviton does not contribute to your scattering amplitudes. It's still a difficult problem because you could have interactions that generate, for example, couplings between the partial waves. And now I want to imagine an approximately slightly symmetric process. So I want to say that there are no Klebsch-Cotton coefficients or contributions coming from the coupling of partial waves as subdominant. So I want to think of every vertex as having one spherically symmetric piece. So if you integrate out the sphere, I will represent dashed lines with lines that carry angular momentum, or uh, sorry, dashed lines as the ones without angular momentum and the solid lines as those with angular momentum. And so with this set of approximations, which are essentially everything that you could have made that Hawking has made, you could now start computing interactions or effects of interactions. And in some sense, here's my one slide definition of the black hole iconal phase. I've approximated that partial waves do not mix. So uh, I want to think of an approximately slightly symmetric collapse or problem with uh, appro approximately slightly symmetric dynamics. So I want to ignore transverse momenta. I want to think of impact parameters that are smaller than the Schwarzschild horizon, the size of the Schwarzschild horizon, but much larger than the Planck scale. This you achieve by scattering near the horizon because then I have a smaller sphere. So the impact parameters are sort of confined already. What it turns out that it's very interesting that the emergent scale that you have, the, the size of the black hole, gives you a regime of validity of your calculations, such that the energies are now larger than gamma times M Planck, where gamma is M Planck over M black hole. So gamma essentially acts like a coupling constant, which is very small for large black holes. So if you remember in flat space, I said that the collision energies had to be transplankian for, your for amplitudes to be calculable. Whereas now, the, this is heavily suppressed. So you have a wider range where your calculations are valid. Of course, as you go near the horizon for the external observer, we know that there's these blue shifts and red shifts. So energies of collisions are anyway very high. So the higher the energy, the, the better the validity of the calculation in some sense. It's a long technical calculation that, we, that, that, that is sketched in these papers, but the, uh, the important ingredients are now, what are the Feynman rules on the horizon? A scalar field um, is just a familiar scalar field, but because of the curvature effects, it, pick up, it picks up a small mass that you can see. The interesting thing is the graviton propagator now, because we're on the 2D theory, there's curvature effects that make the theory conformally flat. And so you see, an, you see a, a factor in front of the propagator that's associated to the emergent scale. And then you see the etas that are conformally flat it's reflective of that, but there's also momentum dependent pieces. And of course, as you send the momentum to infinity, so for example, for example, when you integrate over loops, for instance, you see the expected UV divergences. So we've not, we've not done anything magical. The problems that you expect are already are still there. However, if you look at the soft factor, if you set the momentum to zero, the graviton seems like it's gained an effective 2D mass. Remember that the 4D graviton is just massless. It's just the curvature effect after I've integrated out the sphere. It appears to have a natural IR regulator in the size of the emergent scale that's formed. And now the vertex coupling constant is given by M Planck over M black hole. So now this is sort of enough for me to calculate everything that I need to, that I'd like to. So what you can do is start with two to two amplitudes. There are three scales now in the problem. So there's the Planck mass, there's the mass of the black hole and the energy of the collision. Uh, what we're looking at now is by summing over all the ladder diagrams, by grouping together a lot of tree diagrams, if you will, you're essentially non-perturbative or perturbatively exact in the coupling constant gamma because at every order, you have higher powers of gamma that appear in your diagrams. But we're now looking at perturbative diagrams in the large energy compared to the gamma times M Planck limit. One of them has the effect that staying perturbatively above 
gamma times m planck in the en collision energies has the if outcome that only soft diagrams can contribute which means that the gravitons are again um, on shell if you will low moment zero momentum and as i said you sum over infinitely many feynman you can sum over infinitely many feynman diagram by looking at higher loops so here is a one loop diagram remember that every vertex again has a solid line and a dashed line so you can think of all odd loop diagrams where the solid line stays on top i want to call that the conserved channel but the name doesn't matter but if you if you add another loop then you see that the solid line shifts to the bottom of the diagram so there are six two loop diagrams two one loop diagrams that i just showed you but the important thing is that at every loop you can write down the explicit amplitude and it's iconal in the sense that all loop amplitudes are dictated by one iconal function chi which is also rem reminiscent in the flag space iconal case and as you see if you follow through the calculation uh, the soft limit is sort of enforced upon us and this is an artifact of the fact that i've stayed with energies of collisions that are higher than a certain order and that's valid for large black holes what's more you can neatly resum all of these diagrams and you can write down a very nice amplitude and this amplitude again has a classical counterpart which is the shock wave but now the great hope shock wave which is on which is a shock wave on a black hole is something that uh, they in a thorpe study long ago also khaira has spoken about this a little bit uh, in his talk is also studied by shankar and stanford in collisions of shock waves for example but in the shankar stanford analysis if you study a planar horizon you don't see finite size effects um whereas if you think of a classical on shell solution in the in the great hope shock wave and you get a, if you if for those of you remember that factor you get a slightly different factor here so if l square plus l plus 2 that i get here you have an l square plus l plus 1 and the effect of this is you can trace this explicit change in factor which is a factor of 2 for l equal 0 modes if you will to be contributions in the classical theory that arise from off shell gravitons and not just an on shell solution not just the on shell shock wave solution there are also off shell contributions in the classical theory so here's a, so this is 2 to 2 amplitudes but you can also do more for example add more external legs so look at 2 to n amplitudes and ask what are they still calculable so what do i have in mind again the same particles colliding small impact parameters larger than planck scale and the collision energies are dictated by um are the collision energy is telling me how big a black hole i'm going to form and you want to make sure that everything is larger than planck size such that semi classical effective field theory is still valid uh by semi classical I, as you see i also include metric fluctuations but in a controlled fashion as you would in quantum field theory so now instead of 2 to 2 amplitude i want to ask what happens if you have many external legs are these calculable so here's uh, some diagrams that you can start that you can actually explicitly calculate so you have two particles that i call p1 and p2 so these are traveling on the light cones and then they exchange a lot of gravitons they release a lot of low energy uh particles and all of these amplitudes turn out to be explicitly calculable so in the diagram on the left for example you see that p1 is split into n half number of particles with very low momenta so for larger and larger n these particles are extremely soft and p2 is also split into n half so it's just conservation of momenta but now you see that on the right on the diagram on the right it's what you would call the s channel where both of the particles create a energetic graviton that gener that then releases a lot of soft particles again p2 over n half and p1 over n half being the momentum of each of the individual out states as you see now the gravitons or the virtual particles are no longer soft momentum transfer becomes very important but but the ones that i've drawn here are again classical diagram so you can ask what happens if i resum all of these for all n so there are many out states possible every single one of them appears still preliminary analysis we still have to work out all the dominant diagrams that are allowed and so on preliminarily what we see is that the amplitude seems to be exponentially suppressed you see a 1 over n squared some symmetry factors that we still have to work out and you have some function of l planck times m black hole as an overall scaling of 1 over r squared that gives you that keeps the dimensions correct but of course you can play around with these to extract whichever dimension uh, full quantity you want outside so how to correctly interpret the amplitude is something that we're still working on 
But the important thing that I want to stress is that here is a regime where all diagrams can be calculated. You can add loops. You can extend this calculation loops. For example, look at the diagram on the left and imagine I add an extra graviton between any two of the virtual legs. Uh, sorry, external outgoing part of the legs. So that's like the one loop diagram. And there are n different places in which I can put this uh, one loop diagram. Then if you ask now, I can, if I go to two loops and there are n squared different diagrams. And so there seems to be some notion of iconalization also in this uh, higher loop diagrams, which possibly give you just like the two to two amplitude, resumming all of them in the iconal regime or the black hole iconal regime gave you a four point chaos bound. It looks like there's some exponentiation that can take place to give you some notion of an endpoint chaos bound. What's also interesting is that with the two to two amplitude as Gerard actually showed, um, if you, if you try, I'm working in Kruskal coordinates, now global Kruskal coordinates, but if you go to the exponentiated coordinates, what Hera showed is that the, you get a two by two scattering matrix that's now written in terms of Schwarzschild time. So the time for the external observer. And in terms of this time, you can ask a characteristic time scale associated to the scattering matrix. It's called Wigner's time delay. So given an S matrix, you can associate a time delay to the scattering process. And that's, uh, you can explicitly find that the two to two process gives you scrambling time. And you can ask if I now include many external legs, this time delay could increase. Perhaps this is one way of seeing page time emerge. We don't know that yet, but it's an interesting question to ask. Um, I'm almost at the end. What should you take away from everything that I've said so far? This seems to be a remarkable new phase of quantum gravity, which secretly a lot of you might have already known existed. For example, if you think of the shockwave calculations of Schenker and Stanford and so on. But this, this effective field theory picture tells you when this is valid, what parameters scale as what, and what is small, what is large. There's an explicit definition that you can give in, uh, in effective field theory that allows you to calculate things. And as I said, information paradox seems to be uh, addressed. I don't yet have an, uh, an explicit picture of how the entropy pops out, for example, and how to calculate the page time to be explicit, whether, the, whether this process captures everything that we expect of black holes or not. But it seems like there are many calculations. In fact, everything I can think of that may be relevant are actually calculable. And there seem to be somewhat similar to what Samir just mentioned. There seem to be exponentially many possibilities of outstates. All of them are very su suppressed, somehow conspiring. And unlike in the flat space icon, collision energies are not necessarily transplankian. There's a wider range of applicability of the calculation and, the cal and it's very easily satisfied. For example, if you think of an earth sized black hole, the prefactor, the gamma, the suppression factor is 10 to the minus 32. As I also said, because of the effective field theory construction that, we've, that we have, you can start including stringy corrections, alpha prime and so on. And by tuning G string to be small enough, then you can ask what happens when a black hole, the short shell radius is roughly of the size of the string length or, or the other way around. And here's a lot, I've already mentioned a fair number of things that you could do, but there are many other things that you could uh, that you could work out given the explicit nature of the formalism that we've set up. For example, there could be ultraviolet physics, hints for ultraviolet physics that you could discover by perturbatively moving away from the energy condition that I've used. Um, so that for example, there would be certain effects that arise from momentum transfer already in the two to two amplitude. So that's you'd move away from the iconal phase. And all extensions of the flat space iconal regime can essentially be repeated with the tools that I've showed you in the black hole iconal phase. Because the, once the regime is set up, you can formulate the theory such that essentially all the tools are very similar. And you can ask where the entropy comes from. Is, what, what does it have to do with all, all the possible outcomes that you can have in this collision process? You can ask, I just worked with the scalar field. I could include all kinds of standard model fields, for example. I've only restricted to the three point vertex. It's a very good question to ask, why should I be allowed to do that? Is there some universality in why this dominates? There seems to be because we see that this gives you an, a nice elastic part of the scattering. There's some, there's probably some regime or some notion in which this dominates all the higher order interactions, which allows you to calculate what we're able to see. And in some sense, this gives you an ideal bulk picture for small black holes because I've worked near the horizon. So the asymptotics are not necessarily very important. They can just be incorporated. You can ask what is the dual CFT interpretation of this? Perhaps again, in, this, in, a, in a spirit that's similar to what um, Samir just said, 
we have another interesting emergence scale in effective field theory, the, the cosmological horizon. And you can ask whether you can set up an effective field theory where you have, where you can calculate amplitudes again um, in a cosmological iconal. You can also, given that there's an explicit action that we've derived that from which you can calculate these amplitudes, you can ask perhaps more detailed questions about the infalling observer, whether these collisions have anything to say about the firewall. And a last comment is that in the two to two amplitude, if you imagine particles that are crossing the horizon, the entire two to two elastic process is dominated by zero momentum graviton exchange. So it looks like the particles essentially excite a black hole, exchange a virtual graviton, which is a perturbation on top of a Schwarzschild black hole, but then have no change in their momentum and they just go uh, essentially undisturbed, which is interesting to note. Uh, with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Take questions if any, hope I'm on time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nava, for this very nice talk. And uh, uh, well, we have we have time for, for questions. So I see the first in line is uh, uh, Luca, Luca Bonifante. So if you want to ask. Yes. Okay. Hello. Hi, Anna. Hi, Luca. Thank you. So yeah, I've, uh, if I understood correctly, um, in your uh, computation, you would recover the Hawking uh, computation when you basically set gamma equal to zero, which means g going to zero, m going to infinity, uh, and basically keeping the black hole like uh, uh, eternal and uh, working in the same classical regime. Is that correct? Because what you would get is that basically the uh, scattering amplitude m just goes to zero. You don't see any interaction basically between uh, gravitons and uh, matter. Exactly. Uh, however, yeah. an important yeah. distinction is that uh, when you set uh, gamma to zero, the, couple, the when you set interactions to zero, it looks like the scattering matrix is just one. However, that's where Hawking computation, well, the amplitude is zero, but the scattering oh, sure. matrix is one, one plus IM. Yeah. So it's just one. It seems yeah. like the most unitary thing you can get. However, mm -hmm. that's when Hawking's calculation is important, where you see that the vacuum structure at past infinity and future infinity is different. So you have a mm -hmm. thermal, you, you have an already existing thermal relation between mm -hmm. in and out modes. Now we're looking at corrections away from that. And those mm -hmm. corrections fall to zero. That's true. And now we're looking at all summing over all these corrections to see if they counteract Hawking's calculation. Yeah, indeed, actually, my question is just related to this, your last comment, basically. So basically, we have this gamma, which is not zero, as in the Hawking computation, I would say. So we are going beyond the computation, taking into account this gravitational uh, interaction. So, I mean, if you, for instance, would com you would compute the uh, Bokolubov coefficients and the spectrum, would you see some correction due to the this non-zero gamma also there? Yeah, so for example, what we've done in a paper with uh, Panos Betsios and Olga Papazulaki also in December last year, is that I'm computing these amplitudes in some sense near the horizon. And you can also include, for example, effects arising from the classical potential barrier further away from the horizon. And you combine all of those and you, write, you can write down the scattering matrix as something that gives you Bogolibov relations between the past and future infinity. And these are things that you can explicitly derive. What we haven't done is to combine this with Hawking's. Essentially what we've computed is corrections in addition to Hawking's, but somehow you also need to take, take into account the original difference in the vacuum structure. But this is something that you can do. So There's, obviously you still don't have like, for instance, an expression of some correct spectrum where you would take gamma equal to zero and recover Hawking. Right. No, exactly. That's the thing that we don't have. We, uh, yeah, I mean, that would be very interesting to have. I mean, it would be very nice to have something like that, right? Because That's true. So there, there's some expression for Hawking and there's some expression that give you correction, but there, there should be some formalism where you should be able to combine them such that you set gamma equals zero and you recover Hawking. And that's the thing that we haven't yet done. It's an interesting and important thing to do. Okay, thanks. We, we still have time for uh, questions or comments. Another couple of minutes, if you want. Uh, Nick Mavromatos, please ask. Oh, I have to unmute, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, it doesn't work. Thank you, that, now it works. <laughs> Thanks. Very nice uh, talk as well. Uh, one question, are you gonna see any experimental uh, evidence? I mean, in, in principle experimental, of course, in the 
<laughs> in the sense of the spectrum of the Hawking radiation is expected to be modified probably in your approach. Am I right? Or... Yes. So in principle, it's expected to be modified. Um, in Hawking radiation itself, it's, that's already hard enough to detect. So I guess yeah, yeah. even harder to detect this in but uh, the corrections to those. But there's an in interesting effect that's already at larger scales. So the fact that near the horizon, you have interactions that govern, that relate ingoing modes to outgoing modes, tell you that there's, there's a notion in which there's a difference in what happens when these modes hit the classical potential barrier and then leak out of the classical potential barrier to go to the asymptotics. But then there's also a part of it that reflects back and forth in that region between the horizon and the potential barrier. So at every time they, back, they go back and forth, information gets leaked out. And now there's an effect that you can see that should be different from what you would get if you had a thermal emission that's leaking out compared to some unitary scattering process near the horizon. So what, what people call echoes that you see outside, mm. there should be a difference and that should be, that's calculable and measurable, I think. Well, uh, experimentally, I don't know how viable it is. Yeah, yeah, I mean, when but I say experimentally, measurable. of course, I mean. And the important thing to note is that there are many ways in which you can generate these echoes, but in this case, we have no new parameters. I've introduced no new parameter. So all parameters in the game are just coupling constant, the size of black hole and so on. So G Newton size of black hole. So it's, it's, a, it's easily falsifiable. If the prediction that you get from these calculations disagrees with the experiment, then there are certain effects that are not being taken into account. And if it agrees, then you don't need new parameters to capture these effects. So I think in that sense, I think it's, it's a likable uh, theory. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. you. Oh, okay. So I think, uh, I think it's time now to go to the next uh, speaker. Thank thank, you. Thank, thanks again, Nava, for the, for the talk, the beautiful talk. Thank you. And uh, uh, the, the next speaker, uh, he, I see Hamed is there. Can hear? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yes, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, I guess you have to put full screen. Okay, fine. Yes, yes, yes. Very good. So, well, the stage is yours. So I, you, you, you can, you can start. Right, when... Thanks, uh, thanks, Fabio. Um, so thanks for the invitation uh, to speak at this stimulating conference. Um, so my talk today will be uh, a review of um, some recent, uh, some recent promising attempts at addressing the information paradox using the gravitational path integral. It's based mostly on these uh, two papers, but also uh, there are other works as well. Um, let me begin with the punchline. The main point is that um, the gravity plus matter path integral written in this way, G is gonna stand for the metric and phi for the matter, fi for the matter fields. Um, uh, the claim is that this uh, quantity by itself, um, or rather accounting for the gravity path integral drastically alters uh, Hawking's uh, conclusions. And um, uh, you might immediately object and say that we don't understand this gravity path integral well enough, well enough to actually extract results from it. But the miracle of the results I'm going to review um, is that a semi-classical analysis of the gravity path integral will be sufficient, whereby we only focus on the saddle points. Um, one advantage of this approach will be, uh, in some sense, there will be no dependence on what I call by fiat physics. I won't put in anything by hand, everything I will use will come out of this formulation of the theory. Uh, moreover, uh, there will be no assumed uh, UV completion. Okay. Um, the outline of the talk is gonna be the following. I'll start uh, with a recap of uh, Hawking's original calculation and emphasizing um, with, with some emphasis on his assumptions. I will then uh, recast or reproduce Hawking's calculation uh, using, the, using a technique for computing entropy uh, called the replica trick. Uh, then I will uh, incorporate uh, the gravity path integral into this uh, calculation using the replica trick and getting new results. Uh, one output of this calculation will be a new 
semi-classical entropy formula, uh, uh, which uh, gives us which gives sensible results, and then I'll conclude with some implications of uh, these results. Okay, so let's begin with Hawking's original calculation. So the starting point is the everything path integral, the gravity plus matter path integral. Uh, what Hawking did as, at the very beginning was to restrict this, this path integral uh, to a single saddle point, uh, which, course, which corresponds to a black hole that is formed from collapse. I will call this saddle point uh, or this metric or this configuration of the metric, the Hawking saddle. Okay, so the Hawking saddle is this space time. Um, in this regime, uh, sort of what remains of the path integral is, is a um, uh, quantum matter uh, living on some classical background. Uh, such a regime is called the semi-classical limit. And the equations governing the evolution of the metric is um, simply uh, the Einstein tensor being sourced by the expectation value of the stress tensor. Okay, this assumes uh, many things, uh, one of which, um, well, one of which is that the fluctuations in, this, in the matter stress, in the matter stress energy is small. So you can just restrict to the expectation value of, of T. Uh, this assumption is further justified by the smallness of the gravitational coupling, okay? Which causes G Newton divided by E to the power of D over E minus two, where E is of the largest energy in the problem. Okay, so this is again just justifying um, uh, restricting to this to the Hawking set. Now um, the state of the matter uh, in this space time can be computed, or rather, is prepared by the uh, matter uh, path integral. Uh, so um, so it can be expressed in this way. The statement is that given sort of the boundary conditions on sky mi on sky minus, for example, you have an infalling shell. You can, you can obtain the wave function on say a Cauchy slice sigma using this path integral. And what you get as, um, well, what you get is roughly sort of a tensor factor. Uh, you, have the, you have the wave function rather, or simply the state of the matter that fell in. A tensor, the state of uh, the so-called Hawking radiation. This is the radiation that is generated by the presence of the horizon and the curvature of the space time. Uh, and this is what Hawking famously showed. And uh, the, this Hawking radiation is a collection of entangled pairs, each in a state which roughly looks something like this. Okay, these, so these are sort of thermally occupied entangled pairs. Now, it turns out that if you, if you consider the state of the radiation and you compute the expectation value of the stress energy, th that's what leads to the uh, evaporation. You find that the stress, you find that, that this black hole sort of sense, it feels uh, sort of negative energy falling in, which makes the black hole shrink, and you have positive energy uh, going out, okay? Now, um, the, the, because these, these particles are entangled, the von Neumann entropy of the outgoing Hawking radiation will grow uh, monotonically as the black hole evaporates. Now, this was originally estimated uh, mostly by Page, uh, by um, taking, taking into account the fact that these modes are thermally occupied. And so you just, you just compute the thermal entropy uh, carried by each mode. Okay, and that's, that's, this was a rough estimate for what the von Neumann entropy should look like as a function of time. And so you get a, um, a rising uh, entropy, this red curve, that's the von Neumann entropy of the radiation. Um, now, the next step uh, is to compare this with the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the black hole, that's simply, uh, which simply goes as the area of the horizon divided by 4G Newton to leading order. And as the black hole eva uh, evaporates, the, well, the, the, the black hole shrinks and therefore the, uh, the, the area decreases. And so you get a decreasing function uh, with time. The reason why you're comparing this to the, to the why you're, you're comparing these two entropies is because the Bekenstein Hawking entropy is a measure of the dimension of the black hole Hil uh, Hilbert space. So that's so if you assume that a black hole is a quantum system with a finite dimensional Hilbert space, well, this will be the 
the dimension of a Hilbert space. Now, it seems like there's a problem after this, time, this sort of midpoint of the evaporation, which is often called the page time, which is that uh, it seems that the rather Hawking's calculation seems to predict that the entanglement between the Hawking rate, between the, um, the, the outside radiation and the black hole exceeds what, what the black hole has room for. Okay? That's, that's a problem. And so we are led to the information paradox. So the statement of the information paradox is the following. If you start with this theory defined in this way, um, and then, then you are led to the following two conclusions. Uh, the first is what I call the entropic paradox, which is simply uh, what I just said a few uh, moments ago, that the polynomial entropy increases for all time. And uh, furthermore, the, the bl a black hole evaporation tra transforms uh, the, the sort of pure state of the infalling shell, which we certainly could have picked it to be in a pure state, to evolve to a mixed state of the, of the uh, outgoing Hawking radiation. Okay, and so and this, uh, evolu this um, evolution is not unitary. The aspect of the information paradox is what I call the uh, S matrix paradox, which is simply the statement that there is no um, one to one mapping between initial states uh, forming the black hole and final states emerging out of the black hole. So the question is, does information, does the infalling information ever make it out, okay? So this is the information paradox, at least uh, uh, as I understand it. Um, now, let me talk about the replica trait. So the, the goal in this section is to just simply recast Hawking's and also Page's calculation using some modern techniques. Um, now you can argue that the reason why they resorted to um, uh, estimating the entropy by, uh, by just considering the uh, thermal uh, answer uh, is, by, is because uh, computing the actual polynomial entropy trace rho log rho is hard. Um, but recently there's been some uh, advance in understanding how to compute something like this, which is to use uh, the replica trick. Okay, replica trick, you take, you, you first define these trace root the n's for integer n. These are, these are called Rennie entropies. You take the, you um, take the derivative as a function of n and then you continue n down to one. Now you might ask, why is computing entropy so complicated? Well, entropy is, is, a, is not a linear observable. In particular, an entangled state is a superposition of unentangled states. Uh, furthermore, it's the, just by looking at the, the, the formula for the polynomial entropy, it's uh, the entropy is an expectation value of an operator that depends on the state, right? It's, it's the expectation value of log rho. Um, just some intuition behind what I just said is that if you have an entangled uh, pair of states, uh, sorry, entangled pair of uh, particles, then uh, one cannot check entanglement uh, by, by just doing a single measurement. You need many copies of the system uh, in order to build enough statistics and check the entanglement, that the entanglement is indeed there. Um, let me give some more intuition uh, for this uh, or for this computation. So let's, let's consider the simplest possible, uh, um, non, so the, the simplest non-trivial Rennie entropy calculation, which is simply trace row squared which is sometimes known as the purity. Um, this quantity has the interpretation as, as the success probability of a uh, swap test, uh, which is simply the probability that the state of a system and its duplicate, so you need to duplicate the system, is invariant under uh, swapping the relevant subsystems. Okay, let me, let's, let's uh, work through a simple example. So suppose you have two systems A and B that are entangled and you want to check that A uh, actually has entanglement. The first step is that you duplicate the system. So you have two A's and two B's. You swap the two A's, that's step number two. And then you compare the swapped state with the unswapped state, which you can do by simply taking the overlap. If you take the overlap, you can convince yourself that this is row times row and uh, all these dots get contracted. And so this is trace row squared. 
And similarly for the higher Rennies, but now instead of a swap, you have a, um, a cyclic permutation. Um, you conclude that there's entanglement if trace rho to the n is less than one, okay? Or I guess maybe a better way of saying it, that is trace rho to the n is less than trace of rho. And trace of rho is often, is, uh, is usually normalized to be one. Okay. Now let's adapt this to the Rennie entropy calculation. So rather let's adapt this to the calculation for the Rennie entropy of the radiation and the evaporating black hole background. So suppose you want to compute the Rennie entropies of the radiation, which is far away from the black hole. Now the density matrix, uh, so th th that's the state. If you want to compute the density matrix, we need to trace out the complement of the radiation. This is implemented directly by uh, the matter path integral. So you need to consider the state, the ket and the bra. Here, this is the state on the Cauchy slice. And uh, the path integral given these boundary conditions, I and J, um, implements the trace. And so that gives you the density matrix rho i j of the radiation. Okay, so that's rho. Now, let's say we want, we want to compute the purity, trace rho squared. Well, as I said, you need, to con you need to consider two copies and you need to contract them in the right way. So here there are two copies and these, these, uh, um, these indicate the contractions. You can work in a simplified picture where you collapse these two copies on top of one another and work with sort of a branched geometry. And so the branch cut here is supposed to indicate that if you go through it, you go to the second copy and so on. Generally, this holds for higher Rennie entropies. It's the same picture, but now the, 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 um, uh, the angle here becomes two pi n. And so the density matrix trace rows at the end simply becomes uh, the path integral evaluated on this branched geometry, okay? And the statement is that if you consider this, the, this path integral near n equals one, it will be, it will get, it will um, have this form, e to the minus n minus one uh, times the von Neumann entropy of the radiation. And therefore, if you take the derivative with respect to n, you'll just get the entropy, okay? And, and, take, n, uh, and take n goes to one. Um, okay, so the, the upshot here is that the matter path integral in the presence of a branch cut gives you a von Neumann entropy. Very good. Um, so that was a sort of more careful way of reproducing Hawking's results. And you can actually just, you can check that it, that, uh, that Hawking, I guess, and Page as well, uh, they were sort of spot on in that calculation. Um, now to get uh, different answers, we have to reintroduce the gravity path integral in the uh, Rennie entropy calculation and then evaluate by saddle points. So again, let's consider trace row squared, but now I'm putting dg back in, okay? And I'm going to sum over saddles. Uh, what you find is the following two uh, uh, solutions to, to the gravity equations. Uh, the first is the Hawking saddle, what, which is what we discussed uh, in the previous slides. But then there's a new contribution, which is not previously accounted for, where a wormhole emerges and connects the two copies uh, of uh, the black hole or of the space time. Okay. So far, we're just, we're just sort of mechanically looking for solutions for this integral, and then and we find it, okay? This, this is not put in by hand. Um, and similarly, the same thing happens if you compute the higher Rennies, um, you get, uh, the path integral gets two contributions, a, uh, the, the, one, the, the one without the wormhole, which is simply the uh, Hawking saddle, and one with a wormhole. And in this picture, um, the presence of the wormhole can be um, sort of um, represented by having an extra branch cut, which now is somewhere inside the black hole. So if you go through this, uh, this branch cut, you go through the wormhole and, and, uh, and uh, into the, the other sheet or the next sheet. The shape and location of the wormhole is determined by the equations of motion, right? So we're looking at a saddle, it satisfies the, 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 the space-time equation of motion or the metric equation of motion. And um, these are simply Einstein's equations uh, that are, are sourced by the energy coming from the, the existence or the presence of uh, the branch points. If we consider um, the solution near n equals one, so we're, we're, we're 
performing an analytic continuation for, uh, uh, down to uh, vicinity of one. The, these branch points, well, these angles become almost two pi again. So the branch points almost disappear. So they're just a small perturbation. And the metrics um, in both of these saddles uh, become essentially, essentially the same. And so the remaining part of the calculation is uh, we have a matter path integral evaluated on the same uh, evaporating black hole space time, or rather the broadcut, but in the presence of different configurations of branch cuts and branch points. And so what you find now near n equals one is that in the Hawking saddle, this is what we, this is what we discussed before. But in this new saddle, you get this new looking at this different looking answer. And so let's, let's, let me uh, deconstruct this. Um, because of the branch cuts, because now we have two branch cuts, one which is inside the black hole and one, one which is outside, um, you that uh, the matter path angle gives you a von Neumann entropy of the, of the union of these two regions. The, region, the, the branch cut inside the black hole is, is, uh, is often denoted as the island or just I for short. So you get the volume entropy of the union of this region and this region. Uh, furthermore, there's a contribution coming from the area of the boundary of the island. Okay, so it turns out that the gravity, uh, even the, so you, you find equations of motion and you plug it back in, evaluates to simply the area of the boundary of the island. I'll say, I will say a bit more about this later. It essentially arises just to ensure that that the space time is smooth uh, at the boundary of the time. So, all right. Um, now, if you're working just near n equals one, the, the location of the island um, uh, is, de is determined by an extremization condition that descends from the equations of motion that I discussed. So this is, this, it's the same equations, but the, this is what the equations look like near n equals one. Um, so this means that the boundary of the island uh, is, um, is often called a, a quantum, or rather this means that the boundary of the island is a quantum extremal surface as defined in uh, work by Engelhardt and Wall in the context of um, AES-CFD. Um, the location of the island is just behind the event horizon, uh, sort of a scrambling time uh, to the past of the radiation in infalling time. So if you, if you look at the, if you consider the, if you label the radiation as this region here, you, the way to find the island is to go back in time, in scrambling time, and then fall in along a known ray. The, the, the boundary of the island is gonna be located sort of uh, very close to the event horizon um, in, this, in this fashion. There, there are precise equations about where it is exactly, you just have to solve this but the details are not important at the moment. Um, this wormhole contribution uh, gives you a decreasing function as the black hole evaporates. So this function here is decreasing as, as the black hole evaporates uh, for the following reason. The matter entropy of, uh, well, this matter entropy the, of the union of the radiation and, and the island doesn't grow because the island purifies uh, all, all of the Hawking radiation outside, so it remains small. This quantity is thus dominated uh, by the area term, which goes as one over G Newton, which, as I said, is near the event horizon, and therefore it tracks the size of the horizon as the black hole shrinks. This decreases with time. So the final answer for the entropy um, comes from a competition between two saddles um, in the calculation of trace row to the end. And if you take the derivative with respect to n and take n goes to one, um, you find that the entropy is the minimum of the, the results found by Hawking and um, this new wormhole contribution. Um, this amazing formula generates uh, the, uh, an evolution of the, of the entropy that is consistent with unitarity. So here we have the two these two contributions, this increasing, uh, increasing contribution coming from the Hawking saddle and the decreasing contribution coming from the wormhole. And the entropy is simply the minimum of those two. What this is telling you is that the original semi-classical approximation that Hawking considered 
uh, breaks down at this time, which uh, is the page time, and uh, a new saddle uh, comes in or dominates and brings the entropy down. So what happens is that you have a first order phase transition that happens at some point during the uh, black holes uh, uh, as the black hole evaporates. Okay, now I'm gonna make some comments. Um, so so th th these results are um, on the same footing as the derivation of Gibbons and Hawking of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the black hole. So there they considered uh, the path integral on the cigar. So this is the Euclidean cigar, but I've just flattened it out. And we have to take some derivative with respect to beta one, one minus that. And then you get the area of the horizon plus the von Neumann entropy outside. The idea is that you should compare that to this calculation that we did. The, 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 the point is that in both cases, you're deforming uh, or the deformation in beta or in N leads to the emergence of this branch cut and a branch point. And the, and the area term, uh, this contribution arises because of a boundary term in the action that ensures uh, that even in the face of this branch point, uh, that the space time is smooth everywhere. Unfortunately, just as with the Gibbons Hawking calculation, uh, these results do not provide a microscopic understanding uh, of the, the, the formulas. It's sort of a black box. Comment number three is that um, the wormhole saddle is a, uh, um, a non-perturbative effect, which apparently sort of resolves the entropic paradox. Entropy goes up and comes back down. But now you can ask, what about the S matrix paradox? Does the infalling information ever make it out? Uh, this turns out to be partially addressed in that you can think um, of the island in, as, in some sense as a subsystem of the radiation. The intuition for this is that uh, the island uh, was relevant for the calculation of the radiation far away. So clearly the radiation is sensitive to the island. Um, but in terms of a more concrete calculation, you can show that uh, there exist operators with support only on the radiation, which because of the gravity path integral can actually modify the state of the island and it can probe it. This was proposed in this first paper and shown and demonstrated in the second. Um, okay. Uh, so the mechanism by which, the, in some sense, the information comes out is by simply falling into the island. Okay? So the, the idea is that. Hamid, sorry, you still have five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, so the, the statement is that um, after, uh, rather, if you throw in information, if, if, if you throw information into the black hole and then wait a scrambling time, then the information would have fallen into the island of the radiation region after that scrambling time. And so therefore, it can be reconstructed from the radiation in the way that I did not, I was, I mean, I didn't have time to explain. Um, and this is an amazing sort of, uh, sort of, uh, um, it's, it's, well, it's, it's, uh, it builds confidence that, that we're sort of on the right track because um, the appearance of the scrambling time in a context like this was previously predicted purely from quantum information theoretic grounds based on this old paper of Hayden and Presco of black holes as, uh, uh, as mirrors. And, and it's amazing how just the space-time geometry encodes this. And so that's pretty much everything I had to say. Let me just uh, conclude. So I would say that it's now understood. Like the main punchline you should take away from this, even if you don't, well, yeah, the main punchline is that uh, Hawking's calculation of the state and the entropy of the radiation, uh, in some sense, was not a controlled calculation. Okay? Uh, the idea is that non perturbative effects from the gravity path integral kick in at just the right time and modify the result uh, to make it consistent with unitarity. Um, unfortunately, again, the calculation is a bit of a black box. We like the answers and they 
they reproduce our expectations in detail, though we don't understand why the gravity path integral actually knows about them and, and actually produces them. It still feels like a long way uh, to the goal of finding uh, sort of the precise microscopic state of the Hawking radiation, like all the details and so on. Uh, or said differently, getting a full S, a full S matrix. But I would say that non-perturbative non effects of the sort that I discussed and more will, will certainly be necessary. Um, and finally, uh, there was no direct insight uh, regarding the singularity. That's all I had to say. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very beautiful talk. And we have we have time for, for questions. So, uh, OK, I see Luca in the line, first in the line for next question. Please. Oh, hi. Nice talk. Thank you very much. So, um, so I'm not uh, an expert, but so it's still not clear to me, like uh, which are the assumptions that rely this computation. So, I mean, just, I have several questions, but maybe just one for now. So is, I mean, did you do a rigorous computation which applies to a Schwarzschild four dimensional black hole? Um, good question. So uh, most of the calculations were done in very special settings. Um, the, the most careful ones are in two dimensions. Uh, but there are also calculations in higher dimensions, but with certain assumptions on the matter contents. Um, there, the, the closest thing to what you're asking uh, is, let me see. Yes, we did do a calculation for Schwarzschild, but, but again, with a special assumption on, the, on what the matter fields are. We assume that the matter living on the Schwarzschild uh, black hole is a holographic, it has a holographic dual and so on. To apply the entropy formula of Fenaga, uh, okay. Well, uh, yes, to, to, apply, to apply the entropy formula, but also to, to in some sense, derive it, uh, like um, um, uh, said slightly differently to um, implement the, the gravity path integral in computing the Remy entropies. Mm -hmm. Let me say it like that. Okay, so would you would you say that um, like uh, um, so for a standard virtual for the major black hole, like you can show that basically the uh, Hawking uh, the radiation entropy really follow the page curve, or like do do you have all the rigorous proof for it or not? Again, if your question is about four-dimensional black holes with a matter content like the one we see in our universe? Mm -hmm. The answer yes. is no. I don't know okay. how to do that calculation yet. Okay, thank but you. But if you want a short shield black hole, but you could allow me to choose matter content freely, then I can do it in that context. Okay, and do you think that something can be done like in some more, like, uh, I don't know if it's good to say more realistic situation, like matter that we see in our universe, for instance. Yeah. Well, the problem is that calculating entropy is hard. Mm -hmm. In two dimensions, if you assume that your matter content is, is just is a CFT, then you can compute it easily. But in four dimensions, it's it's not understood how to how to compute uh, monomial entropies of certain of uh, of the regions of of the type we want. But you would expect the same. So you would expect. But the expectation is that the same thing would hold. Okay. Like, right. like not, nothing in what I said seems intrinsic in sort of intrinsically dependent on the specific models that were considered, say in two dimensions or this uh, higher dimensions with this special matter content. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, the, uh, there is a, a, a so, sorry, Sugato, one, one minute. There is a, a, a question from Alfredo and then, and then you. Um, Alfredo. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Fabio. It was a, uh... An issue with the icon. Uh, I don't have the icon to raise the hand, so I, I, I just have, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, uh, I've learned quite a bit because I, I'm not familiar with all the details there. But one, one thing I think I remember about this page carve. I mean, the page carve when we 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 learned the in the 90s it actually goes up and then down. It comes back, right? So. Uh, 
so it, and you had a picture towards the end of the of your talk. Uh, there you go. There you go. But it, which appears that only only through this new method you can get a contribution that brings down the entanglement entropy. But from what I remember of, of that carb is, I mean, you you, you have this uh, anorexic uh, hypothesis, you know, taking. So am I am I understanding this thing correctly or? Okay, let me. Uh, well, um, so um, the page curve prior to this work, as as far as I know, was 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 never reproduced. It was always a prediction or a hope for. Um, uh, oh, I see. Through one, this calculation, one. through this calculation. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. I see. The page curve was, was the was, the page curve was given uh, for this, uh, you know, bipartite quantum system. Exactly. Okay, so you have reproduced that. Oh, okay, I get it. Okay, okay, yeah. that's very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That was mm -hmm. uh, my question. Okay. Okay. So a question from Sugato Jose. Oh, sorry, I have to unmute you. One second. Hi, thanks okay. for the very interesting talk. So I'm, I'm asking as an outsider, okay? So I work in quantum information. Uh, so so you you can, when you can do this um, replica trick, you can compute also the full entanglement spectrum if you want, right? Uh, so is there any extra interpretational help if you compute the entanglement spectrum perhaps? Or, 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 um, um, I'm not sure what, uh, well, let me see. Um, you know, if you did all the Rennie entropies, I wonder whether it tells yeah. you something about the eigens, well, eigenvalues still, not yeah, eigenscale. Yeah, yeah, you can certainly, you, you can certainly compute mm -hmm. that and, and it has mm -hmm. been computed in special Okay, models. okay. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I'm sure it's been computed by the by by the I see, I see. other people, and I, I don't I don't under, mm -hmm. I don't recall what the main what the main new lessons one would extract from that. Right, but right. It's certainly an interesting calculation, and it's an interesting. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, let me keep okay. it. Going. Okay, and 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 an, another question is 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 very vague vague question, but it is like you are kind of you have two semi classical paths. Um, there, right? The, the one without the wormhole and one with the wormhole. So, so can you interpret this coming down of the page curve as like a interference uh, phenomena? Like, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's extremely superficial question, but if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately I don't. I, I, I don't think, uh, well, it's it, like, like you, you might have thought that, that you want to, you need, um, well, like if it was an interference thing, then then uh, um, then you would not you would not have expected that it's mm -hmm. that's a sum of it's a sum over saddles, right? Okay. So okay. An interference thing is well, mm -hmm. the octagonal terms become important. Right, 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 right. Here, Which is not, terms not important. Not important. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just the magnitudes. One wins over the other. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now uh, there is a question and the problem with the raising of hand of us uh, from Samir Matur. So if, if Samir, you yes. have the word, if okay. you want to ask. Yeah, yeah thanks. So I want, uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I must say that I have been skeptical about this uh, entire direction with islands and so on. And I know it's difficult for you to uh, give a brief answer. We could probably talk more in the discussion, but maybe I could just state my main difficulty in the following way. Uh, what you said is extremely clear. You have started with ordinary quantum gravity. You don't need any string theory or anything and just done the usual calculations. Uh, and I think in the end, you have gotten exactly what we had uh, you know, in, in Hawking's time in 1975. Your entangled pairs are there. The radiation is actually entangled with the island. Nothing has actually changed because the input wasn't changed. And what you have done in the end to make the page curve comes down. I don't think it has come down. What you have done is you have redefined what you want to call the entropy of radiation as the entropy of radiation union, the quanta which are inside. So of course, if you take the union of those two, that whole thing is not entangled with anything. 
and somehow your reason for saying that you should actually think of the radiation not as what we see at infinity, but the radiation should be thought of as radiation union, the pairs inside, has to do with what you're seeing from the saddle points. But when I look at the saddle point calculations, I don't actually find that the saddle, saddle points happen in Euclidean space. In the Lorentzian section, there are no saddles, everything is oscillating. If you go back to the Lorentzian calculation and you look for what are the actual paths that contribute to what you have drawn, in fact, in the picture, which is on the screen, maybe I could then uh, pose it as a question. What will you see extra in terms of new configurations in this path integral that are not close to the semi-classical path that Hawking saw? If there are no new paths over there, then you will get the same answer as Hawking. If there are new paths that take you all the way out to the radiation, you will see non-local wormholes. That's fine if that's what you are claiming. And otherwise, if the paths are just doing something else inside, I would like to know what they are doing. Maybe they've converted to a piece of coal like a fuzzball, but I don't think in, with just your input here, you can get fuzzballs. So maybe my question to you would be, okay, so forget the saddle, that's only a trick. It's anyway not there in Lorentzian sections. If you actually put the whole thing in a computer, the Lorentzian problem in a computer, what new points configurations in the gravitational path integral will contribute to get the information out. Uh, is that a well-defined question? Uh, yes. So, uh, well, there, there were many, many questions. Um, so the first, the first um, so regarding what we call the radiation and why we including the inside or, and so on and so forth, I feel one problem is that we were prejudiced in calling the radiation just the outside. And what, what my calculation demonstrates is that I'm not really, um, I'm not, well, what includes, the ins what includes the island as part of the radiation is not something I put in by hand, but rather something that came out of the path integral. Um, the, the, the question that I was trying to answer or that these works are trying to answer is to what, to what statements can we make with just a path integral as the assumption. And I completely agree regarding your last comment that this does not seem to shed light uh, uh, into sort of what the, what the microstates are of the black hole and what is the microscopic understanding for how the information comes out. Um, you also had a comment about these, um, that these being Euclidean saddle points. Uh, that's only partly true. Um, the saddle points, the, the, the wormhole saddle, the wormhole saddle which, which makes the entropy go down, turns out to be, it's a complex saddle. It starts Euclidean, but it also has some excursion into the, the Lorentzian section. And it actually has part of it, just the standard uh, uh, Lorentzian black hole. Um, and, th and that is, uh, actually essential for finding the saddle points. I don't know if I've addressed all of your questions. No, no, thanks very much for the comments. Maybe we could just continue in the discussion section, but this was very nice. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, I think that uh, probably now there are still two questions, but uh, we can start the discussion and, and then the question will be, po will be posed uh, in the discussion directly. Um, so maybe if you... Abdel, I think there was a previous, previous question by Gerard in the chat. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know, I know. Uh, well, so maybe now... Uh, Gerard, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, oh, okay, so if you want to ask your question. Yeah, I just want to ask the question to the previous uh, speaker. Um, is the uh, Hawking radiation assumed to be in a pure state or in a mixed state, quantum mechanically? Because that seems to be where the difficulty lies. I, I don't have any of such difficulties in my approach where everything is in a pure state. Um, sorry, the state of the radiation, well, it depends on what you mean. So um, um, the, state the, the state of the radiation is whatever the path integral prepared it to be. We diagnose the, whether it's pure or mixed by computing the Rennie entropies, or rather just computing the entropy. And if you do that calculation, you find that it's, uh, that it's not mixed, that it's pure. 
However, the semi-classical, like uh, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a mystery for why this uh, for why this holds. But um, let me go back. Uh, it's an equation that I want. Yeah. So the mystery, well, one mystery of these results is that it gives you a formula to to compute for you the exact entropy of the radiation, but where the input into this formula is the original semi-classical state, okay? So you take the original semi-classical space-time with the radiation outside seemingly entangled with the radiation inside, but you now have, but if you implement this, all this new formula, you get an entropy which goes down, okay? So I would say um, there's, there's, there's a wrong way to diagnose that the, that the there's a wrong way to, to check uh, for, for how mixed the state is, and there's a right way. The wrong way is to look at the semi-classical state and just look at the radiation and be like, look, it looks mixed. The right way is to compute these Rennie entropies, okay? And, and, uh, and see which contribution dominates and extract the answer from that. And that gives you a different answer after the page time. Um, for the monomial entropy of the radiation. I hope that addressed your question. Yes. Just briefly, I think that uh, my approach gives a different answer, which has to do with the antipolar identification. So which means that you don't get exactly the heart of walking state as you expected, but you get the uh, entanglement between radiation coming out at the opposite halves of the black hole. So there's a strong entanglement between antipodes, and that turns everything into a pure state. So instead of having an interior of a black hole where you get the, a tremendous complexity or something, I have no interior, just exterior, and there's just pure states. This gives me also a unitary S matrix, and it gives me uh, that, well, I don't see any deviations from ordinary quantum mechanics, and then this problem of entropy doesn't play any role. You now have to ask the question of what well, it's got a, it's a comment rather than a question. Yeah, yeah. But I would but I would ask you the question of um, where does that antiphotal and antiphotal identification come from? Like what? Yes, you know, I, I understand what it leads to, but what it, it, is, it is something that has to be discussed because um, what I do is I take the background of the eternal black hole and I ignore the um, the, the history of the black hole of long ago, because that's irrelevant. But it means that you cannot consider the collapse anymore as an uh, input in the equations. That changes everything. It replaces the collapse by a hard to Hawking state for the ingoing particles far away. And the reason is that that involves also the particles that went out long ago, because right from the beginning, the black hole started to emit Hawking particles. But those are not so far away that physically, of course, they're totally unimportant. They just fill up the universe a little bit with particles and that's it. So why should you include all that? And uh, in ordinary quantum mechanics also, you just want unitarity of the scattering matrix. And whenever there's a problem, just take that scattering matrix and, and do your calculations and the problem will, be, will disappear. And that's the stage I have reached in my way of calculating things. Although that doesn't mean I haven't have solved all problems. There are still sort of yeah, high order corrections, which are difficult. But uh, basically the main difficulties with entanglements and such do now no longer appear. Okay. Uh, maybe the, the, there is a question by Christoph, uh, if you can ask. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So my question is uh, also to the pre previous, uh, to, to, to the last speaker. Uh, so uh, the question is, I mean, if one could uh, see more physically how, the, uh, wh where does this wormhole come from? I mean, what does it connect? Because I can imagine, I mean, there's this black hole and then there is wormhole inside, but what does it connect? Various parts of the black hole or, I mean, more, more physically kind of than just, this kind of uh, 
aspect of the pod's integral, I mean. Well, um, these wormholes, um, the, these are contributions that appear in some calculation. It's not that if you have a black hole evaporating in our space time, you jump in and then you see a wormhole. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that to compute the entropy, one needs to, con to consider many copies of the states. Yes. And uh, if you take into account the gravity path integral in these computations, there are contributions coming from connecting these different copies via wormholes. That's where the wormholes are. Yes, but this looks like a kind of mathematical setup. Indeed. But, but, but I, I would like to see, I mean, the f kind of a physical origin. I mean, is there uh, any, I mean... I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you want. I mean, the information paradox is a mathematical paradox. There's a mathematical calculation which leads, which leads to a wrong conclusion. <laughs> so we're trying to find what can fix, what, how can you fix this mathematical calculation? And the proposal here is that the gravity path integral does it automatically for you by including these wormholes. Hmm. That's, that's, that's the extent of the proposal. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, there is a question from uh, Wei Xiang. Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for the nice talk. And uh, I think I have two questions. Um, the first question I think you briefly touched upon is the fact that you're saying that once the iron forms in the interior of the black hole, then an external observer somehow have access to that information, even though that, that region, that iron region is behind the event horizon. So um, my understanding is that the, the, main, the main reason why the information paradox is hard is because it's due to the event horizon and the fact that without non-local dynamics, you are unable to get the information out. So um, could you please, uh, could you briefly explain how uh, exactly could an external observer obtain information about the interior? And, I, and the second question is, um, is, 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 um, is, is my understanding correct that Due to this island, you are now able to avoid the firewall paradox. Like you are sort of um, like the the island itself, the interior, the part, the Hawking partner modes are now um, part of the exterior, part of the Hawking radiation, so that um, the firewall, the firewall sub, strong subadditivity is avoided in in that sense. So these are the two questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the questions. Um, Quick answer for the um, for the for your second question is that uh, um, in some sense yes, like uh, uh, you don't have this. You it's these 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 uh, results seem to suggest that you don't have a subadditivity paradox because when you compute the entropy, you need to include both the outside and the inside. Um, but um, like it's it's so the, the, there are many. Uh, versions of the firewall paradox. The simplest one, which is the monogamy, monogamy one, which, which we discussed, this seems to resolve that. But there are other problems like the typical black hole uh, firewall. The, the, um, basically the arguments that, that uh, were uh, put forth in the second firewall paper, those have not been, those are not addressed by these results. Um, and so um, I would be hesitant to say completely that for sure there is no firewall. Okay. Um, uh, as for your first question, that will take, well, so your question was about how can you see that an observer outside uh, can probe the island, even though it's behind the horizon. Yeah, uh, yes. that, that by itself takes, uh, th that will take another talk. Uh, uh, yeah. But uh, the, the, quick, the quick answer is that there, you can, you can, there are operations that you can do on the radiation which in some sense, okay, let, let me say these words, I hope, I hope they're not gonna confuse you. In some sense, you can create uh, another black hole in the radiation, uh, from, from the radiation, which uh, sometimes people call a, um, sort of a, a simulated black hole. And then a wormhole gets, you find that the path integral wants to create a wormhole 
between your simulated black hole and, and the physical black hole. And, um, and then that allows you to sort of probe the region inside, inside of your black hole. These are just very big words, but it's, again, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit complicated to explain, but uh, it's the same mechanism. The operator on the radiation involves a path integral, which gives you wormholes. Okay. That's all I can say right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. According to my records, the, there was a, a question, previous question of Francesco, uh, Francesco Di Filippo, for uh, uh, Gerard, Gerard Tuft. Uh, uh, let me unmute you. Oh, okay. Does it work? Yes, I think. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. I had a question. It's uh, yeah. It's very, I mean, very simple one. I think. So um, uh, I, I'm very interested in the model, but there are a few things I don't understand. So um, you were showing the the Cauchy foliation, but then my question is: given that the foliation does not go inside the the trapped region, so uh, what what are the geodesic in this space time? So it's not Schwarzschild inside or uh, or what? Like what is the genetic for a particle falling into the space time? Uh, okay, okay. You no no can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Instead of geodesics, I talk of Cauchy surfaces. So um the Cauchy surface just, oh, I can't, I can't put my uh, slide on. Um, the uh, Cauchy surface pivots around the origin in the Penrose diagram. In other words, it never goes towards the forbidden regions. Uh, the regions three and region four, they were called in my slide. They are just forbidden regions. You never get even close to those regions. So um, the, Geodesics are the, the path described by the particles while sitting on the Cauchy surface, and the Cauchy surface just scans through the diagram, but does does not scan through all of space time, but only in regions one and region two, but not region three and region four. So what a geodesic does there is irrelevant immaterial for this way of talking about things. You just talk about things only. In, in the space time of an outside observer. Uh, so region two is as much in space time of outside observer as region one is. Uh, three and four are not in, in, in the outside observer space. So, um, uh, so the geodesic stops at where the particle goes into the horizon. There, the boundary condition brings the particle to the other, to the past horizon, but by means of a Fourier transformation. So that completely delocalizes the particle where it was originally. So this also means that the quantum theory is fundamentally different from the classical theory. In the classical theory, the particle would have continued its way to region three and mm -hmm. would have come from region four. But that is now no longer relevant in this picture. The only relevance is regions one and regions two. So region two is now identified with the antipodes, and that's necessary to avoid the quantum mechanical cloning problem. If you wouldn't do that, you would have been able to, able to have one point for the outside observer being represented in two points in the Penrose diagram. And this one to two mapping does not allow you to repeat that in quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics doesn't allow you to map one point on two other points without getting into serious contradictions with everything, with unitarity, with hermeticity, and so on. So that's why I have the antipolar identification. But uh, then, as I said, the GDS stop at the horizon. After Fourier transformation, they reappear at the, others, at the other horizon, and then uh, on things go. That's just the, the, the way the dynamics works. And everything else is just working out the equations. OK, so an observer will arrive to the horizon, so then it, uh, an observer then will arrive to the horizon and then uh, uh, find itself in region two, right? And then, 
And it, then what? It's part it's of going back in region one. It continues its journey in region one, hits the the event horizon. There, the boundary condition between the event horizons brings it back to the other horizon where it emerges again. The boundary condition is take the Fourier transform. That is replace position by momentum. And then it gets out again. But isn't this going to generate uh, close time-like curves? Like, yes, uh, but only very close to the Planck scale in general, very close to the Planck scale, which may mean something like um, you have to, um, uh, to uh, um, put space time on a lattice or something like that to avoid that kind of difficulty. But basically particles just continue their way straight on, uh, very close to the Planck scale. You don't have any mass effects there. So, mm -hmm. um, so the closed time curve becomes relatively unimportant at very small uh, Planckian distances. But in a way, formally speaking, you're quite right, which means okay. at the Planck scale, I haven't got all the solutions in my hands. That's uh, for the future of physics to figure out how exactly the rules are uh, at that small distance scale. Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay, uh, according to my records, now there is a question from Samir. Samir, I can. Um, I, okay, you can. You can speak. Yes. Hi. So maybe I could just uh, ask Emma in more detail what I was trying to say at the end of his talk. So again, I'm really very happy that you made everything very clear. Like this is your action. You're starting with just ordinary gravity, and you do not need any string theory or any unexplained effects. So let me then make the following claim and then say where I think that uh, what you're doing may be going wrong. So let me make the following claim. I just take one plus one dimensional gravity plus scalar fields. That's the simplest situation where you have been working. Take your JT gravity plus few scalar fields and you are in the Lorentzian section. Let's not go Euclidean. That only causes confusions to me. And you put the whole thing in a computer and do the path integral. Just make a lattice of it. There are people who actually do lattice you know, triangulations of gravity. Let's say we give it to this person and he's so good with his computer, he does it. I think you do that, you will simply get the answer that Hawking got. You will get the quanta outside. You will have the entangled partners inside. There are no fuzz balls in this situation because I don't have the extra dimension in Brady physics. You will actually get Hawking's answer is what I would claim. And you could disagree with that. And now this is the full path integral. I'm not making any saddle point or anything, right? So then I can ask, why are you getting a different answer for this situation? And I think that something has gone wrong with what you're saying about the saddle. Firstly, in the saddle, the only for Euclidean sections in the Lorentzian section, if you have a slow process where pairs are being created one by one, this kind of process is not dominated by your saddle. So, you know, it just wasn't captured by any saddle at all. So if you come in that direction, it will just be, I think, wrong. And then what is happening is that in the end, by using something that you got from ADS-CFT, you'd like to identify things like the radiation and the island are part of the same entanglement wedge. They should be part of one system. But here I think is a really important difference, which one must keep in mind. In the ADS, everything is right there. So there are physical interactions between the inside of ADS and the boundary. There's a Hamiltonian connection. Physics happens only because of Hamiltonians, not because of entanglement. In the black hole, the radiation has gone very far out. There is no Hamiltonian between the black hole and the radiation. All I see from these formulae that people write down where they add the entanglement entropy, make a generalized entropy and maximize it, I think it's all wrong. I think all that is being done is you're defining something where the area plus the entanglement is a quantity you want to look at. If you say that quantity will always be maximized, wow. it's it always just equal to saying that the entropy of the black hole can never be more than Bekenstein. But then you've put in what you want because all paradox is that in the Lorentzian section, you can make an entropy more than Beckett's time. Okay? So I'm just uh, afraid that you're just probably just going in a circle because as you said very beautifully in your talk, you're putting no input other than just one plus one quantum gravity plus scalar fields. Let's put them in a computer. Let's not make any saddle point, any replica trick, anything. Because those just cause confusions. And I think the saddle point doesn't dominate this process anyway. And if you put in a computer, are you really, which kind of paths is what I was trying to ask you, will change Hawking's answer. Will something very dramatic happen in the inside, inside being up to 4M, which Hawking didn't expect? Or will something very dramatic happening to connect the lattice points inside 
all the way out to infinity by wormholes what paths will contribute which hawking did not take into account which might give what you want so i thought there would be none but i could be wrong so that's what, that was my question to you forget the subtle point just talk about what the computer person will see when he put all the paths from beginning to end in a big computer what's the new thing he will see that hawking did not see okay uh, thanks thanks for that question so first of all you said okay put this uh put the calculation inside a computer but you also said don't use the replica trick absolutely um, so i'm trying to understand what that means are you saying extract the density matrix and then just compute trace row log row in the computer yes so first make the state i was actually stopping at the state if you want to make the density matrix you can do that but just make the complete state and look at the quanta outside and you can make the density matrix if you want but first i just want the complete state okay, because so the computer will spit out the state the first comment is i don't know how to compute row okay i actually don't know how to do that i don't think the theory is i don't think the gravity path integral plus matter um, is actually able to do that to, uh, as in th that it's able to co to construct for you all the matrix elements of the density matrix okay so that's that's one thing so that's one comment. Um, the amazing thing is that it seems that while gravity doesn't know about the matrix elements, it can compute traces of the density matrix, or, or, or rather traces of powers of the density matrix. Okay, that, that's, that's the takeaway here. Um, uh, there, in, in some simple two-dimensional models, you can do the full calculation without restricting the saddle points. And, and um, well, you, you, you still have to ignore subleading effects, which make the calculation impossible. But um, um, let's see. Yes, that's, that's right. Th th this was mostly done in this other paper uh, by the Stanford group. But you can do the full calculation. And, and the thing that I've reported is the result. It's, we are not. Um, Putting in, um, well, the fact that the Bekenstein, I agree that in previous work, or rather, um, um, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, as you said, is suggestive that the black hole has a finite number of degrees of freedom. But I would, I would say that, so that was lore the, in the past, but it has been reproduced, it has been shown to be the case in the sense that. You try to overfill the black hole, but then you compute the entropy in this careful way, and, and you can't. You always hit the ceiling, which is the Bekenstein knocking entropy. I, I'm just trying to emphasize that that's a result, not an input. So let me just ask again, because I deny something I did not understand. Because when I read the papers, I do not find it as a result. I find a circular path. So can I just ask maybe more clearly? Okay, let, you... let me make questions short so that I can address the point immediately. Okay, very good. So let me first ask the following. When you started your talk, you said that you will just use a certain path integral and that's your input and everything will come out of that. So I thought that the actual full state of my gravity system, which comes out of it, I can think about it and compute things from it like its entanglements. But mm -hmm. I thought you right now said, no, that gravity path integral, even if you do it properly on a computer is not the real physics. So somehow if you're not looking at, is that what you're saying? It's not the real physics. I cannot compute entanglements with it. No, 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 no. Let's, let's, let's refine the question. So I would say that the, again, the, the path integral cannot be used to, to construct a state, but it can be, but, it, but it, for some mysterious reason, it can be used to compute traces of density matrices, okay? I don't, I don't have, I don't, I don't understand why this is the case. Okay, like the, the 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 answer, like um, by sorry, let, 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 let me let me let me take a, one small step back. If you use the the path integral to prepare a state for you, and then take that state as given, and then use that state to compute entropy, you will find Hawking's result. Right. But if this is a mysterious fact, that if you instead compute traces of density matrices using the path integral, then the result you get is not Hawking's result. That's, that's the main result. So, so I'm glad you said that 
So I'm glad you said what you did because I think it narrows down my confusion very precisely. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that this path integral will not give you the state. I think that is a very clear statement that this input is not what you would not normally a path integral gives you the state because if you have the action, it gives you the state. So somehow you're saying it doesn't give you the state. So somehow this is not what you would call the complete physics or whatever it is. There's some other physics that will give you the complete state. Okay. Then the problem I have is you don't actually know that it computes the density matrix because when you actually start computing the density matrix and I go and look at that calculation, I actually find there's a problem with it because if this is not the state and then I try to take two copies of this and say, this is the density matrix I get from it. If that is not the state, then taking the uh, squaring that state and then taking its trace is actually not the density matrix. So when I went go and look at all the papers, not just yours, but all of them, I find the first look at something which is not the density matrix, compute an answer, they get the answer they like, and then they say, but this density matrix is correct, but came from a state which wasn't the correct state. So it made well, no I, sense. I think, uh, well, well, we don't know if it's correct or not, okay? It's, it's just it, that this prescription, it's, I would still consider it a success that we found a prescription, even though we don't understand it 100%, that gives us results which look like the right answer. That's that's that, that that's the extent of it. It looked like um, uh, this density matrix. The yeah. The, let, let me let me just keep it at that. So so I, so it seemed to me that in the end you were just saying that because the Gibbons Hawking entropy is finite, which we have known of course for a long time, the black hole has a finite number of states. And therefore, you can never have an information paradox because it saturates there. In the end, what you did was correlation functions in the Euclidean section, whose analytic continuations you are seeing in the Lorentzian section, but they're really analytic continuations from the Euclidean. And there, the correlation functions have the same input as the entropy. They can just never diverge. So the essence of what you guys did, it seemed to me, was repeat the argument that because the given Hawking entropy is finite, if that's the real counter state, you assume it's the real counter states, there can never be an information paradox. I think the paradox is the fact that the Gibbons Hawking entropy differs from the actual count of states in the Lorentzian section, where the Lorentzian section, there are infinitely many states. So somehow I think none of this was actually addressing the information problem. It seemed to me you went in a circle. I'm, so, I'm no, sorry no, you, to say you, that, you, but- you, you made a claim. You just made a, you just made a strong claim. You just okay. said that the number of states and then the, you said, I think this, the number of states in the Lorentzian section is infinite. What calculation did you do to, to, to confirm that? I would take your action, which you wrote down and actually put that in a computer and draw the good slice with the black hole being fed and evaporated for a long time, the standard calculation of the information paradox. And I would find I get an infinite number of states uh, on the inside of the slice and tangled with the outside. So I can make a bag of gold slice kind of state, which has an arbitrary amount of entanglement, which is more than S. Beckenstein. So the fact that this entropy is more than S. Beckenstein is the paradox. So if I actually have any assumption which says that the Gibbons Hawking answer limits the states, I have gone in a circle. I've assumed what I want. That's all I was saying. I would say that there's a, there's a, there's an assumption there. Um, you've you've um, well that answer that you the answer that you just described of of, of of getting a bag of gold like situation, you've restricted to a single saddle of that path integral. How it's it's not clear that the well, you need an argument to say that the that that in this calculation the other saddles are not important. And so it's, it's not clear, it's not clear to me that, that you've shown that. That's what I was asking you. I go to the, I put the whole thing in the computer. I try to compute the state. Of course, you're saying there's that's not the, give, give me the state. But whatever you want to do with that path integral, I don't think there are any other saddles. So that's what I'm asking you in the Lorentzian section. What do you think will be the path integral configurations? What will they look like? Which Hawking forgot. So the semi-classical ones are small fluctuations around the semi-classical metric. But if there are any other configurations, are they like wormholes that join the inside to the far outside? What are they like? Forget the saddle. Tell me what configurations are going to contribute because I don't think there are any. Yeah, I, for, 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 this, for preparing the state, I don't have an answer for you. But for computing trace of density matrix, density matrix to some powers, then I do have that answer. But that, that's, that's, the, that's the only answer I can provide. Uh, thanks very much. I mean, I think it certainly became much more clearer to me what all you do, but uh, we can discuss later in private. Perhaps. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I remember there was a, a question from Gerard. I don't know if Gerard is still here with us. 
uh, maybe not. Yes, I'm still here. Oh, oh yes. So I remember there was a, your, a question from you for Samir. Uh, I don't know if you still want to, to ask that question. Gerard. Yes. Uh, I, do, do you still have the question you want to pose to Samir? I thought I did. Um, I thought I already asked the question, uh, or maybe not. I did not have a specific question to Samir, no. Oh, okay, sorry. Then maybe my record is wrong. Oh, my man. Well, the question is also about the purity of. Uh, um, of the Hawking radiation and also the question about the firewalls was uh, I would like him to, to, to look at my approach where the firewalls come, uh, uh, disappear very, quite automatically. Uh, and uh, just because I'm sure to make a one-to-one -one mapping of the uh, points in space for the different coordinates. So the rule is Apparently, it's a new rule which I would impose on any general coordinate transformation. It should be bijective. It should be one to one, not one to two or anything like that, which you would normally get if you're not very careful with the Penrose diagrams. But if it's one to one, it means that uh, the wave function you're looking at is uh, uh, is a good, useful wave function both for a local observer and for a distant observer. Uh, because the local observer sees region one and region two, but so does the distant observer because of the antipolar identification. So that solves a lot of problems in black holes rather than it add any, but you have to take the whole package deal. So uh, you, you can't say, oh, I, I, I take this idea from yours and I reject that one. Then it doesn't work. You have to take the whole lot, which is difficult. Which requires a lot of work, but in, in principle, then you uh, you get a very clean picture, a clean S matrix, a clean resolution to the firewall and the information problems. So, but that's just a, a remark rather than a question. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know any, any anyone else want to comment or ask questions. Hi, I see a question from uh, Elias. Let me unmute you. Elias, are you there again? Yes, yes, thank you, Fabio, thank you. I want to ask something, uh, uh, Ahmed. Uh, hi, Ahmed from Kuwait. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm not very familiar, but the, at, at, the last, at the last slide, you said that you cannot comment on singularity. Am I right? Correct. Uh, okay, I, I, I haven't followed the whole work, but is the reason that we need more work on that or because you are doing this trick with the wormholes because you want to create copies of, of your states? I mean, when you have the wormhole, then you don't bother about the singularity. Where is the singularity? Is this the issue? You are not going to, 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 to see this problem with your construction, with your setup? That's, that's one way to say it. The other way is that um, the location of the island is always far away from the singularity. And so it seems like you're not probing that region. It seems like it's not that relevant for the question of the for question of calculating the entropy of the radiation. That was my comment. But, but, but in any case, you have removed their singularity, am I right? Because you started with your space time, the two dimensional. So it, it was like a cigar, if I, if I understand the witness cigar. So, so, so you just cut the piece because you want to create the copies and you have a wormhole. So the singularity is not there. You have completely removed it. Even if the island was extremely close, you don't see anything, right? No, no, I, I wouldn't say that the, island, the, the singularity is not there. I would say I was just showing a certain section of the space time which did not include the singularity. Okay. But, you can, but you can, if I give you the solution, you can continue to the region where the singularity is, but it just seems like that's not relevant. Okay, thank, thank you, thank you. 
Okay, I see that there is a, a question, I think, from Peter Cameron. Uh, you, you should un unmute. Oh, okay, you, okay, I think you can speak now. Yes, I have a, a simple question for Professor Tehuft. Uh, in space time, where you're talking about uh, time going backwards, if I understand correctly, uh, if we look at it from a quantum level, then, it, then we need three dimensions instead of, of one for time, because we look at quantum phase instead, and, and the phases are independent in the three directions. Uh, so when we look at it that way, then, then what we call time going backwards is, is the difference between left hand and right hand. Uh, uh, it's, it's the chorality, it's, it's uh, what's involved in the weak interaction, I guess. How does that affect your model if, if, you, if you look from that perspective? Um, well, it's imperative to use the CPT theorem. So I want laws of physics not to change if you go from one point to the other point in space time. So, um, and whereas you go to the PT transformation of, uh, uh, of your states, so because of that, I also need C to ensure that the laws of nature don't change. The C wasn't given, so I can just put it in to ensure that I have CPT invariance. And then uh, everything goes smoothly. Um, so, so that uh, region, in the region two time running backwards, the only difficulty there is the factor I in the equations of quantum field theory as Written point, Dr. Me, and I think it was quite right that if you look at the commutators between the field and its time derivative, you get a factor i. If you look at the field and the time derivative on in the other region, that time goes to minus time, so it looks like i goes to minus i. So, how do you solve the problem? And the answer was uh, that you have to replace creation and annihilation operators with each other so that. Um, uh, uh, so that the energy also changes signs if you go from region one to region two. Now, normally all particles have positive energy, so you can't change sign of the, of the Hamiltonian, it's very important. So the only option you then have is to say, well, I add a lot of energy that I can't see uh, that replaces the vacuum of one state to a, a completely filled state in the other side. And um, uh, so that uh, you can now compare states where you have very, very many particles minus one, and then you can, you can understand how that still has positive energy, but, but it allows you to do the CPT transformation to negative time and, uh, uh, and then not negative energy, but the maximum minus the energy. For the other particles. That creates a problem. It could be considered to be a problem that if you have so many particles sitting in a very small volume, that should have a gigantic gravitational effect. But yes, I just stipulated that I'm not going to add the gravitational force to the particles in the bulk. I only use the gravitational force when I the boundary condition from future to past boundary, past uh, horizon. So then gravity comes in that way, and that way you can basically cure the theory again um, for this difficulty. It also means that I'm ignoring the ingoing particles by uh, this um, by the rule that uh, ingoing particles and outgoing particles are mapped to each other by the Fourier transformation. I'm not sure I'm answering the question, but this is, uh, as, as I explained that the, the program I have in mind to use in understanding black holes is, uh, is a package deal. You have to buy everything or nothing. There's nothing you can get part of. Thank you. I, I understand where to look now uh, at CPT. Yes. I have one other question with, uh, Kip Thorne talks about a black hole when, when you have the binary collapse that it gets a kick, it goes flying away at, at high speed. Uh, if, if you take your model and reduce it to the quantum level and say there's two photons coming out instead of one, 
then there would be no kick. Um, well, as I said, I haven't solved everything. I only think what I've done is I've, I've got the zeroth order approximation of how everything behaves. In that approximation, the in and outgoing particles are very light compared to the black hole itself. I believe that to, that to be the most important case that the outgoing particles that, that leave the black hole are all Hawking particles, which are very light in general, very tiny, very uh, uh, large uh, as wave functions, Compton wavelength is comparable to the size of the hole, so they're, they're very light. And um, uh, therefore, I only take the ingoing particles to be in that domain. That's the situation I can handle. I cannot handle very, very large and heavy particles going into the black hole. As you say, if you, if you have a black hole capturing something light, it may be kicked away. That is uh, well, physically easy to understand, but technically, of course, very hard. Uh, so the people who do LIGO and Virgo uh, simulations, they know exactly how to do this. But uh, to add that to the quantum pictures, of course, quite an art all by itself. And that's the kind of problem I haven't solved. Uh, OK, OK. There, there is a question by Lucas Maldone, I think. Thank you. Okay, I have a question for Professor Tov, just a curiosity. I admit I don't have control of your uh, solution, but uh, I wanted to ask you, what's the difference uh, with um, the Israel description of black hole evaporation? In some sense, it looks similar to me, in a sense, in both cases, you have the static black hole, and uh, also there, the Artolokin vacuum, uh, say, it's you can see as a pure state in the double uh, in the double space you know uh, where you have uh, modes uh, tensor tilde modes in in fact the that procedure is the purification that you that you do to pass from a mixed state to a pure state which is uh, usual in a thermofield dynamics so in uh, some respects they are very similar uh, what's the difference um, I'm not so sufficiently familiar with uh, Israel's uh, approach, I can't really say. Um, uh, Israel uh, showed in uh, 1976 that uh, uh, black hole evaporation uh, is a very strict relation with thermofield dynamics of so Umezawa and Takahashi. Oh, yeah, yeah that, that I refer to that paper. In that case, the vacuum state it lives in a doubled you have doubling of degrees of freedom and lives on the double state. And the degrees of freedom are clearly one from the both sides of uh, the black hole horizon that you showed the, from the two asymptotic regions, essentially. Well, as I ex explained, uh, I identify the two sides of the horizon, which means that there's no interior region of the black hole, there are just the two sides. And the, the way to identify is you could just say, okay, we have the black, same black hole seen twice. That doesn't quite work because that would generate cusp singularities. In order to avoid the cusp singularities, I, I identify the right hand side of the Penrose diagram, not as the left hand side of the, of the Penrose diagram without any further change. No, I go to the antipode. So I also go to the opposite values of theta and phi, the, ang the angles in order to avoid the cusp singularity. That generates relatively interesting physics. For instance, it causes the Hawking particles to be entangled. So the Hawking particles coming out of one hemisphere being entangled with the Hawking particles going out of the other hemisphere. So, so you see that this gives new phenomena which are by themselves interesting to, uh, to study. But, yeah, but I think there's no contradiction in the sense that uh, also in standard thermofield dynamics, you can see uh, these tilde modes, which are the modes on the other side of the horizon, as the holes, for example, in a system uh, exchanging with a thermal buff, for example. So in a sense, they are like the antiparticles, and you have a CPT relation, which uh, relates your mode. Uh, from one side to another. You have, C I think, you CP or CPT transformation, if I figure out. I don't see a contradiction. Well, these the thermodynamics arguments are basically still classical physics. 
uh, that is, we say, classical physics, where you, you regard Hawking particles as a property of the horizon. In my case, that's a little bit more complicated because the Hawking particles are not a property of one point on the horizon, but on the two identified points at the antipode. So if you take two points, one point being at the antipode of the other, and mm -hmm. the particles here and the particles here are all uh, uh, entangled. Uh, at the horizon itself, they are identified, but we can never go to that point. The outside observer doesn't see the points on the horizon. So it doesn't see that these things are completely identified. But what the outside observer will see is that the Hawking particles are entangled. They are much related to each other at other opposite sides of the uh, black hole. Anyway, I think, uh, I think that your uh, approach could be some way, it, at least I think it's consistent with the Israel description of 1976. There will be, uh, have been others long ago, also was uh, Sanchez and Whiting who, uh, who proposed a, a similar identification of opposite points. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, at this point, uh, uh, maybe I should uh, give the word to Alfredo because we are almost uh, at, the, at the starting of the next, next session. Uh, Alfredo, are you there? Yes, can you see me? I took, <laughs> I, uh, I'm oh, sitting Yes, here. yes, uh, you're not, okay, you are in the other. Now, okay. now I see, now I see, okay, okay. <laughs> now we have some I have technical issue with my camera, so I have to stay here. Okay, so the chair is yours. Okay. All right. So thank you very much. Uh, I think we have uh, Juan Maldacena already with us, and I, I made him co-host. So, uh, we, okay. Yes. Uh, yes, I'm here. I will I, uh, share the screen. Hi, nice. To Nice to meet thank you. Thank you for, for uh, accepting our invitation and uh, yeah, and thank you for inviting me. We are eager to to listen to your talk. You share the okay. screen. Yeah, you can see it now. Yes. Okay, wonderful. I will warn you, I will warn you uh, when the, there is five minutes left for the talk and five for the question. So you have ten minutes at that point. I say five plus five left. Okay. So how much time do I have till? You have 30 plus five, 30 minutes 30 for the talk, plus five for the okay, questions. Fine. If you well, want to take so... 35, then you can postpone the question for the, the later discussion. We have a- Fine, perfect, yeah. So mm -hmm. going on afterwards. Okay, yeah, so, and, and feel free to ask questions during the talk if you want. Uh, I'm, so I will be talking about string size black holes. Um, my talk will be uh, mostly a review. So I will review what is known about string size black holes and uh, previous work. Uh, I will discuss the connection to highly excited strings. I will um, discuss uh, an interesting solution by Horowitz and Polchinski um, that describe this, um, these highly excited strings, including the gravitational interaction in four dimensions. And then I'll discuss a 2D black hole string background, so as an exact uh, black hole solution. And then we'll discuss how one can get the 2D black hole from large D black holes. And I also will discuss some work in progress with Yimin Cheng, whose picture is here. Um, and so we we try to understand this connection to large deep black holes, uh, including uh, in the stringy regime. And we'll discuss how um, this implies that when the black hole gets to a certain temperature, uh, you have um, gas of strings uh, emerging out of a black hole. Uh, and if I have time, I'll discuss a bit the chaos exponent. So we will be considering a weakly coupled string theory. Uh, so the string coupling will be small and we'll set the string length to one. Um, so I will not write uh, the string length and then G Newton is G squared. And the, therefore the Planck length is much less than one. So we are in a regime where the size of strings is much bigger than the Planck size. And that's uh, the regime of weakly coupled string theory. So we will discuss mainly the bosonic string, but similar statements hold for type two and heterotic superstrings. So uh, first let's discuss a highly excited free string. So if you have uh, a string that is oscillating in flat space, um, this type of strings, when you quantize them, 
uh, in the free theory. By free, I mean uh, ignoring the interactions, ignoring, for example, the gravitational interaction. Then uh, their masses are uh, given by this formula, where n is an integer. Um, and the entropy uh, to lead, so for large n and large masses, is given by this uh, simple formula. Um, the size of the strings as it's oscillates, so their mass, of course, increases as you increase n. But uh, you can view the string as a kind of random walk uh, whose length is square root of n that gives the mass. And then the size of the random walk would be called like the square root of that, would be, which would be n to the one quarter. So it's a relatively, uh, so it's an object whose size is growing. Uh, from this formula, you can calculate the, the temperature using the standard thermodynamic relation. You get its four pi, and this is uh, sometimes called the Hagedorn temperature. Uh, remember, we are working in the Hagedorn inverse temperature. So remember, we are working in units where the string length is set to one. Um, so in particular, this implies that the thermal ensemble will be defined for strings only when the uh, inverse temperature is larger than this value, uh, or the temperature is lower than this special temperature. Because otherwise, uh, the entropy factor would dominate over the thermal suppression factor. So we are only always going to be considering uh, this regime where the temperature is bigger. Um, now that those are just highly excited strings. Let's compare. Let's discuss now black holes. So imagine you have a black hole now in the context of string theory. So that black hole will be a good uh, representation of a solution as long as the size of the black hole is much bigger than the string length, which we had set to one. So this is the size. I mean the Schwarzschild radius. And you can compute the leading order string corrections or alpha prime corrections, and they were computed in those papers. Um, and you can ask what happens uh, with the black hole as it approaches the string size. Does it cease to exist? Uh, does it, uh, well, exactly what happens? Um, now, it's useful to uh, plot the entropy of the free string and the entropy of the black holes. Uh, this plot, I think, was first made in this paper. Um, so the black hole, first the entropy of the string um, was linear in the mass. So we have mass on the horizontal axis. So that's the free string approximation. And we cannot trust it for very high masses because um, then the interactions become important. Um, uh, that could become important. For black holes, similarly, we can trust it for, very high, for relatively high masses, but not for low masses. Okay. And if, but if you naively extrapolate both curves, they, they cross at a point where uh, the size of the black hole would be of order one, and the mass uh, of both objects would be of order one over g squared. So one question is uh, whether this is a smooth transition or not, or what type of transition do we have at this point? So that's one question you can ask. But from this curve, it seems plausible that perhaps you have the black hole for a while. If an evaporating black hole comes down this curve as it evaporates, it will transition into uh, into strings because that's the most entropic uh, configuration. That's a naive answer, but this is this answer is naive because we cannot trust the dotted parts of this curve. Um, so there is this question of where there is a smooth transition between black holes and highly excited strings. The question is interesting because of the following motivation. So in the string picture, the microstates are explicit. So we know exactly which are the states that are giving rise to the entropy of the string. Um, on the other hand, uh, for a string, there is no, no region similar to the black hole interior. For the black holes, there is an interior, but there are no obvious microstates. And so the idea is that perhaps understanding this transition better might uh, help you connect these two things. I mean, I will not connect these two things in the talk. I will um, just, uh, this is just a, a longer term motivation and a reason why people also previously have studied this problem. Now, a, a little preview or summary of what is believed to happen is the following. So uh, for d equal to four, so if we have a black hole in four dimensions uh, for non-compact directions, there might be some extra small compact directions. Uh, then um, what we expect to happen is that there are some corrections to the free string picture, and there might be a smooth connection between the string and the black hole. That we don't know. But there is an interesting solution here correcting the free string picture that I'll discuss in a second. And for d much bigger than 4, then uh, we think that the uh, black hole phase continues for a while um, and will 
end here at the point where the temperature is actually a bit higher than the high temperature, at least asymptotically. And I will discuss uh, in detail, so part of our new work is to understand in detail what happens, happens in this region. But th that will come later in the talk. I'll first uh, review some uh, previous work just to put these things in context. So uh, I'll first start with one more comment on strings at finite temperature. So introducing uh, an interesting formalism to treat uh, strings at finite temperature. So um, as any other theory that we consider at finite temperature, we can compactify the time direction, uh, the Euclidean time direction on a circle uh, whose size is the inverse temperature. And the new thing that happens in string theory is that the, you can have a string that winds uh, that circle. Um, now the mass of this, so this string bound on the circle will behave from the point of view of the rest of the dimensions as a massive particle, as a particle um, whose mass is uh, proportional to so mass squared is proportional to the size of the circle. That would be the naive answer. But there is a correction due to the Casimir energy on the string um, that is negative. And so you can have a situation that when beta goes to special value, which is beta H is actually the same value uh, we discussed before, the, the, the so-called high on temperature, then these modes becomes massless. Um, of course, the fact that the Casimir energy and the entropy of the string at uh, high energies are is correlated, it's uh, not a coincidence, it's just a consequence of the so-called Cardi formula. Um, but the interesting point is that when beta is close to beta H, let's say this is uh, beta is still bigger than beta H, so uh, we can, uh, this mode becomes light, and we can make a field theory approximation as, a, as opposed to treating the full string field theory. We, we can just do a, a quantum field theory approximation. And um, because this mass will be much smaller than the string scale if beta is very close to beta h. Now, this, th this is good because it allows you to uh, take into account the self interactions. And this, the most important self interaction uh, is the one of gravity. Uh, and so we can write down an, an action which includes gravity plus this uh, light field. Okay, and we can ignore the rest of the fields which are not light. Okay, in principle, we also have to take into account the dilaton, which is also a massless field, but that's included within the gravity degrees of freedom. So we have a simple action for the thermodynamics of strings, um, and this simple action leads to an interesting solution in uh, d equal to four. Um, uh, this is the so-called uh, self-gravitating string. And if we go back to the diagram we were making in terms of entropy and mass, it's describing the first corrections as we go away from the free string limit. So it's a localized solution in three spatial dimensions. So in three spatial dimensions, we have an SO3 symmetric solution. This blue region in indicates the size of the localized, uh, this winding mode has a profile. Uh, centered around the origin and decaying at infinity. Um, and it describes a self-gravitating string in thermodynamic equilibrium. So this Euclidean solution is completely uh, smooth and spherically symmetric. And uh, the Lorentzian interpretation of this solution is a gas of oscillating strings in random, random ways. Okay. Um, it has a property that as you increase the, the mass, the size actually decreases, so the gravitational force uh, Put, puts it down and makes it smaller. Um, its size scales like one over g square m. And it should be bigger than one in order to trust the approximation. That's because we uh, have assumed that all gradients are, are relatively small compared to the string scale. Um, so therefore, it, uh, this approximation breaks down before we get to this uh, correspondence point region. However, it gives us uh, an interesting solution. And one reason I find this solution interesting is, um, is that it has an interesting entropy. Well, I forgot to mention that the temperature decreases as the mass increases. So that's uh, the same as what happens uh, for a black hole also. Um, so this, uh, this solution is a completely smooth Euclidean solution. And it has uh, an entropy which you can calculate by varying the temperature in the classical action. So varying the size of the circle. And the entropy is of order one over g string squared. So because we all we are doing is just solving classical equations. So the entropy will be proportional to one over g newton or one over h, one over h bar. So the, the overall coefficient of the action. 
And when we calculate the entropy, the only term in the classical action that will matter are the terms who, which have explicit and explicit dependence on the temperature. And they only appear in the mass of the sky field. Uh, so when we take the derivative, all other terms uh, will vanish due to the equations of motion, but this term will remain and will give us a formula for the entropy, classical formula uh, for the entropy of this form. Um, and so you can calculate it using the solution and uh, the entropy is linear in the mass and then it has a correction which goes like m cubed. Um, so yeah, so the, I, it, it's remarkable that you get an entropy which is uh, sort of similar to what happens for black hole entropy that you get uh, um, an entropy proportional to one over g squared from a, from a smooth uh, classical solution. Okay. Um, now I We'll now mention one point about um, black holes and winding condensate. So it looks like uh, the black hole and this uh, term solution for strings looks different because in the case of the uh, this solution here, we had this uh, condensate of windings. Um, and one point I would like to make is that that uh, is also present in the black hole phase, uh, uh, but it's uh, very small. So if you have, you can calculate the the wave function for the winding mode, so for a string that winds here, it can be calculated by considering a Euclidean world sheet that wraps the, the cigar, and it gives uh, a winding, uh, it gives a, a web that decays, uh, decays when you go away from the horizon. It decays rapidly when the temperature uh, is very low. Okay. So that's always present, and for any black hole, and it can be interpreted as a kind of thermal atmosphere of strings that. Um, Surround the black hole. It's again an effect which is appears at the classical level uh, in string theory, formally of order one over g squared. Uh, and people have tried to argue that this would reproduce the area term for the for the black hole, but uh, I don't think it's a very clear calculation or controllable calculation, at least to my knowledge, um, because it's uh, very small and it's very concentrated near the horizon. So well, that's suggest maybe could give rise to the area, but uh, this has not been derived in a, in a, in a good way, I think. Deriving it, deriving it uh, clearly would be deriving not only the area, but all the corrections that, uh, that arise from um, like wall-like corrections from higher derivative terms. So the picture in four dimensions is uh, roughly like this. So there is some uh, inverse temp. So here I'm not, was not plotting the entropy of the function of the mass, but the inverse temperature. So we have uh, this, uh, linear relation for the case of black holes, so that's in blue. And for this, for a free string, we would have just a constant value, uh, but this uh, solution gives rise to something that goes up a little bit. Um, and, uh, and then when we stop trusting it, and uh, here in green, uh, I just plotted uh, just uh, some random interpolating function that agrees with, uh, with the first corrections in both places. This is what it, the, the, the full answer might look like, but we don't really, we cannot really trust the green line. Uh, so in conclusion is that in D equal to four, there might be an interpolating world sheet conformal field theory that connects the, the, two, the two configurations. Um, and that was part of the message. So now um, I will change uh, gears a little bit and we'll discuss uh, another uh, black hole, well, a black hole solution, which is exactly solvable in string theory and which we can solve even when the curvature is for the string size. And that's uh, the so-called cigar or SL2 module one black hole. It's a two-dimensional black hole and uh, it arises, it can, it's solvable because you can view it as a gauge uh, WCW model and it can be analyzed through uh, certain current algebra techniques. I won't discuss those techniques. You just have to trust me that it can be many quantities can be calculated exactly. Um, so roughly speaking, at least when the radius is very large, so this, this solution comes with one free parameter, uh, which we will hear called K, some parameter that appears in the algebra, but this parameter K roughly speaking sets the radius of the solution, sets the overall size of uh, this solution. Um, so this is the form of the solution when K is very large, where you can solve it using gravity, uh, but the algebraic description is true, is correct for any k. So it's a solution that uh, has roughly this shape and 
in addition, uh, there is a field called the dilaton, which uh, measures the, amount, the size of the string coupling, which has some finite value at the tip and then decays as you go to infinity. Um, and, it, uh, yeah, and that finite value at the tip uh, is uh, given the black hole entropy. So the, the dilaton comes from, if there are extra dimensions, it might come from the area of the extra dimensions. So that's the same as the usual entropy Bekenstein formula. Um, now, the you, K is related to the central charge of this two-dimensional field theory. Uh, it's a property of the theory far away, where that depends only on the value of the gradient of the dilaton far away. Um, and uh, well, it's related by these two formulas. I'm not explaining where they come from. You would have just to trust that uh, they can be calculated exactly. And then and the radius of the circle at infinity is again, exactly given by uh, this formula. So you can think of K essentially as related to setting the radius uh, of the circle at infinity. <clears throat> and then that uh, will determine the central charge of this two-dimensional field theory. Uh, alternatively, you could think that uh, there are some extra dimensions that uh, set the, depending on their number and exactly the spaces that are involved, they would set the central charge and that determines this quantity and that determines the radius of the circle. So if you think of K as being fixed, uh, just having a fixed theory, uh, then the radius of the circle is also fixed. So temperature is fixed. So that's something somewhat unusual for this black hole. Now, one aspect of this black hole is that you can calculate uh, precisely the this winding condensate we were talking about. Um, you can, in this case, calculate it for any any temperature, any value of the size of the circle. And you find something uh, interesting. So you find that um, the winding condensate, so this is some field and uh, generically, we expected it to decay as we go away from the origin. And indeed, in this case, it always decays. But if you look at the canonically normalized field, so the, the thing that, so if you take, um, there was a factor phi to the minus two phi, which is changing in space, and then this gradient, and you define a new field by absorbing uh, this factor, then um, this new field chi hat actually would decay when the radius is very large. But for a critical radius, it stops decaying and uh, starts increasing. And so the solution changes qualitatively at k equal to 3. So this is an example where, uh, in effect, in string theory, it changes qualitatively the physics of the solution. Um, and the change is that the, this winding condensate changes from being localized near the tip to being essentially sourced at infinity. Or it, it really what is happening is that um, there is a um, a large contribution to the entropy given by the formula we saw some some moment ago for the entropy as a function of the winding condensate that comes from uh, this region here. So for k bigger than three, that contribution is finite, but when k is three, that contribution becomes infinite. Um, so some conclusions are that uh, this black hole picture and intuition are good uh, for this two-dimensional black hole when beta is sufficiently large or k is sufficiently big. Um, and when K approaches three or the temperature approaches this special value, this large winding condensate emerges and this atmosphere of strings extends all the way to infinity. And um, it was suggested before that perhaps we could interpret the solution for K less than three as some kind of condensate of uh, strings only with no black hole, um, but uh, we will not get into this position. And it was also suggested recently, well, and some other, also some of my previous papers, but maybe in, in all cases, we have two alternative pictures. Um, so now I let me review one more idea. Uh, so this is uh, the idea that a large D uh, Schwarzschild black hole um, can um, be approximated as a big sphere uh, times the two dimensional black hole. So this is a D minus two dimensional sphere times to the, to the two-dimensional black hole that we've been discussing before. Um, so let me just review how that works. So we start from, this was suggested by these people, then Parango, Miller, and Tanabe. And the idea is the following. So we have a d-dimensional Schwarzschild black hole. And this is just the standard metric of the Schwarzschild solution. And we have, um, we have these functions uh, that look like this. Um, and the key point is that these functions for large d vary very rapidly as you move away from r naught, you move r a little bit, uh, this function varies very rapidly. And so that will lead to a large curvature in these two dimensions. Um, 
and so on. But so if you focus on that on that part, so you write the you, you can write the the radius uh, in this way, and then after uh, change of variables, the um, so after this change of variables, the R and T component of the metric becomes just the same as the R and T components of the the two-dimensional black hole that we discussed before, where now k is given in terms of the Schwarzschild radius uh, divided by d. So a k of order one corresponds to a radius which uh, is of order d. So for values of k of order one, which is when interesting stringy things are happening, the size of the sphere is uh, very big. So we can uh, neglect somehow uh, the, the stringy effects on the sphere because the sphere radius is uh, large for large d. And um, this, so r to the d to some power, well, actually r to the d minus two, except d minus three, gives, uh, can be viewed as uh, giving uh, the value of the d Latin in two dimensions. So it's just the area of the uh, sphere that varies as we vary the radius. So the radius uh, varies slowly, but the area varies with the strength, let's say, of order one. And that Again, this variation. So here we just used this equation once more and made a large d approximation, and so we recover the form also that the dilaton field had in uh, that the dilaton field had in the two-dimensional black hole. Okay, so um, so that's the same as the two-dimensional black hole, but this derivation was valid when k is much bigger than one because we just simply used uh, gravity equations. Um, so, so now uh, what we've been doing was we were well. You have five plus five minutes. Okay, wonderful. So we were revisiting these ideas, and uh, we wanted to extend this largely observation to small values of k or stringy curvatures, and also use it to make a more precise statement for Schwarzschild black holes in twenty-six and d dimensions in the approximation that those numbers are much bigger than one. So in order to extend that idea, uh, the the idea is to um, go beyond the gravity approximation and think of this as a, a two-dimensional conformal field theory. And we think of the sphere part of the, uh, of the conformal field theory as approximated by, uh, as giving an approximate conformal field theory with a slowly varying radius. And its central charge can be computed using the large radius formulas. You get this in terms of the curvature of the sphere. Um, here we are just expressing the curvature of the sphere for large d. And when you put in the value of the horizon, uh, you get uh, this expression, you match it with the central charge of the 2D black hole, and this determines K. And then K also is uh, fixed by the temperature. So once we know the temperature, um, so we find the relationship here between R0 and the temperature, which is different than the relation you find uh, solving Einstein's equations. So if you solve Einstein's equations, you find also these relations, but without the minus two. So the whole difference is this minus two. Um, Okay, and this uh, you can check against the leading order correction in a one over k expansion uh, compared to the previous answers, and of course, uh, and it does match uh, with those corrections. Um, so as we vary the size of the horizon or not, so we're varying the mass of the black hole, and we are varying this parameter k that was appearing in the cigar theory. Um, and when you approach this critical value of three, uh, which corresponds to uh, this this temperature, uh, beta over two pi equal to square root of three, um, you have this uh, winding condensate that expands uh, far from the horizon, making a large contribution to the mass, and the black hole gets dominated by these highly excited strings. So you can picture this as a black hole with uh, some cloud of strings, so that extends uh, beyond the horizon to some distance uh, away from the horizon. So we get the picture roughly like this. Um, okay, so what we are doing here is describing this uh, region. So the black hole can be, uh, the temperature of the black hole can uh, be increased uh, a bit more than the than beta over two pi, which is two. So this is slightly less than two. And the black hole continues to be at least locally stable. And um, at this point, uh, it, uh, you get this condensate of strings and the black hole uh, ceases to be up even approximately thermodynamically stable. And we don't know what the uh, full real-time dynamics of this is. So one possibility is just this black hole somehow explodes into 
discuss the strings, but well, that's just a speculation. The, what I discuss here is not a speculation. Um, now, uh, we can discuss another computation we can do with this description, which is the calculation of the so-called chaos exponent that has to do with the scattering process near the black hole horizon. Uh, this, this type of scattering processes that uh, Toft and Ray discussed uh, many years ago can be interpreted, interpreted as uh, quantum chaos in the description dual to the black holes, in the quantum description of black holes. Um, and um, the, the exponent has to do with the spin of the exchange particle. And in this case, uh, we have to identify the right particle. We think the right particle as an algebraic description, I'm not discussing this, but these symbols are symbols that make sense when you think about the currents and uh, the exact description of the model. So you have to identify a particular state, and once you identify the right state, you can calculate its um, you can calculate its uh, conformal dimension, and then you set it to one. So this is the sort of equation of motion in string theory, and uh, that allows you to compute the spin s and uh, therefore, the, that chaos exponent, which goes to one, which is the result for gravity. And there is a, you can expand here, uh, the one over k correction agrees with some previous calculation. And then you get, well, the full profile in principle. Um, okay, so in conclusions, uh, we discussed how the large D approximation for Schwarzschild black holes leads to this regard geometry. And this geometry can have a string scale curvature and we can still solve it. Um, and we used it to explore the geometry of a black hole as we approach and surpass this locally at least the higher temperature. At a critical size or temperature, the black hole develops this large stringy halo or atmosphere. And we do not think that the black hole makes sense for lower masses. Um, okay, so there are some questions for the future, whether these similar large D approximations can be used for other spring scale black holes, like charged black holes. And also what we can say about the gravitational picture for the microstates and the black hole interior. Okay, thank you. I think you're muted. Alfredo, you're muted. Now I got them. Okay. Hi. Go ahead. Hi. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Juan, for the nice talk. I have, do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. I have, uh, I have a naive question, which is probably also slightly broad. So if yeah. I 4D black holes. So let's yeah. say I think of a Schwarzschild black hole. Yeah. Whatever we compute in effective field theory is something that's considering string length over the Schwarzschild radius being zero. Yes. Now, if I think of perturbatively computing corrections that come from string length over Schwarzschild radius, and if I look at perturbative corrections, is there any observable, any physical quantities, amplitudes, where you expect to see certain behavior that's yes, yes, yes. So the, the, simpl the simplest correction so is to the thermodynamics of black holes. So you can, uh, there will be a correction to black hole thermodynamics, which goes like one over, like uh, strings, string length squared divided by Schwarzschild radius squared. And, and do you expect to see something in scattering amplitudes, for example? Uh, yeah, you also expect to see something in scattering amplitudes, uh, but that's a more complicated observable. Um, so, for example, you did that scattering amplitude we, we saw at the very end uh, that had to do with the chaos exponent, that is also corrected. So, ah, I see. so let me say these ones, this uh, rate of the processes, they are... Um, and, and do you, you get some answer in gravity and the, the corrections due to string theory give corrections uh, to, to this. So, that in string theory, you would have lambda equal to 2 pi, and this would be multiplied by 1 plus 1 where the string length square divided by the radius of the black hole square. Uh, and the corrections arising from string theory, are they known? Uh, yeah, yeah, the first correction is, uh, you can write it in general. I see, I see, thanks. For, for this quantity, yeah. Thanks. This was done in a paper by Stanford and Schenker. So yeah, yeah Schenker, Yeah, thanks. Okay, is there any other question? We still have a couple of minutes before moving to the next speaker. Yes, we have a question from Ivano Basile. I don't know if you should be able to unmute yourself. Oh, excuse me, Suga. Hi, hi, sorry. 
excuse me, excuse me. Uh, Ivano Basile came first. So, Ivano, are you there? Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I finally managed to unmute myself. Thanks. <laughs> so, uh, hi, thanks for the, for the very interesting seminar. I, I was wondering, since you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the presence of a stringy, you know, uh, scale, stringy curvatures, yeah. Uh, do you have in mind a way to take into account the corresponding corrections in this uh, business? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the idea, the, so the, the, the first correct, as we were discussed before, the first corrections were computed in both pictures, right? Both in yeah. the string picture and in the, in the black hole picture. And uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's what was uh, discussed. And uh, for D much bigger than four, we can do a little more so we can go not, not only compute, so the first, so you're approaching a stringy black hole from this side, right? You can compute the first correction. And for large D, we can not only compute the first correction, but we can give, go all the way till the black hole ceases to make sense. Um, right, no, I, I mean, I was, I was wondering if um, in that case, all corrections would be equally important. Um, yeah, because it well, would there, all be... there, there are some, yeah, there are very truly stringy corrections like this winding condensate, for example. The, the gas of strings and has to do with the Hawking radiation of strings, etc. Um, so those corrections can be taken into account exactly at large d. So the d right. in order the one over d expansion. Good. So it's it's essentially a, you know you're resumming some corrections while uh, you know neglecting the one over d. Exactly. That that's what we're doing. I see. I see. That's the trick. Yeah. So this is a trick that's that. True. So large D is a trick that sometimes is used to analyze uh, quantum field theories. In this case, it's the two-dimensional quantum field theory that describes the string world shape propagating on these geometries. Right. Yeah, that, that's that's very interesting, actually. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay, Sugato, perhaps we can postpone the question to the discussion because we are running perfectly on time. So, uh, because we have a long uh, discussion session afterwards. Thank you again, Juan for sure. Thank you. For, thank you for having me. And now we have uh, Brian Swingle. Hello. Uh, there you go. So you can share the screen. So again, you have 30 minutes plus five for question. And when you'll have five plus five minutes to go, I'll warn you. Great. Thank you. Please go right, ahead. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation to, uh, to speak at this interesting conference. It's been a lot of fun hearing the talk so far, and I hope to hear the rest of them. Um, and yeah, today I wanted to talk a little bit. It's a little bit of a uh, of a different center of mass subject. It's really about uh, quantum anybody chaos. This connects intimately to the physics of black holes, because in some sense, black holes, at least in the simplest context that we understand them very well in ADS-CFT, are sort of paradigmatic models of quantum chaos. And I'll explain at least pictorially what I mean by that. So what I want to do in this talk is give you, in the first part, kind of a quick overview, very high level pictorial overview of the current thinking on quantum chaos, where we're at, and then talk a little bit about um, some recent work that we did trying to connect some of the different manifestations of quantum chaos. The, the basic point here is that quantum chaos has many characterizations, many manifestations, many facets, and although they often occur together, we don't really fully understand the relations between them. And that's an outstanding problem for the field that we're trying to address. All right, so what is quantum chaos? This is what I just hinted at. Well, classical chaos is already a very complicated thing. It has many different uh, facets. And in the early days of quantum chaos, the, one of the first things people talked about was this, the quantum signatures of classically chaotic systems. So you quantize a classically chaotic system and that implies some features for say the energy levels of the Hamiltonian of that quantized system. But I think that's only really part of the story. We should have a sort of fully quantum definition of quantum chaos, which is something that makes sense whenever we have a big Hilbert space or lots of degrees of freedom, as we do in a mini body system. And so far as we know, that notion of quantum chaos should have certain characteristics. For example, it's often associated with thermalization, with the approach to equilibrium, and with transport and hydrodynamics. It has a somewhat more microscopic. Um, manifestations related to sort of quantum versions of the butterfly effect or what are called low Schmidt echoes. It also is related to notions of randomness. For example, one of the most celebrated 
characterizations of quantum chaos is that if you look at the levels of the Ham Hamiltonian of the system, or if you have an ensemble of systems that are supposed to be quantum chaotic, then that ensemble of energy levels will look like, in some precise sense, the levels of a random matrix. And then even more recently, there's been a lot of discussion about complexity of quantum chaotic systems, how hard it is to prepare energy eigenstates, how the complexity of quantum states grows with time and so forth. So we have all these different facets, all these different manifestations, and they, they occur together in many contexts, but we'd like to understand more precisely how to relate them all. And just very briefly, I wanna to mention to you that this is now a sort of very exciting time to be thinking about quantum chaos. This was an old subject, which has been sort of, in my view, revived by a lot of new um, experimental and theoretical insights. So on the one hand, in experiments, it's now possible increasingly in the context of quantum simulators and, and early models of quantum computers to probe the long time dynamics of many body systems in relative isolation. So you can really look at far from equilibrium physics, which is most naturally associated with various kinds of chaotic dynamics or the lack thereof. <clears throat> and in the, in the same vein, um, quantum information theory has brought a lot of new insights and tools into the physics of chaos. So we think about now chaos, partly in terms of the scrambling of information, for example, and we have a lot of other new tools to help us think about the dynamics of entanglement, of entropy, et cetera. Now, what I'll mention next here is, is the, the quantum chaos matters a lot for the black hole information problem. We've already sort of seen a lot of talk about this in some of the earlier talks. And um, I'll mostly think in the context of ADS-CFT just to be completely precise so sort that of, I can make a statement to you that, that like we're very confident in. Um, but we, we think, or at least I think that this is a, a set of ideas that's more broadly relevant for understanding the information problem. And then of course, my background actually is, is in sort of strong correlation materials physics in the physics of like uh, materials where electrons are strongly interacting. And there too, quantum chaos plays an important role. And there are a lot of old puzzles, difficult questions in that field related to the transport of electricity and charge, which we think quantum chaos will help us understand how to address. So just uh, from a different field than probably where most of you normally spend your time, this is a sort of very exciting thing going on right now that merges a lot of different topics and experimental tools together. So now what about black holes? I want to claim that they are sort of uh, really iconic models of, of quantum chaos. So first of all, uh, in the semi-classical limit, when Newton's constant is small, they have a big entropy, or at least in ADS-CFT, as I already made my caveat. Um, in ADS-CFT, we know how to interpret what this entropy means in the dual field theory. And we, we would say, at least I would say, that this is really something you should associate, a set of states you should associate with the black hole. So there's a large number of states, the big Hilbert space. So we're in the regime where we have, at least in my picture, I don't know exactly how the things work, but you know, there's uh, some kind of microscopic qubits or spins or something that are providing the effective description deep down of this black hole. Um, this system of many degrees of freedom has relaxation. So if you excite the quasi-normal modes of this black hole, they will decay. And the characteristic time scale for that decay when written in terms of the Hawking temperature is this fundamental kind of quantum thermal time, H bar over the temperature. I've put Boltzmann constant to one, but I've kept H bar just to emphasize its role. This is a typical scale for a quasi-normal mode. And that's also what we would expect the decay rate to be in a sort of strongly interacting quantum many body system at temperature T. Um, and then more complicated kinds of uh, scrambling or mixing up of information have another time scale, which is also related to the logarithm of uh, the entropy of the black hole. It's related to the number of degrees of freedom in addition to the time scale set by this relaxation process. And this is something which has been explored. We've already heard about this in some of the previous talks and explored in a number of um, important works in the last, uh, last uh, several years, especially. Okay. Now, um, there's also more fine grained senses in which black holes are quantum chaotic, for example, we have various proposals, some of which I was involved with explaining how to or proposing how to calculate some measure of complexity of the black hole quantum state, the quantum state dual to the black hole, in terms of a region of space time, which is effectively growing in some sense. So the distance between the left and the right boundaries as you move the time up grows because the interior is growing. 
And that growing interior, we argued, has some manifestation in terms of the growing complexity of the quantum state. And even this uh, idea that the states of the black hole Hamiltonian should look random matrix-like has now seen some understanding in terms of path angle computation. So we, we can't list out the complete detailed states, except for certain very special models, and then only on a computer. But we can calculate seemingly some coarse grain properties. So for example, there was this nice work recently of Saad Schenker Stanford, where they showed how to obtain a measure of spectral randomness called the spectral form factor and show that it looked random matrix-like in a, in a certain definite way, which I'll review in a moment. Okay. So there's all these different manifestations of quantum chaos and black holes seemingly, seemingly realize these manifestations in one box. I emphasize this occurs in other systems as well, as far as we can tell, like you can take your favorite quantum spin chain or, or whatever system of particles you like. And oftentimes these things to the extent that we can compute also occur there. So we'd really like to understand uh, how they all relate to each other and, and why they have to co-occur and when they do. Okay, that's the background. And um, I, my recent interest was, was in the following problem. Another thing we associate with black holes is hydrodynamics. This is like going back to the membrane paradigm. So suppose we have say a black brain, then it's known again in the context of ADS CFT at least that we can precisely map under the name of the fluid gravity correspondence, the sort of ripples of the horizon of this black hydrodynamic black hole to actual hydrodynamics in the boundary description, okay, in the dual CFT description. And um, from a sort of many body physics point of view, from a physics of materials point of view, you know, most systems are arrayed in space um, and they have these kind of hydrodynamic slow modes associated with energy and momentum conservation. And so, you know, we faced our, we were facing this problem and thinking, okay, how can we understand in this kind of context, um, say whether random matrix theory in the spectrum emerges and what is the time scale for which it, which it requires to emerge? Because the, the reason why this is sort of tricky is because the hydrodynamic modes are associated with many almost conserved quantities in the system. That's the slowly decaying modes of the hydrodynamic description. And these almost conserved quantities are going to mess up your random matrix description because random matrices don't have any such almost conserved quantities. So we expect at very late time that you will recover the random matrix behavior, for example, in the spectrum. But these slow modes, these hydrodynamic modes, should interfere with that in some way. So there should be a time scale that we'd like to compute and a whole crossover for some various observables that, that sort of measure the spectral randomness. And we'd like to be able to compute that as well. So we started with a kind of what I would say relatively modest goal of understanding how to compute corrections to the expected random matrix behavior due to slow modes. But what we'll actually get and what I'll show you at the end of the talk is that actually that results in a description of the randomness, a hydrodynamic description of the randomness that actually seemingly applies much more generally and even gives us the baseline random matrix behavior to start with. So we don't actually have to put that in it comes out from a certain path integral calculation as I'll try to convince you. So that's the background. That's where we wanted to go. And so today, just to be precise, what I'll talk about is a paper I wrote recently for the rest of this talk, I uh, wrote with a student, Mike Weiner. Uh, there's the archive number. And we're gonna, in this, in this uh, paper, we considered this uh, observable called the spectral form factor. It's defined as follows. You take all the energy levels of your system you form them and the Hamiltonian into the time evolution operator for time big T. So big T always means time and not temperature. Whenever I need temperature, I'll use beta for inverse temperature. So I take this time evolution operator, I compute the trace. So that's like the return amplitude, the amplitude to come back to yourself summed over all states. I square it or take the absolute value squared more precisely and I compute some kind of disorder average. So as I said, uh, in quantum chaos, often we think about having some ensemble of chaotic Hamiltonians this uh, average could be over that ensemble. It could also be a time average. Um, it's important, but I won't discuss it too much. If you don't do the average, if you just have a particular system here, then what this spectral form factor looks like is a, is a very erratic function of time because it depends on all of the microscopic details of all the energy levels. But if you average it over disorder, then you can get a quite smooth function of time. 
And what we expect, if this was a random matrix and we were doing this calculation, what we'd get is the spectral form factors proportional to time over a wide range of times, starting from some kind of early onset time to a very late time related to the inverse level spacing. And for that huge time window, we would have a linear in time, perfectly linear in time growth. And what we want to understand is under what conditions this behavior occurs in generic quantum minibody systems, including black holes. And you know, what's the time scale for it to onset and, and things like that. So that's the context. Uh, just flash this slide. I'm happy to talk about the background in, in, in questions or in the discussion, or if you want to just email me for, for references, happy to tell you about that. But basically just to let you know that there is an old story here going back many years in the quantum chaos literature, trying to address this question and even relating the onset of random matrix theory to diffusion, as we'll see in a second. And then also a lot of more recent results studying analytic calculations of spectral form factors in lots of models, the onset of random matrix theory in various contexts, and also the, the tool that I'll use actually at the end of the talk, the, the theory of fluctuating hydrodynamics is also something that's been developed very recently, relatively speaking, the last uh, 10 or so years, um, is a sort of quantum field theory way of thinking about hydrodynamics and the fluctuations around the classical theory. So there's a big body of work which we're building on, but I'll tell you um, the basic highlights now. So the observable, again, is spectral form factor. Here's how to think about it. You take the energy levels of your system, the EIs, you put them together into this um, composite object, which is the trace, the time evolution operator. We may allow ourselves to filter out, to focus on some particular energies. That's what this function F is doing. It can zero in on a certain part of the spectrum if we want. And we take this object and we average it over again, the disorder or possibly over time, right? And what you expect to get in is something at early time. This is a log log plot of the spectral form factor. There's some kind of early time decay at time zero. Of course, this is just the Hilbert space dimension squared. So it's a relatively high number. It drops, there can be some oscillations. And then you get this long period of linear, purely perfectly linear growth almost perfectly linear growth. And then at very late time, typically time related to the inverse, uh, to the Hilbert space size, the spectral form factor plateaus. And this is essentially saying that you're seeing the smallest scale level spacing in the theory. And we're gonna focus again on this ramp-like region and the onset of the ramp, so this early time part. Just uh, so you see a formula, um, this is what random matrix theory predicts very precisely for the ramp. You integrate over energies. The, you have the filter function here if you so choose. The time pi and this beta is actually the Dyson index. It just relates to the time reversal symmetry, the way time reversal acts in your random matrix. Sometimes people compute what they call thermal spectral form factors where they choose the filter function to be related to the Boltzmann distribution. I won't talk any more about that, but just know that it exists. Instead, I'll think about uh, when I need to about a Gaussian filtered thing. So we just pick an energy E bar that we're interested in. We choose a little window, a Gaussian damped window with variance sigma around that. There should be a minus sign here. And we average the spectral form factor over that window and we get a precise formula that just involves the size of the window, the time and the Dyson index and pi's and twos. And the claim is this, this this Gaussian filter spectral form factor is, is supposedly totally universal. So you take your favorite quantum chaotic system, whatever you want, go to sufficiently late time, you'll always see exactly this number, provided the energy E bar you're interested in is in the middle of a chaotic region in the spectrum. So it's a kind of hyper universal behavior that we like to understand its origin. Okay. Now, again, uh, what's going on here is that uh, we expect this random matrix theory to be, random matrix behavior to occur at late time, but at early times, um, you know, you'll have the details of your system. Your system is not actually a random matrix; it has spatial locality, or whatever it has. And so, there's a time scale in the community called the Thales time, which is defined to just be the time to be close in some precise sense, epsilon close, say, to a pure random matrix result. And so, the time, this time, depends on how precisely close you want to be but that's the, the terminology. And so one of the tasks of our theory would be to compute this Thales time and tell us how the spectral form factor crosses over to the pure random matrix result at late time. Okay, so that's a lightning review of random matrix theory and what we expect 
to the spectral form factor. Let's talk about the complication that arises from these slow modes. So consider the following kind of model of a Hamiltonian. You have a Hamiltonian where there's a bunch of decoupled sectors, that's H naught. And then uh, another small, in some sense, correction V, which causes transitions between the different sectors. So you have a bunch of almost conserved quantities labeled by the sectors of H naught and some weak conservation breaking term V. If you ignore the effect of V, what you would expect to get is a spectral form factor, which is a sum over the extra sector. So basically every sector is an independent random matrix. Spectral form factor is essentially a variance. So it just adds up the number of decoupled sectors. And then our goal is to compute what happens when you re-include the weak perturbations from this quantity V. So I won't go over in detail what's happening here. Basically we write down formulas for a wave function as a function of time. Recall that the spectral form factor is essentially a sum over return amplitudes. So we need to have access to return amplitudes. So we parameterize the description in terms of, of the wave function in terms of probabilities to go from one sector to another. That's the sector labels. And then within each sector, there's a set of states and you have some kind of motion within the sector. That's the second part. And the only thing about this formula, which is not totally general, is that we assume that the transition probability to go from sector alpha to beta does not depend on the microstate, if you will, within the sector, but otherwise it's general. So then you compute return probabilities. You need to make some assumptions about averaging, which are reasonable, but you make those assumptions. And what you get at the end of the day is a final formula that tells you the spectral form factor of the whole system is a sum over the different blocks of the spectral form factor of each block times these return probabilities, the, the probability to go from the block back to itself. So this is, I think, quite intuitive from the point of view of the spectral form factor as return amplitudes. Here, you're just getting return probabilities. You're getting probabilities instead of amplitudes because the disorder average basically causes the off-diagonal coherences to go away. And so if each sector by itself is random matrix-like, if these are all just proportional to T with that universal formula, then this boils down to computing the sum of return probabilities. That is what will control the spectral form factor and the way in which we approach the true random matrix result as these almost conserved quantities go away at late time. Okay, so let's be a little bit more precise. Uh, what's an example of these almost conserved quantities? The, the best example I know of, the simplest example is energy diffusion. So if you take your favorite local system, your local field theory, whatever at planet temperature, you break all of the symmetries except energy conservation. So add some weak disorder, like some random potential in the background, we have these things all the time in the solid state. Uh, then typically what's all, well, all that remains is, is you have slow one slow mode, which is the diffusion of energy. Everything else will be have some weak damping at least, which does not vanish at long wavelength. So the only slow mode that remains is energy diffusion. And the idea is at some fixed time T an infinite system size, you have a very large number of almost conserved quantities. You can define a characteristic wave vector K sub T, which depends on time and the diffusion constant D. And basically all the modes with wave vector less than KT are essentially barely decayed. They've decayed by less than one factor of, they, they decay by less than one E fold. So they've essentially not moved from their early time value and they're an almost conserved quantity. And the number of those almost conserved quantities is proportional to the volume. And so as time goes on, you lose more and more of these almost conserved quantities, they decay appreciably, but at any given time in infinite volume, you have an extensive number of them. And so these almost conserved sectors are labeled by the uh, amplitude of the energy fluctuation for each wave vector K that's almost conserved, right? So that's a very large number of sectors. And the sum of our return probabilities would just be the sort of functional integral over the energy initial energy profile of the probability for the energy profile to return to its zero time value. Now, how can we compute something like this? We can appeal uh, to this fluctuating hydrodynamics. I mean, we don't actually need this full formalism to compute that simple problem, but just in the spirit of uh, showing you how things work in a way that will be useful in a second. In this uh, closed time path formalism, what we're trying to do is compute correlation functions that live on these two contours, a sort of forward in time contour and a backwards in time contour, where the fields could be different on forward and backwards, the background fields or the, the couplings even. And that computes an object like this. The trace of a density matrix, that's this red blob initially, U1 and U2 deck. 
And if U1 and U2 are equal, then this will just give you trace of rho. It'll be some time independent thing. And that fact uh, gives us a, a powerful set of rules that govern the kinds of effective field theories you could think about floating on this contour. So there's a powerful set of rules and a nice classification of variables in terms of R type or classical or symmetric variables that are the same between the two contours and anti-symmetric or quantum or A type variables that are anti-symmetric between the two contours. And there's a very nice set of rules for the kinds of effective actions that you can write down. And what you find is that um, the simplest versions of this give you immediately essentially hydrodynamics, fluctuating hydrodynamics for say energy diffusion. So here's the simplest kind of version, one of the simplest versions of this. We have a field phi A and phi R, which you can think of as essentially related to maps from sort of internal time to physical time, like fluid time to physical time on these two maps, on these two contours. So there's a phi one and a phi two, and we can form the symmetric and anti-symmetric combinations, which is phi A and phi R. And by studying how this couples to background fields, you can conclude that the energy density is related to the time derivative of phi R. And then phi A is sort of like a Lagrange multiplier that, uh, that you can uncomplete the square in a standard path integral trick. And it gives you essentially energy diffusion, that's this term here, as an equation of motion coupled to a fluctuating source. And from a calculation like that, you can write down a probability distribution for an amplitude of energy fluctuation at wave vector k to have some final value ek final at time t in terms of the initial value and the decay rate and some, some variance sigma. You can do the integral over the modes over the initial condition. That's what we're trying to do. We're calculating there at sum over return probabilities. And thereby you can compute this, this sum over probabilities to produce a complicated looking formula where we multiply over all the modes. And in you know, some particular regime where the wave vector can be treated as quasi-continuous instead of discrete, we get a nice formula in terms of uh, some one over time to the d over two power. Okay, so we, in other words, we understand how- that five plus five minutes. Great, that's perfect, thanks. Um, so we understand how the correction to the random matrix result looks. And we see in particular that if you make time long compared to the system size in a certain precise way, then this exponential thing in the exponential approach is zero the exponential of zero is one and you get back to the pure random matrix behavior. So the sum of return probabilities becomes just one because essentially no matter what sector you start with, the final state is you have equal probability to be in any sector. And so the sum of all those things is just one. Okay, so just to step back, what have we done? We've written down a general quantum mechanical formula Whenever you have this kind of uh, slow block structure, you have the many slow modes with weak transitions between them. We wrote down a general formula and then we computed that formula in the case of uh, diffusion to produce a precise formula for the spectral form factor as a function of time. And you can go look and you can look at your favorite uh, mini body model. In this case, the group of Friedman et al studied not energy diffusion, but charge diffusion, but the same basic story applies um, in a 1D spin chain in a special limit. What's shown here is the enhancement log of spectral form factor divided by time. The time is the baseline expectation. And so we're dividing out by that linear part. And this is just giving you the enhancement. We're taking the log of it for different system sizes, all plotted as a function of time over L squared. So this is like the diffusive scaling that you would expect. And the basic story is that uh, the data for different system sizes approximately collapses and seems to fit reasonably well uh, the formula that I wrote here in the case where the dimension of space is one. Okay, now what we can actually do in our theory that I'll show you in just a second is we can actually compute corrections to this due to interactions, but that has not really been understood in detail yet. So let me just in the last couple of minutes talk about how to get the spectral form factor directly from hydrodynamics in this fluctuating formalism. And the key idea is to think of the contours that define the CTP formalism, this closed time path formalism, in a slightly different way. If we just identified the boundary conditions in a slightly different way, we could actually get the, the contours that are used to define a spectral form factor. So instead of gluing at the end and the beginning, or the, the beginning and the end, we glue the end of one to the, to the end of the other, 
like this. So we just change the gluing. In other words, we change the boundary conditions. But everywhere in the center of this path integral, you would expect that the action, if you like, looks the same because it's not sensitive to what's happening at the boundaries. The boundaries are, of course, important. They specify some information about the initial state and how the boundary condition and, and how, uh, what kind of modes we can have. But, but the bulk action is the same. So the idea of our derivation is like we could take the same bulk action, but with modified boundary conditions, we assume that that modified bulk path integral gives now the dominant saddle point contribution to the special form factor, sort of the dominant term in some path integral calculation of that object. And with that assumption, along with the, this assumption that there's some averaging that connects the contours, we can actually derive not just the hydrodynamic correction, but also the ramp itself. The ramp comes very directly from the zero mode. The basic idea here is that um, if you go to very long times, all the hydrodynamic modes have decayed and all you have is the momentum, spatial momentum zero mode. So you have total energy and this total relative time shift essentially between the two contours. And the path integral reduces to an integral over the zero mode of energy, that is the total energy and the zero mode of the relative time shift, which is just the overall time shift. And in the usual CTP formalism, the overall time shift, the relative time difference between the two contours is fixed because of the future boundary condition here. But in this case, where we glue contour one to itself and contour two to itself, there's no pinning. The relative time shift can be whatever you want. It can be anything from zero to T. And that freedom is exactly what gives you the linear and T part of the ramp. And then the integral over the zero mode of energy is just the integral over the energies of the state. And we also have a similar kind of argument for higher powers, which we produce higher powers of the of the trace of the of the time evolution, which reproduce the expected Gaussian structure to leading order of these moments. Okay. And this is something that had been seen in a very special model for this SYK and JT gravity models in the Shad Shanker Stanford paper. Um, but here we're arguing that actually it just very general feature that follows from hydrodynamics, which is a sort of very universal description of a, a wide variety of systems. And then finally, last slide, we can also do the, the full Gaussian path integral, say, um, over the hydrodynamic action. So this action here, where again, we modify the boundary conditions so that things are now periodic in real time. So it's a funny boundary condition, but you can do that calculation exactly and you exactly reproduce the enhancement factor that we had before. So the zero modes give you the ramp and the non-zero modes give the enhancement in exact agreement with the previous formula. And that's all I wanted to tell you. So again, to summarize, quantum chaos has many facets. Black holes realize these facets with a intriguing connected set of phenomenology, various things related to the interior and to the horizon playing special roles. What I showed you here super briefly is that fluctuating hydro can be modified to actually predict a ramp and compute the approach to this ramp. It reproduces what we've, what's we've what been known for special black holes, but now the framework seems much more general. So we could apply it to hydrodynamic black holes, but also to a wide class of generic quantum minibody systems and thereby connect hydrodynamics, which is this one manifestation of chaos to spectral randomness, which is this other classic manifestation. And with that, I'll say thank you and happy to take any questions you have. Thank you very much. We do have about four minutes for questions. Is there any question? No yeah, question. I have a sure. question. Oh, ah, one has a question. Okay, go ahead. Um, so where did you input uh, the fact that uh, you are averaging over randomness or the Hamiltonians? Because otherwise you would get two completely decoupled systems and you wouldn't get the ramp at some oscillatory signal. That's right, yeah. I, I, I think it's fair to say we don't have complete control over this kind of assumption, but the it's really in, in even in the use, the use period of this CTP action on this decoupled contour, mm -hmm. you know, the CTP action, as you know well, has couplings between the two contours, which we rationalize by saying there's a state in the past and there's a future right. boundary condition, right? That doesn't seem to have the same rationalization in this setting, unless we assume that there's some weak randomness that we averaged over. Mm -hmm. So a standard 
way of thinking about this, or at least a way of thinking that I like, is that we can imagine introducing some weak perturbation, weak enough so it doesn't affect any of the intensive properties of the system, so the diffusion constant's not appreciably modified, but strong enough so that when we take the thermodynamic limit, it does cause the spectrum, the spectral form factor to average out in a desirable way. Um, so that's how I think of what's going on here. We introduce some kind of weak averaging, which doesn't affect the actual local bulk action, but does, if you like, validate the connectivity between the two. But it was important that this averaging was time independent or, or not. Um, yeah, if, if it's not, yeah, it's, it's important. Certainly macroscopically, it's important that we we don't break time conservation. And I think if I did that here, I would have to add extra terms that I normally would forbid perhaps. Maybe that's the way of seeing how that assumption is important at this level. I haven't thought very carefully about just from the, the bulk point of view, the, the bulk action point of view here, how to enforce that. I guess it has to do with energy conservation. So you just add other terms you could add to the effective action mm -hmm. that you shouldn't, okay. we wouldn't normally have there. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Do we have a question from Sogato Bols? Yeah. Uh, hello. Hello. Hi. 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 So I, I don't know whether I understood uh, everything correctly, but let me just try to see. So uh, you are, it's a very nice analytic <laughs> work, but are you implicitly using free models at any stage with these Vs or is more generally applicable? No, absolutely not. Yeah. I mean, okay, okay. Um, mm -hmm. Free models okay. are the place where this won't work because it's right. not chaotic. Right. So, so, okay. so the, the idea here is, you know, we're not deriving hydrodynamics for any particular system and we're not deriving random matrix theory for any particular system, but we're saying that if you have a system mm -hmm. for which this is the hydrodynamic description, right. then that system will also necessarily have modulo these right. assumptions, have this right. Thanks. So sort of connection between those two things. Okay, and and then under this situation, under the assumptions you have, if you, I mean, since you, I saw that you have computed the full, you know, the full path integral as well. So, so you could probably compute uh, like growth of volume and entropy and stuff as well. Yeah, you can compute all of that um, mm -hmm. given some particular model. Mm -hmm. um, the the, you know, I guess the 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 part of the point is that like this effective action is. Mm -hmm. Relatively model independent. I mean, the model parameters, the model dependence comes in through the value of the diffusion constant and the value of the thermal conductivity here and mm -hmm. the heat capacity, for example. But we've kind of integrated out, if you like, or coarse grained over, in some sense, a lot of the microscopic. Right. Right. And right. this is right. supposed to be applicable, you know, for time scales long compared to relaxation time. So we're keeping only the mm -hmm. slow modes, this relatively universal hydrodynamic description. But we claim that's enough, actually, to tell right. you the yeah. ramp and to compute the corrections. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Okay. So I think we can thank the speaker again. For a nice talk, and we can move on to Hong Liu. It's Hong with us. Okay. Good. Um, right. Let me try to share my screen. I can hear you, but not see you. Oh. There you go. There you, you go. Yes. yes. I hear you and see you. Yes, hi Hong. Hi. So let me hi. check. How are you? So okay, you can share your screen. Okay. You see my screen? We see we see your screen. You may go full screen if you like. Okay. Uh, that's it. you oh, okay, good. Yeah. Yes. Thanks a lot for the for the invitation. And uh, um, yeah, so, um, so I'm going to talk about um, some recent work, which I did with my student, Shuer uh, Vatham, which appeared uh, uh, in August last year. Uh, we are also mentioning in, by passing um, some work we are doing right now with John Akudel Flam and also Darius Shu on the, yeah, on related issues. So, so let us just consider, say, if you consider room, you can see that all the molecules in the room, they are arranged in the very nice lattice, but somehow, uh, but then the velocity for each molecule say uh, notch, okay. So, so, so imagine you can uh, 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 set up initial pure states like that. 
Then we all know as you let system evolve, then system will then approach equilibrium. Those, uh, those molecules will fly around. And, uh, and then, but of course, uh, since the quantum me uh, mechanical evolution is unitary, so even though this final state looks very much like a thermal state, but still uh, uh, it is a pure state. Okay, so this is what we call a equilibrated pure state. And uh, so um, for such an equilibrated pure state, you can use some dynamic quantities to describe the state, just like the, uh, the, uh, the air in your room. And and uh, and they yeah uh, those microscopic yeah those thermodynamic quantities then they obey the laws of thermodynamics, and you can also make measurements on any small fractions of the system, and then they can be well approximated by those say in the equilibrium density operator. Say for example, if your room is in the final temperature, if the final state uh, is like a final temperature state, then you can just use your standard uh, canonical uh, density operator. But if now, if we want to consider uh, quantum information properties uh, using the, uh, of this pure state, uh, of this equilibrium pure states, and try to use the quantum information properties of this equilibrium density operator to approximate, say, this pure state, and then uh, we immediately uh, find the violation of unitarity. So there's a very simple reason. So let's just consider, say, the Rennie or the uh, uh, Monuma entropies for some subsystem A and its complement A bar. And then, then if you are in the pure state, then the, uh, then the entropy for A is equal to A bar, um, which the, uh, so N equal to one, it should be understood as Monuma entropy and then higher N is the uh, range entropies. But if you have a density operator, then of course this is not satisfied. And uh, so in the sense if, yeah, then if you use rho E to approximate uh, psi, and then you find a violation of unitarity. And in fact, this is precisely the situation we face um, for uh, when we consider evaporation of a black hole. So let's consider, um, yeah, say, uh, uh, let's consider a, a, a black hole formed for, from a collapse of a star in the pure state. Okay. And let's say if you start with a star in the pure state, and then it, let's imagine it collapse to form a black hole. And then this black hole will subsequently, uh, 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 say, evaporate, say, with Hawking radiations, et cetera. So this uh, evaporation process is very slow. Of, uh, uh, so we can consider, say, for all time, uh, uh, this evaporation uh, process as a quasi static process. Okay, so, so at any time, we can, uh, 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 we can imagine uh, uh, yeah, this is, this, yeah, if you assume, yeah, if we uh, assume that gravity is still governed by the standard rule of quantum gravity, uh, standard rule of uh, quantum mechanics, and then uh, and then this black hole plus radiation should still in the pure state. But then it should be in the, uh, uh, what we call the equilibrated pure state. Okay. And then, uh, and then, yeah, then you can just uh, uh, self-consistent self-consistently check this assumption uh, that gravity, say, obeys the rules of quantum mechanics. And then, yeah, indeed, just say uh, we know that Hawking radiation, and if you do measurement around the black hole, for all purpose, uh, you can approximate the system, say, as the thermal system. And uh, we say with the, um, yeah, using it, use the thermal density operator uh, to approximate various uh, local measurement around the black hole. So, um, so but, but there's apparent violation of unitarity, say if we use Rennie or Voluma entropy of the uh, density operator uh, to approximate those of the radiation. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, just for the reason I mentioned that the, um, then you find that the entropy of the um, radiation is not the same as its complement. And so uh, this is an aspect. Yeah, of course, there are many aspects of there are many aspects of information paradox, and this is one aspect of it. And so uh, 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 a number of years ago, Page uh, postulated that say if black holes do respect the rules of quantum mechanics, then you expect yeah because of this uh, relation, uh, this unitarity constraint, and then the evolution of 
say entangled entropy of radiation should satisfy should follow this so-called page curve. So, so here, this uh, red dashed line uh, uh, is the, um, say, the entropy of the radiation. If you use this thermal density operator, okay, then you will just find that the, uh, uh, as black hole evaporate, you have more and more radiation, and the entropy keep increasing. So until uh, uh, the, the everything has gone into the radiation. And uh, yeah, this blue line corresponding to the entropy, say, of a black hole, which you can calculate by using the uh, Bekenstein Hawking form. So unitarity tells you that you should satisfy this a, SA to SA bar. So now if you look at the, the entropy of the radiation, then you should follow uh, uh, this solid curve. Say in the first part, when the, uh, when the black hole, uh, um, yeah, uh, um, when the black hole is much bigger, than the, than the radiation, and then, then the radiation will increase. But when the degrees of freedom of the radiation become, say, larger than that of the black hole, then you find actually the entangled entropy decrease with time. So, uh, so now the key question is what level of, yes, uh, what level of knowledge of this black hole or macro state you need to obtain, say, a reliable expression for the uh, entanglement and the radiant entropies that is uh, compatible with unitarity. Okay. So uh, in other words, so what inputs are we need, do we need to actually to derive this page curve? So, so the natural question is that, is the knowledge say of this density operate enough or you actually need the more detailed knowledge say of your initial state? Okay. And uh, so for many years, people are, uh, say, uh, so that is some level of energy of your initial state uh, uh, is needed in order to see that this page curve. But so the recent price, uh, a surprise for the last couple of years, people were able to derive the page curve from Euclidean gravity, say semi-classical uh, 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 Euclidean gravity calculations. And essentially, uh, which if you phrase using this language, just based on, uh, and then that's corresponding to you use only the knowledge of this uh, uh, equivalent density operator, okay? Not actually the detailed knowledge, say, of your pure state. And so this sometimes has been uh, referred to as the magic or miracle of Euclidean path integrals, because the, um, you think that somehow the entropy, uh, entanglement entropy or radiant entropies, they are fine grain quantities, fine grain quantum information quantities. So if so it's surprising that somehow they can be captured by just semi-classical Euclidean path integrals. Okay. So, uh, so recently uh, we, we have developed a general method to calculate uh, uh, the, the Rayleigh entropies, say for a general uh, non-integrable quantum many body system in, in the general, say in the equilibrated pure state. Okay. And so, so, so let me just uh, mention uh, here, uh, uh, first mention here, the, the immediate feature uh, and implications of this uh, um, a general scheme. So first that actually uh, to calculate the, uh, the Rayleigh entropies of, of this equilibrium pure state, you actually only need the information of this density operator. You don't need any information of the, uh, the, the say, say the initial state. Okay, and yet you can get a result which is compatible with unitarity. So this has very, uh, uh, yeah, so this uh, uh, scheme can be used to, um, to general quantum many body systems and uh, um, including uh, gravity, if you uh, say assume gravity is governed by quantum mechanics and then can be used to address this information uh, uh, paradox. So in particular, uh, uh, from this perspective, the magic of obtaining the page curve from uh, Euclidean path integral is more of the magic in observables such as entanglement entropies rather than Euclidean path integral itself. So essentially, uh, 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 the observables such as entanglement entropy actually, they, they are leading, say, expression in the thermodynamical limits can be captured just by the knowledge uh, of this uh, uh, thermal density operator alone. And, but you still can get a result with unitarity, yeah, uh, compatible with unitarity. 
And also the, uh, the method generalize the, the page's result uh, to finite temperature and also to um, system with infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So if we uh, uh, recall the page's result was derived based on average of pure states for finite dimensional Hilbert space. And uh, so, so, you, uh, so you need to have a finite dimensional Hilbert space and then also corresponding to infinite temperature. And, uh, and also page to result was just say high average over your pure states, but here we de uh, derive it say uh, for a general system as approximation. So, so in principle, you can systematically improve the result. And also this method provides a precise pres prescription for deriving this replica wormholes, uh, which has been uh, proposed recently to, uh, to explain the calculation of this uh, Euclidean particle cal uh, calculation of the page curve. And then uh, also explains why uh, by including uh, a replica wormholes, you get, uh, you get results compatible with unitarity. And in particular, uh, people have been debating whether say replica wormholes can arise in the series of fixed Hamiltonian or actually you need to do some kind of ensemble average. So, so this shows you that actually replica wormholes can arise in the series with a fixed Hamiltonian. So also let me just mention some work we uh, 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 yeah, mentioned by passing some work uh, 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 we are doing right now. So the, uh, so the same calculation scheme can actually be calculated, not just the, um, uh, uh, just say the entanglement entropies, but can also be, calculate, uh, be used to calculate other uh, quantum information quantities such as relative entropy and the activities, et cetera. And in particular, you can use it, say, in the, in the context of the black hole evaporation, you can uh, use it to study uh, the, the, the correlation. So you can, say, by study the correlation of a sub, say, a subsystem of radiation, say, uh, say, a subsystem A of radiation, how it's entangled with the rest of the radiation. And uh, 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 say, uh, uh, you can use this method to study that. And then you can actually obtain uh, what we call entanglement phase diagram for the black hole evaporation. So at different stage of black hole evaporation, you will see a different uh, 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 entanglement correlations between a subsystem of radiation with the rest. And you can also generalize this method to, uh, to actually find the time evolution, not just the equilibrated states. Uh, you can actually find time evolution for radiant entropies for large class of initial states. Okay, so 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 now I will describe in more detail uh, 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 the the setup of the problem and this approximation and uh, uh, and the, the the application to the replica wormholes. So so our setup is that you start with a pure state psi zero and then you evolve it with some unitary operator u. And then you assume that your final state psi has equilibrated. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, by equilibrated means you can uh, describe it using some dynamical quantities, and the local measurement can be approximated by some equilibrium density operator. Okay, so here I just write down some general form of an equilibrium density operator, uh, and so I alpha would be um, say some unnormalized density operator, and the alpha is. Uh, um, uh, its partition function. So I will always assume this the alpha is very big. So corresponding to the effective uh, dimension of your uh, system is big. And uh, um, so, and, uh, and the subsequent alpha denotes say various equivalent parameters such as temperature or chemical potential, etc. So, so depend on different uh, set, different systems, you can consider different I alpha. So for example, if you, say have a finite temperature, or yeah, if you have a finite dimension of uh, Hilbert space, and uh, then if the system say uh, there's no, at a very high energy, uh, there's no really energy constraints, then, the then you can view the system at the infinite temperature, and then you can just take this I to be the identity operator. And then the partition function will be just the dimension of the Hilbert space. And if you uh, consider some uh, 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 system with energy constraints, and then say you can consider the microcanonical ensemble, say by consider the state within some energy window, you can also consider the canonical ensemble, uh, say with some temperature. Okay. You can also consider more general ensembles, say for example, diagonal ensembles, et cetera. Okay. 
good. And so, uh, so this R alpha, I alpha denotes my uh, unnormalized un density operator, which I will use this notation often. And, uh, also, let me just mention a little bit the quantity or uh, the rainy entropy, which is the main thing I'm going to uh, describe how to calculate. Uh, yeah, just as, a, uh, just as an illustration of the method. So the, so the rainy entropy, we can define so-called the rainy partition function, which is the exponential, say, of the rainy entropy. And then this is defined by you evolve your uh, uh, initial density operator row zero, and then you take trace uh, over the complement of your system A, and then you take the power N. So, uh, so if you, you can represent this uh, rainy entropy in terms of path integrals, Say so if you say, so each evolution operator can be considered as a path integral, say from initial time zero to, to T, to some time T. And here we actually have two NU and NU dagger, okay? So if you draw it in, in terms of path integral, then you actually have two N copies of the path integral of your uh, original system. And the, the, the initial condition of the path integral is specified by your initial state. And the final condition uh, of your path integral is specified by you, how you take the trace to get your uh, rainy partition function. Okay. So here I have drawn the, um, the, 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 the path integral corresponding to you to move to, yeah, so you can imagine the time is going upwards. And so the, uh, the path integral corresponding to you then, then move forward in time. And the path integral corresponding to your dagger then move backwards in time. And then the integrand, then it's given by the, yeah, just your microscopic action for, yeah, so there's two n copies of them. So n of them corresponding to you move forward in time, uh, and then n of them moving backwards in time, then there's a relative matter sign between them. Okay. So, so the, uh, 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 the permutation group will play a very important role in my discussion below. So, so right now, yeah, let me now give you a very heuristic picture say why actually uh, 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 yeah just give you a heuristic picture why actually permutation group is actually important so now let's consider this path integral picture for calculating this rainy entropy okay so you have two n copies of your uh, the path integral and with this in the ground okay and this phi denotes the configuration for, uh, phi and uh, phi prime denotes the configuration for each path integral so there's a so if you look at this integrand, then there's a very special sub subset of configurations, okay? So this corresponding to the configurations that the, uh, the, the configuration corresponding to you move forward in time and the configurations so you move backward in time, they're just related by some permutations. Okay, so sigma uh, is the element of the permutation group of an object. And so, uh, so the phi prime corresponding to you move backward in time, then just related to the, yeah, some permutations of the uh, configuration you move forward in time. So for, for such subset of configurations, then this, uh, 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 then the phase in the exponential vanishes identically. Okay, it's because the, um, yeah, because the, uh, the sum uh, doesn't care about the permutation. And you just have the same sum, and then they just cancel each other. So, so now if you imagine for say uh, chaotic many body systems evolve uh, uh, over sufficiently long time, then you would imagine for generic configurations that this phase is very big. And then, uh, yeah, it's rather random and big and then, uh, then they just average out. Then you could imagine what's dominant are uh, given by this subset of configurations, okay, uh, which that just rated them by each other by uh, permutation. So, so intuitively, they could uh, dominate the path integral. And uh, in particular, uh, uh, because your integrand, uh, because uh, in this path integral, all your time dependence is actually in your integrand in the in the time dependence of the action. And uh, and the, since the integrand, uh, 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 this phase vanishes identically, so actually leads to time independent expressions. Okay. And so, so also makes sense that this gives you the uh, dominant contribution. For the equilibrium behavior of the system, okay. Uh, uh, so after your system have settled down to to the equilibrium behavior, and so yeah, so this heuristic, uh, heuristic argument suggests the uh, the very importance of the permutation group 
in characterize the uh, in characterizing uh, the the equivalent behavior say of rainy entropies. So you can now uh, make this argument uh, more precisely uh, 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 by formulating a precise mathematical formula. And so uh, I will not go into detail uh, uh, in that, just let, uh, uh, let me just mention that first, what you do is that you can write this Rennie uh, entropy uh, as, a transition fun as a transition amplitude uh, in, uh, in two n copies, say, of your original uh, uh, Hilbert space. Okay, so you consider, say, uh, uh, h tensor with h, then take n copies of that. Okay, so uh, this is two n copies of all your original system, and then you imagine evolve this uh, some initial state in this system, and you evolve it using this uh, uh, operator u times u dagger to the power n. Okay, and then you can show that your Rennie partition function can uh, can be written as a transition amplitude. Uh, 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 in these two n copies uh, of your Hilbert space. And so this rho zero e and this eta, uh, a lot of rotations just some, uh, define some states in this, in, uh, in this replica space. Uh, yeah, I will not explain in detail those rotations, uh, take some time. Uh, uh, anyway, just this initial state is determined by your rho zero. And from your initial density operator, you can construct this state in these two n copies of your Hilbert space. And then, then, the, uh, then this kind of trace you use to, um, to define your Rennie entropies, then again can be formulated as some kind of state in, your, um, in this two n copies of your Hilbert space. And then, and then, the, uh, uh, then the scheme we use to calculate the entangled entropy, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, Rennie entropies is what we call the uh, uh, equivalent approximation. And the answer can be written as follows. I will not give you the uh, derivation here or the motivation for the derivation. So, so the answer can be written as follows. So you find that your Rennie partition function, say for, for n's Rennie entropy, can be written as, say this is e1 to the power n. So this is e1, just the partition function of your single, uh, of your equipment density operator, which you use to approximate the system. And then, and then you introduce this set of m factorial states, okay, one for each permutation, okay, so, so tau uh, denotes the uh, permutation, and then you have m factorial states and uh, associated with the equivalent density operator, okay. So, I will, yeah, uh, again, take some time to write down this state explicitly. Uh, uh, let me just mention, just given any uh, operator in, the, in your original system, there's a canonical way to write down. Uh, uh, yeah, say this m factorial set of this set of m factorial state in these two n copies of your Hilbert space uh, by using the permutation group. Okay. Anyway, so uh, so you just take that state and take the overlap with this final state corresponding to you uh, specify the trace for the Rennie entropy, and then that you get the um, you get the leading order uh, contribution to your Rennie partition function, say in the thermodynamic limit. So, so, so let me just emphasize some important aspect of this formula. This actually, so this expressed solely in terms of this equivalent density operator. Okay, so, so it's independent of the initial state. So it doesn't matter what your initial state is, uh, as far as they equilibrate to this macroscopic, yeah, as far as macroscopically they equilibrate to this uh, uh, equivalent density operator, and then this provides a very good approximation to your uh, yeah, uh, uh, um, to the entropy of this initial pure state. And so the key element here is the sum over permutations. And you find that the, because of the sum over permutations, and you find actually this expression satisfies the utility constraint. Okay. And the, if you just use your thermal you density- You have five, five minutes. Okay, good, good, okay. And if you just use the thermal density operator, if you just use thermal density operator to approximate your uh, uh, your quantum information, pro yeah, if you just use the quantum information, if you just use the entropy of your thermal density operator to approximate, say, your equilibrium pure state, then what you uh, uh, then corresponding to you just take tau equal to identity here. So the non-trivial thing here is here you actually sum the over all permutations 
which made the without, uh, 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 yeah, respect militarity. And yeah, so yes, yeah, so, so this is what I was saying, the naive approximation then corresponding to you just take the identity, okay. And then that gives you a result which violates utility. So also let me just mention quickly some features uh, 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 of this result. And so uh, you can just write it as the, um, yeah, you can sum of all possible permutations for each permutation is corresponding to you can calculate some kind of partition function. And so among these all contributions corresponding to each, uh, uh, each permutation, and there are partic two particularly simple contributions. So one uh, corresponding to just the identity permutations, which I mentioned earlier, then that's corresponding to just the, the really partition functions of your uh, uh, equilibrium density operator for, your, uh, for this subsystem A. And then there's a lot of simple one corresponding to the cyclical permutation. So for the cyclical permutation, then you find actually you get the, uh, the, uh, the really entropy of the equivalent density operator for the complement for the A bar, okay? And then, then the other permutations are, are, yeah, are more complicated uh, and they don't have simple expression like this. And then, so in the case which one of A and A bar is much smaller than the other, then you can show that actually the, uh, the entropy just given by the minimum, uh, smaller of the two, okay? Uh, then you find that either E dominates or the E, Eta dominates, okay, and, uh, and then just given by the small of the two. And so this is the final temperature, say, generation of this page result uh, uh, to, to final temperature and infinite Hilbert space, etc. And another uh, uh, important feature of this is that normally uh, this equivalent density operator, you can, rep you can represent it using uh, Euclidean part in the growth. And so, uh, so now you can just write down this expression in terms of the uh, Euclidean part in the growth for n replicas of I alpha. So now, uh, so now uh, 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 the key is that the, uh, uh, now in this uh, uh, final expression only need the n, n replicas of the, uh, um, yeah, of the equivalent density operator. So remember the original uh, formulation of Rayleigh partition function actually requires two n copies uh, in the Lorentzian formulation. Anyway, so so the uh, so this different permutation essentially tells you how to uh, uh, patch different uh, replicas uh, of your density operators together. Okay, and then e uh, 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 when when tau equal to the standard, uh, um, yeah, when tau equal to the identity permutation, then that just corresponding to the standard uh, uh, patching uh, to obtain your Rayleigh entropies, and then then eta corresponding to the one corresponding a bar, etc. Okay, so, so now you can just apply this to, uh, you can also apply this to gravity systems and then essentially just involved to calculate this kind of quantities using gravity. And so uh, say for the gravity respect the usual rules of quantum mechanics, and then this prescri prescription will lead to answer which is compatible with utility. Okay, so this is an important self-consistency constraint. And uh, so, uh, so also this can be uh, implemented at the semi-classical level uh, uh, using the uh, Euclidean part in the growth, et cetera. And uh, so for holographic systems, then the boundary version of the prescription also can be used to provide the boundary conditions for formulating the pre prescription for the, for the Barker gravity. And uh, so intuitively, so as I mentioned that this sum over different tau just corresponding to you, uh, uh, um, you sum over different ways to patch in different replicas to join in different replicas. So, so that naturally leads to various kind of replica wormholes in the context, yeah, in the gravity context. And uh, so, yeah, so, uh, so I emphasize, even if you can calculate this overlap, you could actually, uh, in gravity, this is still approximation. Yeah, because this formula itself is approximation. Okay. Good, so, so let me just mention uh, one application of this theory. Uh, uh, of this uh, approximation, you can apply this to this two-dimensional, say, black hole, the vibration model recently con uh, considered by this Pennington at all. And then you find actually indeed this uh, leads to a derivation of the uh, a prescription for the replica wormhole, which they propose in those paper, uh, uh, which essentially they, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're the calculation is more or less just say, it's a lateral thing to do. Uh, uh, for the Euclidean path integral, and then that gives you the correct answer. 
So, so here actually give you a precise prescription so when and how to introduce those uh, replica worm holes. And also uh, explains the emergence of Euclidean uh, 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 gravity uh, to calculate those, um, yeah, to calculate such, uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, entropies of pure states. And also uh, illuminates the underlying mathematical structure, which is these permutations, et cetera. And uh, um, yeah, also physically shows that this replica wormhole can rise in system with a fixed hunter. You can also consider some other models which this black hole coupled to a thermal bus. And again, you can uh, uh, calculate uh, uh, to, to find that, that agrees with, yeah, yeah. Again, this leads to a derivation, say of this replica wormholes which you propose in, in various different contexts. Okay, yeah, so I will conclude here. Uh, 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 thank you. Thank you very much. Nice talk. So we have a question from Juan Maldacena. Please go ahead. One, so one question. Um, when you talk about the equilibrated density matrix, right? In the case of black holes, that would be the semi-classical one or it would be like the thermal uh, black hole answer, like just the, the one that comes from the, the thermal field double. Um, so for the, uh, you, you're talking about the for internal black hole? Well, the, the, the reason, my, the reason I, I'm asking is because for a black hole, when it equilibrates, we think that it, the, the density matrix, so analogous to your eye, would yeah. be the one that we derive from the thermophile double, right? Where there are no details about the black hole interior. The black hole interior is very simple. Yeah. While... Uh, in this island story, we were having a black hole interior that came from a specific classical, a specific semi-classical evolution, right? Yeah. That, let's say, it was from a collapsing star, contained the star inside, and so on. Yeah, yeah. Um, in 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 gravity, when we apply the island formulas and so on, it involves. Uh, the one, the, the interior that contains the star, for example, and so on, not the interior that comes from the thermal field double. Um, yeah, maybe I, maybe I don't quite understand your question uh, because no. the, um, yeah, here we consider, yeah, let's just consider the, here we consider the, uh, the, the one corresponding just to the collapse, say, of a star. Yeah, uh, let's do that. It's not, yeah, not the thermal field double case, say, uh, yeah. But your logic, uh, I mean, your logic about equilibration would suggest yeah. that we should use the one corresponding to the thermal field double because that's the equilibrated uh, density matrix. Uh, no, not necessarily. Uh, say, for example, let's just consider this example, this very simple toy model by this uh, Pennington at all. And then there, you then you approximate uh, this, the, uh, then equilibrate the density operator and then corresponding to a thermal density operator slightly deformed uh, uh, from that to the, uh, the end of the world brain, and then times the, the identity operator for the radiation, because there they put the radiation at infinite temperature. Yeah. Yeah, I guess what I'm saying is that if, if, we, if I had heard your, your talk before knowing anything about the page curve, yeah. I would have assumed that in the context of black holes, your eye uh, density matrix would be that of the that you get from the standard Euclidean black hole, the thermal field level density matrix. Um, you can consider situations which corresponding to the uh, to the um, to the uh, yeah, it's a different system if you consider the thermal field double, and then the thermal field double by itself is a pure state, and then then there is a equilibrated density operator corresponding to that pure state. Uh, 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 yeah, so there's a, a, a different I alpha, uh, which is different from the thermal field double state. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that describes the, uh, the black hole, uh, this two-sided black hole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the one-sided black hole, uh, you just use whatever uh, which you use to do your thermal calculation uh, uh, for the, uh, say, for calculate, say, the, um, Correlation functions uh, uh, outside the black hole, 
But if you for two-sided black hole, then it's a different, uh, I offer it's different from thermal field double state. Yeah, it's some kind of density operate obtained from the thermal field double state. Okay, so there is uh, one more question to Hong from Luca, who's actually next to me, so. No, no I want to just maybe we can, we can consider like uh, starting of the discussion, but <laughs> in certain sense. Uh, just um, about what uh, one Mandasena was saying. In fact, uh, the, when you write the path integral, uh, uh, the one uh, where you have exponential of a, a, e to high s p minus uh, s phi prime, that is exactly the expression of thermofield dynamics. Exactly. So I, I agree with him. And there's another thing I really don't understand is that in the usual um, uh, page, uh, in the, the original page approach, the entanglement was between uh, black hole and radiation modes, original. So the state, the pure state was the, the described black hole and radiation in uh, our distributed state. But it seems you have entanglement uh, in uh, radiation, radiation in a certain sense. You are doing a partition of a radiation system which is oh. something different in a certain sense with respect to page. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, let me clarify both points. Uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, we are talking about uh, maybe uh, two different things. Yeah, first, just related to your first question, this, rainy this formula is a general formula for, uh, for any system. Uh, this is not for thermal field double. Uh, 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 this formula is just a definition of rainy entropy in any quantum system, if you write it in terms of path integral. Uh, this is uh, just a low rending, uh, 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 yeah, this S here is your fundamental uh, action. Uh, uh, yeah, this is just a definition. There's no sum of your double here. Is that what you were referring as a sum of your double? You are muted, Luca. Are also in terms of it dynamics, because essentially you have that the Hamiltonian is H minus H prime, so H tilde is essentially there. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, some of your double have that feature, but uh, but but this is just a general feature of uh, uh, doing U and U dagger path in the goal. Yeah. Anyway, it's connected, I think, also with the, the uh, second consideration that. First, essentially yeah. taking uh, radiation, radiation entanglement. Right, right. Yeah, uh, uh, that's your second question. So the second question, maybe you are talking about related to this comment. Yeah, sorry, this comment is not something I haven't described in this talk. I'm just saying that's something in principle you can do by generalize what we are doing here. So, so my my discussion is all uh, uh, about the radiation between the uh, radiation and the black hole. I'm just saying you can generalize the the, uh, the framework to describe uh, even more uh, delicate situation, mm -hmm. which is to look at the subset of radiation, uh, how it's entangled with the other part of radiation. And so this is the even final question uh, uh, then, yeah. yeah uh, uh, but for this talk, I, I just considered the, uh, uh, how the radiation are entangled with the black hole. Okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, yeah, uh, I should have made that clear. Uh, yeah, this is just a side comment regarding the things we are, uh, we are going to uh, appear, yeah. Okay, thank you. So let's thank uh, Hong again for his talk. And let's uh, open the free discussion. So please uh, un un share the screen, Hong. Oh, okay, yeah. One so second. that we can, uh, so we had a question from uh, Rogato Bose for Juan Maldacena that uh, was postponed to, to, to now. So please, Rogato. Yeah, so I, I have a, for, for, uh, for uh, Juan uh, Maldacena, I have a more general question. And for, for the current speaker, I also have a question. But anyway, let me ask the general question first. Um, so um, the, the entropy, of, say, as, as in the example that you said about excited states of strings, uh, that the, this uh, collection. So that's like a entanglement, uh, that, that's like a thermo, thermodynamic entropy. Right, yeah. uh, you don't know the microstate. So, right. is but if you if you believe that everything in the universe is, is quantum mechanical anyway, it's, is it a is there a way to interpret it as a entanglement entropy from the the bulk itself? Uh, the that 
why you don't know the specific microstate of the excited uh, string. It's very gen general. I'm not uh, asking. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so it, 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 well, this is similar to any entropy that you calculate using mm -hmm. the thermal the, the right. right. method where you propagate right. on a circle. So you mm -hmm. can cut that circle into two parts, right? So you right, get, right. In this particular case, you get two separate universes, and they mm -hmm. would have a string that is entangled between one universe and the other universe. Uh, that's the big okay. Then that's thermal entropy. So from the point of view of just one universe, that mm -hmm. string is in some thermal-like state. I see. I see. Entropy comes mm -hmm. from entanglement with the other universe. I see. I see. And, and when you solve, you get these entangled states as the solution. Um, well, the 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 solution involves just a single field, this winding oh, mode. Okay. Uh, the the statement that this corresponds to a particular string in an entangled state is uh, right. a bit of an extrapolation. So, okay. Okay. The, the, okay. the precise state, I think, the precise uh, entangled state has not. I don't think, uh, to my knowledge, okay. has been explicitly okay. written down. Yeah. I see. I see. Okay, and is it sensible to ask uh, about the entanglement of those excited strings with the with the gravity in some sense, or 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 the gravity are kind of virtual gravitons sourced by those strings? It's not really one uh, shell. I, I think it's the the picture for the solution is similar to a star, right? There is a star okay. at finite temperature, and then mm -hmm. I yeah. see. Okay. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I had a question for uh, Hong Liu as well. Mm -hmm. Hi. So um, I was interested in, in this remark that you made about the, the entanglement between the two parts of the radiation. So mm -hmm. are you doing that by the negativity, like by gluing the, the one of the sides in reverse order, something that's like right, that? That's right, that's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's one way you can study mm -hmm. uh, those, uh, um, uh, entanglement between different subsystems, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and what is your result? Did you get that they end up with uh, the, the, their, their entanglement uh, finally, finally they would be entangled highly with each other, right? But initially zero or something. Yeah, so, 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 so yeah, th uh, uh, that's right. So before you reach the, uh, yeah, so you have this page curve. So mm. before you reach the top of the page curve, then mm. if you study any part of the radiation, yeah, mm. any subset of radiation with the rest, then you mm. find, of course, there's no, there's no uh, um, entanglement. Yeah. yeah, there's no mm -hmm. entanglement. But then after uh, the, uh, that top point, and then mm. and you find actually there's a phase, different phase structure uh, mm. depend on, uh, depend on the uh, depend on the subsystem sites. And depend on yeah, etc. Uh, and so there's actually a phase diagram you can draw. Mm. And does it depend on how you select your subset of the radiation, like uh, in in time uh, forward later, or if you if you mix them in some way? Oh no, uh, we mm. we we just consider the uh, yeah, we mm. consider the uh, so yeah, you can you can imagine the system is not homogeneous. And then, and then say different parts governed by some different um, behavior, uh, that's fine. But you can also just consider a homogeneous, imagine the radiation is homogeneous and then you just look at a single time and look at the radiation, uh, uh, how, how that subset say uh, is uh, entangled with the rest. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and it turns out that there's actually a phase structure uh, depend on the relative size between that subsystem uh, of the radiation, and there's a different entanglement behavior. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, time for questions. Everyone is welcome. There is no moderation, I just have to unmute you. There's no question at this time. I have, oh, someone else? No. I have a question for Brian Swingle. Brian. Hello. Is, hi. So uh, I was just wondering, uh, because you, 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 you are focusing on, on, on quantum chaos in a broad sense, but more from the condensing matter side from, from your background. Uh, but is it, is it um, I mean, you're considering any, any uh, analog system of, of black holes where you could actually mimic some, some important features through? So I mean, you have a very strong uh, 
like say criterion to link your 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 condensing matter system to black holes. You know, sometimes you find you know not so strong uh, analogs out there. I mean, you you may have in your hands something very powerful. Are you considering it? Are you looking into that? Do you know of some work in this direction? So when you say analog systems, you mean like uh, using BECs or fluid, like fluid models or something for like instance, that. For instance, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I personally have not thought much about it. I guess in a in a in a in a fair number of these cases that I know about, the zeroth order description focuses on free fields. So then I wouldn't think that it has a lot of the physics of sort of strong kind of chaos that I was thinking about. But but that's just my naive intuition. And I, you know, I, I know that these various sets up, setups introduce additional ingredients. So it's possible that there, there's a nice connection there, but I haven't thought too much about it. Yeah. Um, it, it's also the case I have another intuition, which is that this, the very strong kind of quantum chaos that you get doesn't come necessarily from the weakly coupled fields outside the horizon. Like in ADS CFT, if you have some large N theory where the three point and four point functions are one over N suppressed. So then the scattering of the fields outside, like the Hawking like radiation, is relatively weak. And I would say that's it's almost free particle dynamics in some sense when they interact amongst themselves. So the chaos comes from something more, well, it you need the gravitational scattering, which can be enhanced as you fall in, for example, that's the standard picture of OTOX. You know, you, you have this high energy collision near the horizon of the black hole. Um, but other aspects of the scrambling and entanglement growth seem, you know, like we, we would compute entanglement using an RT formula, which would penetrate inside the horizon in some way. So you need the interior to compute the entanglement properly. That's one of the messages of Ahmed's talk. But it's not described in a simple way in terms of the state of the exterior fields, I would say. Like they, that's some complicated state and, and their direct interactions can be quite weak. Okay, thanks. So there's a question from Luca. Go ahead, Luca Bonifante. Yeah. So yeah, I have a question um, for Juan de Sena, which is, I think, I mean, it's also related to uh, Sami Matthew thing. I don't know if Sami Matthew is still around, but yeah, because, so I'm not an expert of string theory, but so in the second session, we heard about uh, fuzzable solution, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, in uh, your talk, we heard about, like anyway, some black hole, uh, transition to uh, some yeah. uh, highly side state of strings. Okay, mm -hmm. so my question is, I mean, kind of like as an ignorant of string theory, I would say like, I mean, do we have black holes or not in string theory or we have both black hole and fastball depending on some scenarios? I mean, that's like, right, right. So, um, well, the, the uh, as you correctly say, the, the string picture, right, of the oscillating string looks more like a fastball in the sense of something where you recognize explicitly the microstates and without the horizon. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the idea that was being explored is whether they are continuously connected, right? If, if they were continuously connected and you could solidify this idea, um, then perhaps you could argue that even a black hole in some ways uh, to be understood is uh, that kind of gas of strength, perhaps more concentrated near the horizon. So that's a picture that people had proposed uh, before. So, um, I mean, it goes back to, I think, Bloom and Saskin were, I think, the first to discuss this. Um, and yeah, so it, it could be a realization of uh, this fastball idea, but uh, for the moment, it remains a qualitative idea, uh, mm -hmm. not uh, something quantitative. Uh, Was it the case, I, I mean, there would, not, there would not be a real, I mean, there would be no really an horizon. There would be some kind of horizonless, uh, Compact object in the end, right? Well, what, what I think is that uh, there might be two descriptions. So I think what you could hope is that there are two descriptions, one where there isn't the horizon and there are some strings, and the other one where there is a horizon um, and there is a black hole interior. 
So there, there are two things, which one is manifest in one picture and the other one is manifest in the other picture. So the two things are the interior and the microstates. And so the black hole has an interior, but no obvious microstates and similarly for the, and perhaps uh, understanding the transition a little better might help you understand how uh, these concepts arise. Because it seems to me that the physics of these two pictures is quite different, right? I mean, uh, yeah, the pictures look very different. So it, it is, um, I, I think it's a conjecture that they are continuously connected. So mm -hmm. there is no obvious contradiction uh, to, to this idea, but it hasn't really been shown that they are continuously connected. Yeah. Okay. So perhaps the case where is being argued well most well the, the case where it this seems to be more directly connected is uh, the case of the 2d black hole where you could think of uh, it in terms of this sl2 module one model that i discussed that that has these black hole features or equivalently could be viewed as um, so-called sign lubel theory which is a theory with a cylinder type geometry but a condensate of winding just purely the winding condensate um, so this has often been discussed as uh, being two alternative pictures of the same background. Um, I, I think that they are two different aspects of the same background. So I'm not sure whether we should, well, this is a matter of interpretation, not some people. So Jafferies and a collaborator recently wrote a paper from this point of view of thinking of this as two alternative descriptions, one where uh, he would view the black hole as some gas of strings and so on. They were trying to make this picture more precise. Mm -hmm. okay. so. Thanks. Mm -hmm. so in general, the, we, this, this is a, I mean, this is an old idea and we, there was not much progress because we lack uh, exact tools to analyze it, exact sort of uh, string theory tools to analyze these backgrounds. It, it's difficult to find uh, classical solutions of string theory. So solutions that are solutions to all the equations in string theory. So that's equivalent to finding a two-dimensional conformal field theory. Um, and uh, yeah, that wasn't, in principle, the conjecture is that that theory exists and connects this uh, winding condensate picture and the black hole picture, but uh, hasn't been shown to exist. Um, mm -hmm. okay. No one wants to ask a question, I take advantage of my position. And ask a question to Hong, Hong Liu. Uh, it's just a general question. Mm -hmm. In this, I mean, it is, of course, when it's the goal is to obtain the page carve, you're looking for unitarity, of, but you're actually imposing unitarity, you're obtaining unitarity. Unitarity is a natural thing. Uh, because, you know, there are all other school of thoughts that, that say that. It's not thought necessary to have unitarity, especially in this phenomenon. Right. Uh, it's a self consistency check. Uh, say, if the gravity, uh, say, uh, we, we, yeah, we ask the question whether gravity respects the usual rules of quantum mechanics or not. And then, uh, so, 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 how do we answer this question? You first assume, say, let's assume the black hole do, does say obey the usual rules of quantum gravity, and then you derive the consistency conditions. And then, uh, so this retality is just one such condition. And then say, if you find that black hole passed this consistency check, then you say, oh, we find some further support that the, uh, quantum gravity may obey the usual rules of quantum mechanics. Yeah, so that's, uh, so that is the basic logic here, yeah. Yeah, say, say if you, uh, say if black hole does not, respect the rules of quantum gravity. Then here we derive some formula which applies to generic quantum mechanical systems. And now if you do gravity calculations and then you would see gravity actually may not satisfy those formulas. And then there'll be a, 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 a direct indication that the gravity don't say obey the rules of, yeah, yeah, standard rules of quantum mechanics. But you never go the other way around. You mean you never try a non-unitary check like let's let's see if there's non-unitarity along the way is consistent. It's always it's always trying to see whether unitarity is, 
is resisting the check. Right. It's it, it's much. Um, yeah. It's yeah because the non-unitary you can be many many things. Uh, <laughs> all happy families are alike, but unhappy families can be very different. So so it's very uh, it's very hard to check a single unhappy family. Yeah. So uh, so what you do you just you see whether you fit this rule and if it if you find some inconsistency and then we say oh let's look for a specific. Uh, yeah, it, what I'm saying what I'm trying to say is never a result. It's something. It's an ingredient you require. It's not that you get it. No, it's, no, it's not the ingredient you require. Know, right? uh, sorry. Excuse me. No, no, no. You go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so it's not the ingredient you require. It's an ingredient. It's a. It's a logical process. You, you make assumption and then you check whether that something is consistent or not. And uh, and if that something is not consistent. And then, and then that give us very, very important clue to how to look for a uh, non-unitary uh, description of gravity series. And uh, yeah, this is essentially just a starting point. Uh, uh, you try to explore the bigger landscape, yeah. Okay, we, we could keep going with this family thing for a long uh -huh. time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if I may add a comment about this, so I think that so the, the, the recent progress was that purely from the gravity rules, you find that you pass this check, this particular check that Hong was talking about, about the entropy of Hawking radiation, right? So, um, so the page curve is, is, a, is some consequence of unitarity and the the recent uh, progress showed that uh, no, perhaps that I was not clear in asking the, I mean I, of course if you wanna if you're chasing page carve I mean you're gonna get unitary then you start no 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 okay so the, the point is the following page curve is required by unitarity okay. right now what was shown recently is that just using the gravitational path integral without any assumption other the, than the gravitational path integral you get the page curve as an output not as an input. Okay, okay. This is referring to Almari's talk, for instance. We had it today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. When you have you had this extra term, you had the Hawking term, which was incomplete, and then you have this extra term with the wormhole, and that yeah. extra term. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Brings down the curve and closes. So you get it as a, as okay. So in the sense you say you get it. Okay. Okay. I yeah. see what you. Yeah. Now, if you were if you were someone who was uh, proposing that black holes should lose information, then you would have to say that this calculation was wrong, wrongly interpreted, that you don't like to consider these other topologies, or, you know, mm -hmm. um, or that well, you get the page curve, but nevertheless, it still will be not unitary. So, um, okay, okay, but that curve is, is is still still. I mean, it's the page curve, the standard page curve, like. It. Entanglement uh, between the black hole and the radiation is mm -hmm. precisely that, because Hong at some point was, as, as Luca was also trying to say, was, is pointing towards a different kind of, of paradigm, where where people will look into into entanglement of, of within radiation. Is is this a, why why are you going in that direction? You want it, it, it's well, I think Hong had two systems, so he was dividing the system into two parts. One was A and A bar, right? And yep. I think the, the idea was that A was a radiation and A bar was the black hole that still remains. Okay, so that is the standard, the standard thing. Yeah. And he also was pointing to a, a research line, something to come, uh, mm -hmm. where, where he was, he was uh, considering possibility of entanglement between radiation and radiation itself. No? Right, well, yeah. That. And, and right. why are you going there? Because this would not be, would not be the standard page. Yeah, so, yeah, this will not be the standard page. Uh, uh, then this will give you additional uh, consistency checks of even finer consistency checks uh, of the black hole physics. Say from the quantum mechanics, you can derive, say if I give you say a system, and then I look at entanglement between different subsystems. Okay, so, so it's not a, a different part of the radiation, how they should be entangled. And then quantum mechanics, uh, have specific predictions for that. And again, uh, the gravity 
if leads to uh, a respect unitarity, uh, the gravity have to reproduce that uh, again using some kind of uh, gravity tricks. And so this provides further uh, 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 consistency checks of gravity. Yeah. What is unitary? Yeah. This is a finer. Uh, uh, um, it's on top of the page, I'd say. Yeah, on top of the page. Yeah. Yeah. Say, say you have already checked the page curve. And they now let's check other things. Yeah, uh, because unitarity constraint, there are many, many, uh, and the page curve is one of them. Okay. okay since there are no more, I will have one further question, uh, which is involving um, there are two left, but Nava Gadam is with us. And that is my general question is I have we have here one Maltasena Hong Liu, I mean the string side of the story, and then Navagana, I think is the QFT in carbon space side of the story. So what is going on over there? Is uh, we have to trust quantum field theory in carbon space till till the very end, or we need the, the string picture? Well, so. so what what I spoke about was different from what you or it's more than what you would naively call the semi-classical. Uh, approximation, where what Hawking does, for example, is where you work on quantum field theory on a fixed background. What I was pointing out in my talk was that metric fluctuations that induce gravitational interactions are important. So this, it's still effective field theory. And so I think that's more along the, I wouldn't know how to put islands into this picture, but it's more consistent with the expectation that effective field theory is good enough for unitarity. But that's not to say that quantum field theory on a fixed background is good enough. I think that's not good enough, but there is still a notion of effective field theory. And now it's a question of time scales or uh, physics at different scales, what physics you capture and what not. So what I was pointing out was that there's physics that's associated to um, say the initial stages of the, of the collapse where the black hole forms and grows to a certain size where it's very dynamical. That's very difficult to capture with the effective field theory that I was setting up. And then there's the question of the final stages of the black hole when the black hole is again small towards the end. But for most of the lifetime of the black hole, what I was pointing out was that effective field theory is still good enough. I think that statement is consistent with, uh, with what uh, Juan or Almeri was talking about. Whether, whether in the effective field theory where you compute scattering amplitudes with an intermediate state that's a black hole, how, how you see Islands in that picture is very complicated because in the in a scattering problem, you never ask what happens near the potential, right? You're, you're looking at asymptotic states, how they map to each other, and whether the map is unitary. But it's a more it's a more refined question to ask what happens to trajectories as they trace the potential in the interior, in the intermediate state. So if there's some semi-classical statements that can be made about islands in the interior, how you see that in the scattering elements of Amplitudes, that's a bit harder. I don't know how to answer this, but I don't see any inconsistency with the naive expectations. And as I was pointing out, there are diagrams that you can add, which is also what Juan said in one of, uh, one of his comments that you could compute, uh, Stanford and Schenker do this in one of their papers. You could compute perturbatively corrections that you get from the picture that I was drawing that include string, that you expect to include stringy corrections. So, not necessarily only stringy corrections, but any emergent scale that you may have that is outside of the uh, regime that, that I was discussing. So if you have introduced a string scale, I, I mentioned this also at some point in my talk that you're in a nice regime where you can tune string coupling to be small enough such that you can, you can, go, you can explicitly trace this black hole string transition by, look, by studying these amplitudes. It just hasn't been done. Around flat space, there's some work by Amati Cefaloni Veneziano and a lot of work that has happened in the past where you could trace some of these and you could also exponentiate them to understand how they behave as you include stringy corrections or more classical corrections about the collapse. But for impact parameters that have to do with black hole formation, that's not yet developed, but there, it's possible that you would have, and it's very likely that you would have corrections, whether that from effective field theory, you would compute corrections that agree with what you expect from string theory, that's a non-trivial check. And that in principle, perturbatively, you could try to do it. Okay, so there was actually someone raised his hand or her hand, but I cannot find it anymore. If 
Ah, Panos. Uh, you, I think you can... Yes, hi. Uh, but Nava almost uh, completely covered me. <laughs> the, the only comment that I wanted to make is that, as Nava said, when the black hole is really small, it's of the order of the string scale, then actually one should uh, pass to the picture of one. So one should actually understand string black holes. And then when the black hole becomes much larger, compared to the string scale, then the picture of Nava starts uh, dominating. So you don't need all these, uh, let's say, fine uh, information string correction. So and it's a matter of scales. Right. And the nice thing is that there is a regime where you can tune this using, it's a competition between G string and the emergent scale associated to the collision, so the collapse. So G Newton times the energy of the collision gives you a length scale and you have string length as a length scale and they are related by G string. So you can tune G string such that one is larger than the other or the other way around, which gives you exactly the transition. And both of these are computable in, with the tools that we have. It's just not been done. Okay, so Gato, go ahead, please. Yeah, so I again have a general question, I guess any, anyone in the panel can answer and it is probably more related to a point Samir uh, was making. So is it so in, in from Ahmed's talk it would seem like you need uh, you you need a kind of a non perturbative uh, change to do uh, to ex get the page curve right uh, so, so is it possible at all to get the page curve from uh, you know uh, perturbative uh, quantum gravity so use gravity quantum mechanically and and you modify the horizon whatsoever slightly is it possible to get the page curve from you know perturbative quantum gravity so well, is this a question to me or uh, to anyone yeah yeah so i mean maybe maybe you can start yeah i mean it's an open question uh, well, I can say something about it. So one is mm -hmm. that if you look at two to two scattering amplitudes, the one that uh, mm -hmm. Juan mentioned for the chaos exponent or the ones mm -hmm. that I derived, these have a characteristic time scale. So if you think of scattering amplitudes and let's say you somebody somebody gives you the scattering matrix, there mm -hmm. are time scales that you can derive from this that are intrinsically defined for scattering process called the Wigner's time delay. If you mm -hmm. compute this time delay for two to two scattering amplitudes, which have graviton exchange, Mm -hmm. in the classical level so or it's the iconalized version so it's right. mm -hmm. then you recover the scrambling time so the two to two process can inter interpret it as something that's sort of the elastic part of the scattering but mm -hmm. if you, you can have two to n scattering amplitudes where there are many more virtual legs mm -hmm. right so and then it, you might expect that the time scale associated to these processes is longer so if you try to ask a general two to n amplitude you, if you were to if you were able to compute them, it's not unreasonable or it's not impossible that you would get mm -hmm. a notion of page time while having a unitary scattering matrix. This is a, mm. this is a picture that is sort of more mm. theoretically motivated where you could try to derive such a thing. It's not unreasonable. It hasn't been done. I don't know if it happens, but it's something that I'm working on and it's, it may okay. come out. So that's one way to look at it. I guess the other okay. panelists will say Thanks. more about Thanks. the other perspective. So, so, so you're saying there's a hope to get the page car from low energy infrared perturbative uh, yeah, well, gravity near uh, that. Yeah, so how do you, it depends on what you mean by perturbative. So in the iconal mm -hmm. amplitude, for example, in the two to two, mm -hmm. you would say it's perturbative if you compute tree level and then one loop and two loop and so on. But okay, then yeah, the yeah. like amplitude captures all loops, but it's also in some sense classical. Mm -hmm. It has a counterpart in the, in the classical nonlinear Einstein theory. I see. You might want to call that perturbatively exact in a specific parameter, which is M Planck over M black hole. Okay. Right? And mm -hmm. now it's a question of what is perturbative and what do you, yeah, what do you okay, mean? Okay, okay. No, no, no. Okay. I, 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 I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So I, I should emphasize that the, mm -hmm. the if you calculate um, the entropy using uh, the well, the gravitational entropy formula, I don't know how Ahmed described it as um, mm -hmm. either the Ruta Kanagi formula and its uh, generalizations. That's a formula mm -hmm. you can apply on the ordinary background. It mm -hmm. is the derivation of this formula that it involves other geometries. Right. So, mm -hmm. and so it's somehow the, 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 you have other non-trivial geometries or non-perturbative effects 
but as mm -hmm. you take uh, the replica index to one, you, you're left with the mm -hmm. original background. And the right. one that you're left is uh, with this area term. And, okay. Um, Interesting. So if you want to apply the final answer, uh -huh. uh, final prescription, you if, if you take this as given, then you can uh -huh. just use your ordinary background and ordinary quantum fields on that background. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. Thank you. So from Amit's talk, it looked like his, his uh, wormholes and other, other, other subtle points were arising uh, mathematically during the, in, like the, they were in the replica in the, in the road to the power end space somehow. Right. right. Um, so is it possible now, I, again, I'm asking a very vague question here. Is it possible to think that since one, no one knows what is inside the black hole or the horizon, is it possible that one has to put all geometries uh, a priori because you just don't know what is uh, you know on the other side and that, that, that's the right way to do that rather than just uh, well, as he discussed the, you need to connect uh, the mm -hmm. the various replica geometries inside the horizon yeah and, um, yeah so that's uh, necessary for, to derive that formula mm -hmm. but the, the formula is not uh, i mean it's conceptually the same as the gibbons hawking formula it, it is in oh, that universality class of using the Euclidean path integral and uh, such yeah. methods to compute the uh, entropies. Um, so, so Samir Mathur was asking, I, I you know he's probably still around, uh, that why why is this, um, you know, why doesn't the, it match with the, the row uh, that you compute from, uh, you know, standard, uh, you know, the two ways you compute the row first from uh, talking like thing and then you compute the entropy. And right. here you do another way directly compute the entropy. Yeah, well, I, I think the new thing is that when you are computing partition functions in gravity, you should sum over all geometries. That, that's, that's the new feature. And um, that arises even with the black hole case. You might you might think that if you're computing the Euclidean partition function, you should compute, you should consider space times which are like a cylinder, so a circle times a flat space. But in addition, you should consider the Euclidean black hole where the circle shrinks to zero in the, in the horizon. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. could, could I ask a question mm -hmm. here? Yeah. Uh, just about what uh, Sagato was asking you. So, of course, of course. Go ahead. Go ahead. To... Open discussion. So, I, I was just asking uh, Emma the same question, but maybe I could ask you that as well. So, in the Euclidean section, yes, you can think of other topologies. And what I was asking Emma was if you did a Lorentzian calculation using the gravity path integral, what new topologies would come in there? So, I was phrasing the question to him. I start with my initial manifold, initial data. I just evolve, put the whole thing in a computer and I just see what I get, okay? I just put in a computer with dynamical triangulations and I see what I get. I'll of course get the normal semi-classical black hole with small fluctuations here and there in, the, in my computer in the sum over paths. What other things might happen? Are you going to look for new handles in the interior of the black hole? Are you expecting new topologies that connect you all the way out to the radiation like long wormholes? or you're not expecting any large changes okay. to the semi-classical? Let, let, me, let me attempt to answer this by uh, the following question. So if you have a string that splits into two, how do you describe that in the Lorentzian theory? A string that splits into two. Yeah. yeah. Let's say an open string that splits into two. Yeah, so very good. I would say a space-time also can just uh, break. So that would be a new topology. And I would be happy if that's what you say, that the yes. semi-classical manifold, if it broke into two pieces, Mm -hmm. uh, if that's your picture, then uh, I, at least I would understand what the picture is. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. 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 So I think that the picture is uh, essentially like that. Uh, you have n copies of your Lorentzian manifold, yeah. right? And I think the idea is that sometime in the future they they get reconnected. Um, These uh, Lorentzian manifolds get reconnected, and the reconnection happens through some. Uh, I think it's more like a tunneling. I, I imagine it as a tunneling geometry where um, you, you, you have most of the space is Lorentzian, but in some region you go a little bit into the imaginary direction and you reconnect. Um, uh, okay. you, 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 you need some non-Lorentzian evolution because the answer for the partition function is real. It's not a pure phase. 
So you, you need to go a little bit into the Euclidean domain, uh, just, just from answer analysis. Um, so, so that's fine, but let me just then ask the question again, just to understand what you said. I'll start with my 1D, 1 plus 1 theory. Yeah. Whatever is the interior of the black hole, I'm willing to cut that into small pieces, can break into any size pieces, mm -hmm. but I won't touch the outside, suppose for the moment. Yeah. yeah. Inside pieces can reconnect in different ways, yeah. as long as the total evolution is unitary. Yeah. I would claim that if this is what you do, that in the interior you connect and reconnect in any ways you like, you will not actually be able to remove the entanglement from the outside radiation if the interior evolution is unitary. When I looked at specific models of this Lorentzian case and the paper of Marlow, Maxfield and so on, you find that the evolution in the interior is actually not unitary because they have like a symmetrization where the anti-symmetric part of two copies is killed and so on. So would you say that by just cutting and breaking the interior pieces, but what's gone out is gone out. You're not connecting to that. You can get unitarity. Well, so I, I, it's not, it's a statement about the computation of the Rennie entropies, right? right? So the Rennie entropies is the expectation value of a certain operator, right? So right. what you're doing is computing the expectation value of this operator. For that, you don't need to go all the way to singularity, you just evolve forwards and backwards in time. And in this way, you compute the expectation value. Now, when you go forwards and backwards in time, so the end copies can be connected in various ways when you decide to go backwards, right? Yeah. Um, now, how they are connected in the outside region is set by the twist operator, right? So what the, the, the calculation you're doing. The idea is that in, in the gravitational region, there could be a kind of <clears throat> dynamical twist operator. So that you could have additional reconnections and um, the fact that you can reconnect them in this way, you can view them as the addition of this tw twist operator, which changes the entropy of the matter piece. Um, yeah. So that's uh, that's why the answer is different. So that, I mean, that's why you get the, the island formula uh, because you reconnected the, uh, in this calculation of this expectation value, you reconnected things in the interior. <clears throat> in a very, so I think maybe I was asking about something slightly different. So maybe it's not a fair question. I wasn't trying to compute the Rennie entropy. I was just saying, if I actually do the evolution and I want to see what happened to the entangled pairs. So I'm actually doing the Hawking evolution yes, by yes. allowing other <clears throat> Well, that's a very fair, the manifold, yeah. all that. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, that's a very fair question. Yeah. And I think there is currently no answer to this question. So there is no, uh, no clear answer to this question. I think that's- Okay, uh, that, that's fine. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so more questions, more comments, remarks. I think we had enough discussion anyway. Uh, so I will thank uh, the speakers of the section very much for beautiful talks and for their availability uh, and the speakers of the whole day being the last session of today. And for those who want to join us tomorrow, we start at 12.30, uh, well, Central European time. Um, hope to see you tomorrow morning then, or whatever it is for, for, for your latitude. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm. Bye.